faculties and delegates to day three of Foxy ICOG online certificate course and lecture series on operative obstetrics. I'm Dr. Shazia Mohammed from Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, JNMC Vartha. I would like to start the session by inviting our beloved Dr. Surekha Taide Ma'am. She has been a professor in medical college with a teaching experience of more than 20 years now. She is an expert in managing high-risk obstetrics and infertility, a great teacher and a mentor to a lot of medicos. She has been training a lot of healthcare workers in managing uh, teenage health, uh, health of teenage girls and has been working with a lot of, uh, for a lot of social causes in OBG5. Um, ma'am, hand over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, dear Shazia, for that wonderful introduction. Respected chairperson of ICOG, Dr. Mandakini Meg, ma'am. Dr. Parag uh, Bindiwale, Honorary Secretary. My co-convener, Dr. Mitra Saxena, for this ICOG certificate course. Esteemed faculty, chairpersons, and participants of this uh, certificate course, ICOG certificate and course and lecture series on operative obstetrics. A very warm welcome to all of you. Obstetrics is running through our blood. That is what we do day in and day out. It is our passion to take care of mothers, to improve their health and to reduce maternal mortality. All the esteemed guests and teachers of ICOG are passionate teachers. They like to train, they like to teach, and they like to transfer their skills to the next generation. For the previous two days, we have seen such a beautiful, intense scientific content. And it was a visual treat for all of us to watch those videos and to hear to all those experiences of the stalwarts who taught the learners of this ICOG certificate course. And today too, we are very much keen, all the participants are very much keen to listen to the speakers. Thus, we have come to the first, uh, uh, the, the day three, Shazia, I would like uh, the slide of Mandakini Meghman, please. I, it is my proud privilege to be able to introduce our ICOG chair, Dr. Mandakini Meghman. Madam has a really illustrious career. She has an in, unique distinction of being the only gynecologist to be the advisor to the government of Maharashtra on RCH and family welfare. She was additional chief secretary, uh, very closely working with uh, chief secretary of RCH and she was deputy director of health services, handling many important departments like NRHM, RCH, family welfare. And she also was the superintendent of the Kama Albans Hospital. Received various orations, next slide please. And uh, uh, the orations have been so many and Throughout the nation, she has been giving this oration and she has received prestigious awards like the Dr. Ganatra Award, Shalaja Pandit Award, Super Achiever Award. And presently, she is now the International Vice President of Medical Women International Association and the Chair of ICOG. Madam, on a personal note, I would like to acknowledge you as my mentor, as my guide. Thank you very much. Uh, please stop sharing. Please stop. So every day you find some aspect of the <laughs> introduction and that is your actually specialty, Surekha. Thank you very much for wonderful introduction. Uh, friends, I am very happy today that uh, we could uh, successfully complete two uh, days of intense training as Surekha has said. And people are asking for more. And I was discussing with your future chairpersons, uh, Lakshmi and now Uday, that you keep on this, you know, the tempo going because it is so much in demand. And it is for the, you know, it is for the real because people are asking in this procedure how to do decapitation, how you could do, madam, what was the craniotomy uh, instrument use. I mean, there's a genuine, uh, I mean, questions and people who are practicing are being benefited. And I must inform, uh, Madam Miragni Utri, uh, welcome, Madam. I acknowledge and namaskar uh, to this forum. 
गिरिजा उदय एवरीबॉडी नमस्ते सो इलेवन हंड्रेड पीपल अटेंडिंग ऑल अवर प्रीवियस कोर्स इज सिक्स हंड्रेड सेवन हंड्रेड बट दिस पर्टिकुलर कोर्स इज मोर देन इलेवन हंड्रेड एंड पीपल आर आस्किंग रियली फॉर मोर एंड मोर ऑफ सच यू नो कोर्सेस i want to yesterday also i showed uh, because as a protocol of icog we are supposed to uh, display our um, uh, this uh, activities so i'm not going to go in a uh, uh, very uh, detail but just to show few of the activities because people are not aware what exactly the icog is doing so let me share the screen and brief all of you uh, about the Uh, activities of icog i will just take few minutes i'm going to show the slides only uh, so i uh, a warm welcome again to this third um, day uh, of our course which is a concluding day and also the exam day for the delegates so we had a wonderful start uh, with uh, dr bhagusha uh, sarya madam and akhil munshi then uh, yesterday uh, the esteemed guest we are kamal bakshi madam and ajit virkur sir we have a wonderful uh, uh, team very very efficient very hard working team uh, yeah. everybody knows that we are passing through this difficult stage and still we are trying to the maximum work and my theme was equip educate and empower i am very satisfied to say that we could do the maximum activity under this banner and we have already rearranged reorganized and this course is one of those courses where we rearrange and i must say that by incorporating all the technologies as we are discussing with the all our esteemed uh, faculty here that we could do make maximum and seamless and very smooth experience for all of us see the program here nozar chairier suvarna anita uh, you know everybody gave their you know expert lectures and uh, yes surekha has said that uh, videos were too much liked by everybody because they are themselves done by the the faculties which are speaking and uh, now we uh, icog is running so many courses and i think with the future chairperson many of the courses will be added as per the need of the hour and these are the courses where after the corona we have developed these courses three day courses and at the last day we take the mcq examination and those who pass the examination by 50% those only get the certificate so please don't keep on asking that how can i get the certificate because i get 100 and you know 1000 queries that i want to certificate so you have to be there for 3 days and you have to pass the examination with 50% then only you get the icog certificate then we had gynec oncology ultrasound domestic violence course was held in india for the first time uh, great faculties many government official endometriosis postpartum hemorrhage was one of the best course i must say polycystic ovarian diseases then aesthetic and generative gynecology contraception female welfare many of the uh, common obgyn want to learn that what is the latest and even the in covid period there are so many inquiries are coming then icog general club was started with lot of fanfare it is one of the best activity uh, which is uh, going on every second sunday you can see here various topics are there and the original author international authors are present for this that is the beauty of this and now we are going to have the uh, now in this uh, on 12th may we will be having our next then the i request all of you to download this icog app you need not ask here and there what is happening in IC icog uh, you can see all the event calendar everything you can it is on the fingertips so it is a very information uh, uh, loaded and you can you have, you know the uh, activities of the icog and fellowship also those who are actually completing their requirement please uh, you know uh, you know click on the uh, this particular uh, this the uh, link and then you can find that you can do the icog which is the most prestigious you can see priti here we were just discussing a beautiful ceremony i keep on showing this photograph because i love this photograph a very mega event and ficog is granted in such a beautiful ceremony that is a convocation of the icog you can see here beautiful um, and we have many publications you know 
for the candidates you can go to the icog website you can see many uh, publications seven icog campuses on interesting subjects we had this mega conference on a very important subject of ncd non communicable diseases in obgyn it was one of the most successful many courses mrcog and many activities are there you please visit and just now this is my last slide that i said that attendance is necessary compulsory mcq must uh, uh, attempt we are giving up to the 7th may and 7th may will be the last day of attempt uh, attempting the mcqs and 50% marks is to be given so friends thank you very much icog is committed for the education and i we all want to remain the student as all our faculty we are discussing just an excellence is not being the best but doing your best thank you very much for the conveners for that you know extra support moral support and icog bringing the credit to the icog by all the faculties who are present here especially gurus like meera agnihotri madam my co chair lakshmi uday they are all the stars and i think uh, it is going to a great height with this i request all my conveners to please go ahead with the course um yeah Uh, yeah, I just forgot. Now uh, we we have our um, convener, Mitra. Uh, Mitra, everybody knows now. She is a rising star. She is already risen, I think, and she is very active, intelligent, very hardworking, and very very you know warm. And she is a senior consultant in Rewadi, Haryana, and she is doing a great job of the course. And I think I wish her best in her chairmanship also. So please, Thank Mitra, take, yeah, please take over the. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so a very very warm welcome to all my seniors, the respected faculties, and I'm happy to inform you that I think within few seconds, yes, we've touched 500 already. So that is very heartening for all of us at ICOG team, all the people, all the learned faculties who are going to be uh, uh, sharing their knowledge, and all the attendees who will be there. They are sparing their precious time. and that is the most valuable thing which i think this uh, course we have tried uh, to you know cram up everything but so that it everybody gets something to learn something to practice something to reflect and that can help us because friends we have passed mds and mss many years ago but every patient of ours is a new examination of that day and i want to just say one thing that obstetrics some are doing uh, um, you know few people crazy like me are doing by passion but most of all everybody has to do it by default so operative obstetrics i must say this i have a few moments dr sureka with your permission madams that dr mandakni meg has shown extreme magnanimity to give dr sureka and myself the responsibility to uh, you know help uh, seeing through this program and i'm uh, hopeful that she is going to be very pleased with our efforts and um, yesterday and day before it was an exhilarating experience for all of us the first day we con uh, concentrated on the normal passage and the second day of course the most important the center stage was the cesarean section today operative obstetrics list is not complete without some extremely important topics so dr sureka and myself said that cervix cannot be forgotten all those newer techniques which an obstetrician should know even if they don't do it but if they can counsel their patients then it will go a long way in making things easier for our super consultants like the fetal medicine expert people and then we have the vein of all problems and that is managing and tackling the uterus so today we have kept those topics as well and i will not because i think we are just in time my last line is that safe obstetrics is a love story with a happy ending all of us want that our mother and the baby should be happy and safe so that we all are safe also but we have introduced unusual topics on the, all the three days the first day it was very very enlightening to listen to cesarean section under local anesthesia yesterday what if all the talks were very fantastic but to keep destructive operations and today also and beautiful panels on vaginal roots is in section 
and today let's hope it will be a satisfying evening for everybody thank you thank so you. much over to you dr surekha thank you thank you uh, dr mitra a minute please yes, yes ma'am uh, we have our uh, you know incoming chairperson i want him to say you know one or two line at least <laughs> yes so it will look very appropriate that our yes. no no thank you so much madam i think that's just uh, yeah. i mean uh, you both have said uh, exactly what this course is doing it's doing great job and it is giving practical uh, obstetric trips to all the people so i wish you all the success and it's already a very successful course <laughs> and it's a great job dr mitra saxena and dr surekha please uh, carry on with the program i don't know thank you uh, thank you dr uday uh, uh, for your magnanimity Uh, Dr. Shahjia, can you display the slide, please, for uh, our session one? Welcome to the session one of the day three, and let me welcome our chairpersons. First of all, let me welcome Dr. Rajat Mohanty. Dr. Rajat Mohanty, sir, was the vice president of Foxy in 2019, national coordinator for endometriosis committee, and chairperson for midlife management committee. Welcome, sir. Our second chairperson is Dr. Anju Soni, ma'am. Dr. Anju Soni, ma'am. is has a special interest in high risk pregnancy and she is the chairperson of the HIV AIDS committee welcome ma'am our third chairperson is dr rajendra singh pardesi sir who was the vp vice president of foxy in 1920 and presently the vice president of amox welcome sir with that we move on to our first speaker who is none other than our opening batsman is dr nuzat aziz head of department of fernandez hospital and doing lot of projects a few being still birds gap project nutty project etc and she is a wonderful teacher trainer and we would welcome you ma'am for the first talk on cesarean audit the roxins criteria over to you ma'am Thank you, Dr. Sudeka, and to all the chairpersons, to the entire ICOG committee for this invitation. Can I share my screen? So it is indeed a privilege to be invited onto your panel, and uh, my hope that I am going to do justice to the next fifteen minutes that I have been given, and the uh, and the talk and the job that I have been given is to explain the Robson's classification. I was the one who used to give a lot of resistance to it in the beginning. It's a very difficult to calculate, and that's the problem. But we'll try to make it as easy as possible. And today, I find it it flows throughout the department and through the hospital. Now, in the background, we used to classify cesarean infections versus elective versus emergency, uh, primary or indication based, and we used to have cephalopelvic disproportion or breach or something else. But there would always be another category, like for example, meningitis. or it might be a uh, intracranial tumor or it might be a woman in you know cardiac arrest or something like that that would always come up as an others category now the robson's classification when he gave it and i have had the privilege of uh, of being with um, ms robson and he grouped all women that we deliver on the labor ward into 10 groups they are all prospective that is you can include them from the time you come and they are mutually exclusive you can't put a group 8 person into group 7 again and they are totally inclusive you will never have a woman on your floor that cannot fit into one of the 10 groups there is no others category in this classification so that's the view so who are all you know previously we used to classify only those cesarean sections into our classification but now a slight difference in this would be that we will be classifying all those who come for a birth into our labor ward into the groups and then calculating a cesarean section rate in each of the groups so all women who have a viable birth are grouped vaginal births as well as cesarean section the concepts are based on few very easy to understand concept one they take category of pregnancy whether it's a singleton or a multiple pregnancy if it is singleton what is it the presentation is cephalic breach or oblique or transverse the second uh, aspect is your previous obstetric record are you a nulliparous woman or you are a multiparous woman and if you are a multiparous woman did you have a cesarean section or no cesarean section in the past the third one would be course of labor did you come in continuous labor did you have an induced labor or was a cesarean section done prior to labor like for example absent in diastole fluid 35 weeks it would be a cesarean section before labor then the last concept was the gestation age whether you are pre term or term at the time of delivery now with this what he did was he put 10 groups together and and put it up now when we take a look at this graph uh, table it looks very threatening i mean i'm just going to try to make it as simple as possible 
The easiest way to categorize is first ask yourself, is it singleton or multifetal? And if it is multifetal, it goes automatically to group eight. So I've finished group eight. Second, if it is singleton, ask yourself, is it cephalic, transverse or breach? If it is breach, group six or nulliparous breach. If it is multiparous breach, group seven. If it is transverse, then we are going to put it as, okay, group nine, that, that would be you know, any abnormal line. But if it is cephalic, it is term or preterm. If it is preterm, okay, then group 10. So I have finished eight, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. I have finished uh, all of them. Now what is remaining is one to five. Now the term group is again divided into one to five. One and two belongs to nulliparis, three, four, and five belongs to multiparis. In the multiparis groups, the one with previous cesarean section go into group five. So that's, that's finished, group five will be previous cesarean section. Now, one and two, three and four are divided into whether they are spontaneous labor is one and multiparous spontaneous labor is three. Induced labor or pre-labor cesarean section is two for multi nulliparous and multiparous is group four for induced labor or pre-labor cesarean section. So it's, it's easy to understand that they are classifying it when based on certain concepts. But then the second difficulty comes after you categorize or label them is the calculations and the interpretation of this, of this classification. So let's just imagine that the total number of births in a month that you had is Z. Uh, Z. And then the, the distribution of each of the groups, you have 15% as your group one, 20% as group two, third, group three, and so on. So you will have uh, each of the groups occupying a certain chunk in that 100% of yours, that is the Z number. So the, the, the variables that come in is the relative size of the group. So if it is 15 out of 100, this will be 15% and this will be 20%. So group one will be 15% and 20% will be group two. Now, the second one is what is this okay, cesarean section rate in this group? So you will have to know what is your vaginal birth rate and what is your cesarean section rate in group one, and then you will calculate. I'll go through each one of the calculations a little later. The third concept is if, if you are, sorry, okay, if you are, uh, having, uh, let's say, 10 people out of 15 having a cesarean section, what is your contribution to the total cesarean section that you had in the institute? So this is called as the contribution of the group to the entire cesarean section. So how do we actually get these numbers or the variables in place? Now, let's just assume that the total number of births is Z and group one has got A number of vaginal deliveries and B number of cesarean section. The total number of, uh, of women in group one would be A plus B. The cesarean section rate in this group would be B divided by A plus B. I hope you are able to understand. This will be B divided by A plus B. The relative size of the group would be A plus B divided by Z, the total number that you had in your month. So you just take the total group number and divide it by the total number. Now the group contribution to cesarean section rate is a little different that is, you will take B divided by Z, and that will give you the contribution to the overall cesarean section rate. Now I'll put numbers in, in place of A, B, and Z, and then just show you how is it calculated. Now let's just assume that you have 20 vaginal births and six cesarean section in group one. The total number is 26. So cesarean section rate would be six by 20, that would be 23%. Okay, easy, you move forward. Okay, what is the relative size of the group? Let the total number of birth be 200. So your total, uh, uh, you know, group one would be 26. 26 divided by 200 will be 13%. So that is your relative size of this group in comparison to the entire population that you have. Moving across to the contribution, the total cesareans in this group out of the total births will give you your contribution. That is 3% out of your 33% cesarean section rate is contributed by group one. So these are very important concepts that we need to understand before we start classifying and then interpreting. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to show you numbers or tables that are examples from our hospital as well as MS Robson's. This is the latest one that I could find, 2015. And take a look, he's got 23% as group one, 14% or 15% as group two, 30% is group three and, and about 10% is group four, the size that, that, that is forming in his population. But if you take a look at the cesarean section rate in each of the group, 7% in group one, 35% in group two, 1.2% in group three, and 13.8. The contribution 
is how do you make sure that what you are calculating is right or wrong? You add up all this contribution and you should get the total cesarean section rate. So if you have 23 as your cesarean section rate, you are going to add up all of them and make sure that, okay, am I, am I coming as, as um, you know, the entirely as your cesarean section rate? How do I know whether I'm correct over here or not? I will add up all of them and I should get 100% over here because relative size would be a part of the 100% that you have. Now I'm just going to take a month's audit in a low risk uh, unit that I have and show you small numbers because if I blow up the numbers then it's difficult to calculate. And I'm just showing you our group one cesarean section is 15%, group two is 50, group three, we did not have any cesareans in that because all multis and group four is 17. So I'm just going to split it up and then show you how is it that you use. So when you take a look at the group one, these women deliver without any help. So what you need to do is increase the relative size of this group in your population. That is, if you have the total relative size is 18.9, make it 20%. They don't require much of our help. If you stop inducing, they will automatically come into spontaneous labor. So you have to remember the relative size of group one is very important. The cesarean section rate in this group is very important because this woman are actually going to become previous cesarean section next time and then lead to a big group five that you have. So what we do today is going to have an impact two years later. So that's something that you have to remember that the relative size of the group is very important in your population that you are going to keep the relative size very big. The cesarean section rate very small in this group. Now, take a look, it will contribute to a very small proportion of the total percent of cesarean section here. Now, group two is, is very dicey because it has both induced labor and pre-labor cesarean section. This pre-labor cesarean section for a term Catholic woman comes from maternal request cesarean section as a main child. So these women come and they want a mahurat section, they want a specific time, they, are, they want it done, otherwise I'm going to go off. That's, that's kind of a uh, uh, you know, disclaimer you have. So this is something which is increasing a lot and is a you know, huge threat to the cesarean section rate in all of the units and I'm sure everyone suffers from this here. Now group three is something that who have had a normal birth previously. So your cesarean section rate in this group should be less than 5%. Any time when it is more than 5%, ask yourself, where did you go wrong? The group uh, size will tell you what kind of a load you are looking at. Like for, for example, Fernandez looks, uh, you know, has a lot of nulliparous women. They uh, ma'am, sorry to interrupt you. We have two more minutes to go. Sure. All right. Thank no. you, ma'am. Okay. I thought, all right, I thought uh, I had five more minutes. Okay, that was my... Uh, you no, know, no, please take, take your time, ma'am. Please, please take your time, ma'am. Sure. Because I had put a timer and that's fine. No, no, uh, don't. No, please take your time, ma'am. So the group five would be, uh, would be something that, uh, that is previous cesarean section. And I want you to evaluate this number. This, what is the size? And it just tells you that, you know, if you are a tertiary institute, but then split it open and say, how many of them are actually two cesarean sections or one previous cesarean section? And I would like to show you that what is happening wrong in our place is that there is a big chunk and only three, one, four out of a big chunk are, are opting for TOLA. This is where we needed to work on. And this is where we have been struggling to, you know, you know make those people opt for a TOLA. And when they opt, we have a good uh, VBAC rate of 60%. So modified drop since, you know, was, was just a concept. You can do anything with them. I leave it to your institute, A, B, C, D, what you want to do. They divided inductions from pre-labor cesarean section as A and B concept, but then they are important. You can, you can really look into it the way you want. In group six and group seven, similarly are breached. Both of them together should be 3% of your population when it's becoming more, you know, ask yourself, what is it that, that has went gone wrong over here? Are we doing a lot of preterm births? Uh, uh, then these two groups increase. How many of them were given an option of ECV? How many of them were given an option for vaginal birth? Group eight is the multifetal group. We have an option of vaginal delivery was given or not. You have, you struggle with this group at 80 to 85%, you know, hardly any people will opt for um, vaginal birth these days. So group nine is transfer slide. How do I take a look at a graph or a table and say that your uh, data collection is right. So I take a look at the relative size of group nine. It should always be less than 0.5. If teachers are here, they would always say that 96.5% will be kephalic, 3% will be breach, and 0.5% would be transverse slab. So that is how your number relative size should always be a little less. 
Group 10 is preterm singleton cephalic. Your in utero transfers will be responsible for this chunk and it grows up and you know if you have adf or if you have uh brie you know if you have people very bad obstetric history being referred them now the quality assurance if you have this group in place you can actually ask individual persons in your team to look after group one group four group five and group ten so that they can do the evaluation one single person cannot really keep a tab on all of them and we tell them that you know look at your data and see how we can improve in this area because this is how you split it up and this is how you reflect it to your team. So very easy way to categorize. I've just put up a small graph that I put it up in the labor ward. It is for taking a snapshot, uh, a singleton or multifetal eight, transverse is nine, preterm is 10, breach is six and seven, and then one, two, three, four, five is how you go through. So with this, I'm going to conclude saying that auditing cesarean section have to be done by options classification. How you modify, how you improve is limitless. You can do to you know what you want to do and 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 work on to it. Each group focusing on to a group and and uh, making it better. No overlap, not indication best. And uh, this this uh, you know is a moment forward towards our commitment towards introspection and auditing of every cesarean section because we believe that cesarean section rate should not be a number but it should be you know are we right whether that woman deserved a cesarean section or not so thank you so much for this invitation and i hope uh, i was lucid enough because this is a difficult cesarean section uh, topic to understand unless or until you do a hand holding thank you thank you very much dr nozat and yes you, it dr. was nozat, i would like to comment uh, uh, yeah. yes all, yes I would like to congratulate Dr. Mandakini for conducting this beautiful workshop. I think the art of uh, de de delivering obstetrics is dying and it is most important today to teach our youngsters to uh, how to de do a normal delivery and how to do a good surgery. I think it's one of the very, very important things because every uh, child, every uh, student uh, runs away towards infertility or uh, infertility, laparoscopy, and you know all these branches, sonography. So we must inculcate uh, e eagerness that this is most fruitful branch. Of course, little laborious, but still it is a dying art, and we must all continue to learn this art. And even at this stage, uh, Dr. Mitra was just saying that she learned something in this, uh, you know, webinar. It's a very very important thing which we are all learning, and we are keep learning all the time. And uh, I would like to congratulate Dr. Nuzat. You have explained such a difficult topic in yes. such a beautiful manner. I think all the uh, delegates who are attending would have really enjoyed your lecture. And uh, of course, a little I would like to add here that you know when we talk of um, uh, this classification, it looks very very complicated, but it does not uh, you know say that whether the cesarean was done for the benefit of mother or baby. So uh, people have done modifications and, and, and I feel that those modifications are welcome and they should be added in this classification because this classification is just lacking in, uh, you know, indicating the benefit to the mother as well as child. So this should be definitely added and lots of people have done lots of modification in, even in our own country and we should come up and also uh, look after those modifications. I, that is very important thing. Uh, that's a way forward for, it, for this classification. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anju, uh, for those comments. And uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Nuzat. I have been to Fernandez and I have firsthand seen how she has trained her whole uh, team to actually uh, use this in her own setup. Thank you very much. And we move on to our next lecture when our speaker is none other than Dr. Girija Vag, ma'am. Dr. Girija Vag is an academician par excellence. You can see from her CV how much she has done in academics. She was a professor. She is a professor at, at Bharti Vidyapit since so many years, 25 years of teaching experience. And she has been heading so many organizations and glad to mention that she has done a lot of work in gestosis. So welcome ma'am for your talk on cervical insufficiency. Over to you. Thank you. Uh... Sureka for that wonderful introduction. And first of all, I must uh, thank the ICOG, Mitra, Madam, 
Mandakini Madam and you yourself for giving me this opportunity of talking on a very, very basic but an important topic of cervical insufficiency. And it's a very uh, sort of a focused topic where I'm going to be speaking only on McDonald's and the Shirotka's um, technique. And Mitra Madam has been very, very assertive that it has to be only technique and because that is something that is really not very easily available everywhere to be understood. So it's indeed a pleasure to have your senior chairperson such as Dr. Rajat Mohanty, Dr. Anju Soni, Madam, my personal favorite and Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardesi, who's been my mentor always in my own state. And it's definitely a privilege to be here at this ICOG certificate course under the guidance of Dr. Mandakini Meg, Madam, Mitra Saxena, Madam, and Surekha Taide. I bring you greetings from the state of Maharashtra. Today is the first of May and in 1960, our state was reinstated as Maharashtra. And therefore we are very proud of this day and I bring you greetings from the Marathi Manus that I want to say. But at the same time, my heart is really hurting a lot, thinking of all those loved ones that we have lost, those colleagues that we have lost, and so many others who are morbid, who are trying to heal. I think we should put our hands together to pray for the departed souls and to wish for all those who are ailing to, to come back in good spirit. So today I sometimes feel that we are guilty to an extent, but at the same time we are privileged to be here in this meeting trying to connect with each other. So cervical encyclage is a surgical procedure in which sutures or synthetic tape is used to reinforce the cervix. And the purpose is to increase the mechanical strength of the cervix and preventing painless, passive dilatation and premature delivery prior to viability. It is historically indicated depending on history or clinically indicated if you have diagnosed it as a clinician or sonographically indicated if you have done a sonography and you find that the cervix is shot. Now you have a patient here which is RT 26 years diagnosed with Hashimoto's had a history of previous 19 weeks loss, 13 weeks missed abortion and has presented and you can see here in the picture that she has come with an external cervix which is closed but internally it has started opening because she had this previous history, we quickly got her scan done and we found that she had started developing what is called a cervical insufficiency. So such kind of situations also may occur. Likewise, you can have a patient who has come to you with two recurrent pregnancy losses. You go ahead and do an encyclage at 14 weeks of gestation. You've done an early anatomy scan at 16 weeks where you found that the cervical length was 30 mm. But then because of her history, you decided to do the cervical encyclage. And when you did the TFA scan, the anomaly scan at 19 weeks, you actually found that the residual cervix was just about 16 mm. So the question then comes is, when do you time the cervical encyclage? So it has some say that it has to be 12 to 14 weeks, but others argue that cervical insufficiency does not manifest itself prior to mid second trimester. And consequently, the optimal time to place a circular should be between 16 to 18 weeks because most spontaneous pregnancy losses have already occurred by then and most of the anomalies are ruled out. So, however, there is no literature which indicates early encyclage is advantageous over placement at 16 weeks of gestation. So, there are various types of transvaginal uh, uh, um, circulages. And the ones which are commonly done are the McDonald's and the Shirodkas, and that is the purview of my talk today. Now, the Shirodkas circulage is placed as close as possible to the level of the internal loss or after surgically reflecting the bladder anteriorly and rectum posteriorly. Now, these are two very important components of the Shirodkas encyclage. The McDonald's encyclage is a bursting suture that does not involve any dissection, thus theoretically, which cannot be placed as close to the internal loss as would be the Shirodka's circulage. There are no significant differences found in pregnancy outcome between the two procedures. However, there are little different opinions in the recent publications and higher birth weight when Shirodka's has been observed rather than McDonald's circulage when it was performed for as a second procedure. Now, in the age old times, the Shirodka's circulage, and I'm sure Mandakini Madam, Anju Soni Madam, all the seniors, I saw Mira Agniotri, Madam, these people must have been witness to all these things. And we have only, as despite being a professor, I have only learned about it, is there was a strip of fascia lata, one fourth inch wide and four and a half inches long, outer side of the thigh, and each end of this strip was transfixed with a linen suture. 
Now, why were they doing this? This was in 1955 when we did not have suture materials as we have of them now. And this used to be one of the additional procedures that had to be performed. So that was the first step of preparation before getting into doing a chirurgical stitch. Now, there has been a lot of modification. And what is this? We have wonderful suture mater materials such as a monofilament. Question comes whether I use a monofilament or a braided silk, proline or nylon, loop nylon or non-loop nylon. Now, most of the senior practitioners use the Marcel because they feel that it is the most tensile strength. Most, most of the newer practitioners are using proline or nylon because it initiates less tissue reaction is what is believed. The question, however, continues to remain, remain about trauma and infection with this suturing. And especially with the Shirot stitch, because in the current scenario, not only are we doing dissections, but we also use Merceline tapes to better reinforce the cervix. If you go now, as I'm going to tell you, while it's being evolved in the Western world today, even for McDonald's, they are using a Merceline tape. So there was a survey which was performed in the United Kingdoms, and it was found that the majority of the respondents who were OBGYN specialists used multifilament braided sutures, where only about 17% used monofilament non-braided sutures, and very few used the Merceline tape. Now, I have purposefully mentioned the Gore-Tex suture here because I have had two patients coming to me and both of them had husbands as cardiologists who had undergone a cervical encephalage. Both of them were gynecologists by Gore-Tex suture because they had an RPL history. And sometimes I feel, should we think of a different, better suture material? Now, what is an essential for a cervical encephalage operation? If you're performing the Shirodka surgery, then you will have to have the Shirodka's needle or any other aneurysm needle would suffice. But aneurysm needles are very, very delicate and thin. They would not be passed through the substance of the cervix. So it's always better to use a Shirodka's needle, or maybe you can use a wider, blunter, curved Mayo's needle. If you're going to do the McDonald's surgery, it is important that you use the Mayo's needle. Please remember, friends, all kinds of curvatures are necessary. Because you put in a cervix, you put in, the, uh, you put in the speculum, you stabilize the cervix and you find that the cervix is so very small that your needle is too big. Or you find that the cervix is so very big, the needle is too short. Plus the needle cannot be thin. It has to have a tensile strength. Plus it cannot be a trocar cut, otherwise it will cause trauma. So having the correct needles is extremely important and that is something which is very uh, important to remember. Now retractors. In the past, we had the weighted over speculum which were being put in. I was trained with the haze retractor, as you can see here in the uh, extreme of the screen. So these haze retractor acted as a self-retracting. So it had a wonderful lateral retraction. Of course, the patient had to be taken under anesthesia. And we all know cervical encephalage is done under anesthesia. Now, in the current era, we have very, very fascinating, sophisticated lateral vaginal retractors. And it would be a good practice to keep them handy in your operation theater so that you can use it. Whenever you are using, it's always a good practice to have a good SIMS retractor, which is deep within inside so that it will effectively retract the posterior channel wall. And you can consider using the same kind of a similar retractor for the anterior wall, or you may consider using a right angle retractor, which has a, again a long blade, which will wonderfully retract the vagina. But these are absolute essentials. Because if you don't do this, you may land up in doing a very, very superficial cervical encephalage, which may not yield any proper results. Important instruments to be having on the trolley are a long Mayer Hager needle holder, because this has a crevice and it holds the needle absolutely perfectly. You also have to have a sponge holding forceps, or you can consider using a back box forceps. So both of these are supposed to be safe for using in uh, trying to retract the cervix. Now, pre-operative checklist is extremely important. Do your labs investigations. Currently, we are also doing COVID in most of our patients. Then ask for any other respiratory illnesses because we have to give them general anesthesia. History of GERD, very important because if you're going to mobilize them at the time, surgeon, especially women who are beyond 16 weeks of gestation, do have increased incidences of GERD. So that is important. The typical uh, protocol that we follow for nil by mouth is 
uh, clear liquids for two hours prior, light meal six hours and heavy meals eight hours prior. So that can be your formula. And you should follow the medical aspiration prophylaxis. Better to practice in GERD as mothers beyond 18 weeks are at a higher risk. And we can use metaclopramide, ranitidine or pantoprazole. And this can be diluted, of course, pantoprazole in 100 ml of NS over uh, 10 to 15 minutes, 30 to 16 minutes prior to the procedure. So these are certain things which are interspersed here, uh, what we are doing in our practices. Now, anesthesia usually and commonly used is general anesthesia, but regional anesthesia is definitely much better. Why? Because you do not have to then haze the procedure. You have a wonderful smooth muscle relaxation and you can safely position the patient. If you are having reservations about general anesthesia, there are many efficient anesthesiologists who offer a laryngeal mask anesthesia, which is less interventional than the general anesthesia. And what we found in the COVID pandemic recently was, and I have a publication to this, is regional neuraxial anesthesia in the form of a single shot spinal performed better than general anesthesia and delivered adequate safety and comfort to all involved, the obstetrician, anesthesiologist, and the patient. Because we have to protect our, ourselves against the aerosol generations, and this can help. And this especially has important relevance in the current COVID-19 pandemic, where airway and orofaryngeal tract management is to be minimized. Positioning of the patient is important. You are supposed to have her in a head low position and with a dorsal position, which has to be a little exaggerated. What happens is after you've given the anesthesia, and if you give her a little head low position, that helps her in having her membranes away from the internal os, and that definitely can help us in creating this. Now, Shirodka stitch is something that I'm mentioning first, not because I am a very, very proud uh, Foxian and a proud Indian, but Shirodka sir first published this particular encircle in 1955. And therefore, it was a transvaginal first string suture placed following bladder mobilization to allow insertion above the level of the cardinal ligaments. And this is the procedure. First step is that you have to take a transvaginal incision approximately two to three centimeters wide, which is made at the junction of the vaginal mucosa and the portion of the cervix, very important. And the incised edge of the vagina is picked up with an Alice's clamp or an artery forceps or a thumb forceps. Then gradually, like we do for a vaginal hysterectomy, you are supposed to gently uh, dissect the bladder away off the cervix and till the time that you reach the vesico uterine peritoneal fold, thus avoiding injury when the strap is actually going to be placed. Then you take the cervix anteriorly and go to the posterior part of the vaginal mucosa and at the junction of the posterior vaginal mucosa and the cervical portio, you are supposed to take the incision and the peritoneum of the cul-de-sac is dissected from the posterior cervix. Now is the time when you have to be already ready at that time, sir used to use fascia lata. Today, we are using Mercil or polyester tape. And this is to be put onto a stitch so that you can very well put it into the aneurysm needle. So you pass the aneurysm needle, just wove through the, that thread and take the thread out. So that is how it is done. You can either use a linen or a nylon. Even that time to the fascia lata, it is written that he used to use linen. Then gradually he started using Mercilin tape. And that time used also linen used to be used, but today we are fortunate to have better suture materials. Similarly, now once that thread has come up, you pass the other side needle and pass it similarly in the same fashion, take it posteriorly, thread the thread up and then tie the knot. Now in the original Shirodkar's operation, the knot used to be primarily he tied it anteriorly. Then it was found that there was a lot of bladder irritation. So therefore the technique was changed so that the notch came posteriorly. But before that, when he was using the fascia lata, there was no question of tying the knot. He used to strap the fascia lata over each other and it used to be actually sutured to the substance of the cervix. So what used to happen? It used to be something like a permanent reinforcement of the cervix with the fascia lata. And then after that has been sutured posteriorly as well as anteriorly, all the openings that were done in the vaginal mucosa would be sutured with the catgut sutures, which were absorbable. Now, naturally, when you're going to tighten the cervix thus, this particular, I talked about the anterior knot and the posterior knot already, this particular patient would land up in a C-section. Of course, things modified later and how they modified will come to shortly. 
Now, Macron Circulage was promoted in 1957, and this was a publication where it was used for inevitable miscarriages. So it was actually used as some sort of a rescue kind of a circulage, and bladder had to be emptied. And after the cervix was exposed, a bursting stitch was taken through the cervix as high as possible after reflecting the bladder reflection, no dissection, and through the substance of the cervix, he used to take bursting sutures, which would come anteriorly and get tied. And then a loop of that thread was kept, and then it was taken care of. Now, McDonald's stitch was found to be much easier. And what was very important is that you tried to reach as high up as possible. But what happened was many of our seniors experienced that time that whenever they use the suture material like nylon, or that time fishnet nylon used to be available, that nylon stitch used to slip down. And therefore, most of them started using Mersil. We had a senior professor in Sassoon hospitals, Dr. Mehta. He used to actually put beads into that Mersil and then tighten it, saying that I want to ensure that it is properly tightened. So all such kind of modifications people had taken. Now, when you have is, uh, Dr. Gerich, uh, yeah, when you have a short cervix, then the sludge into the cervical pillow. I are you sure? Because I have also put a timer here. Uh, Korean, uh, whenever you find that as the cervix goes further, as the pregnancy goes further at 27 weeks, you may have a little shortening. Now, what happened was, as I mentioned, that whenever the shirotka stitch was being taken, we had to remember some caution points. You had to be right at not very high up because if at all you did that, you could land up in going laterally into the uterine vessels. And that was a complication which you have to remember. Likewise, when you're doing the McDonald's stitch, do not try to go as high up as possible, whether you may go into the bladder. And if you go into the bladder, these women are at risk of having vasicovaginal fistulas. Now, this is a small little film of about just one second where I'm just trying to demonstrate a loop ethylon being used on a model. And this is the lateral stitch that has been taken. Unfortunately, none of my videos started, stopped running just about 10 minutes back. So I just kept this much just for the sake of demonstration. So this is how the McDonald's stitch is taken. I've already described to you both the procedures. And if you look at the Shirodka stitch with its modification now, we can take the posterior stitches. Now, one very important thing in the last minute that I want to tell you is, this is a wonderful stepwise approach to cervical encephalage published in 2012 by Karting Karl et al. And this was in response after experiencing 20,000 cervical encephalages in various centers. So please remember what they're saying. Place the circulage as high as possible. Circulage placement may be as close to the inner cervical stroma as possible, and that is include as little as possible of the surrounding tissue. You need not take, as McDonald's uh, stitch, they said, four to five bursting sutures. Just three are enough, and they have to be at particular types, and place the knot at six o'clock position, that is posteriorly, and place a figure of eight around the cervical knot so that it does not slip. So what is very important is you stabilize the cervix, identify this important anatomical points, the cervical vesicle fold, the posterior phonics, cervical stroma, and the cervical mucosa. You can see here on the right side figure that the black line is showing the cervical vesicle fold. And then posteriorly, you are seeing a landmark which is denated, which is the posterior phonics. And while you are taking the pericervical mucosa, best be careful that you do not go into the bladder. So you take one bite at 12.30 to 11.30 anteriorly, another bite should be at three o'clock or five o'clock, and another bite should be in a nine o'clock position. Now, what is very important here, they're using the muslin tape, which has two-way needles. So when they take the first stitch and come posteriorly, the other stitch is again woven through the needle holder, and then they come posteriorly and they're able to tie this uh, so that the knot doesn't come anteriorly. So this is what happens at the conclusion of these three bites. You can see, you can very well tie this knot and this, will, this definitely will award better tensile strength and better stability. So there are certain studies which have shown that there are no much differences in certain studies they have shown that Shirodkos is much superior. For want of time, I'm not going to talk about many more publications. Thank you for a wonderful opportunity. And this is me, Dr. Girija Wag. I'm MD, FICOG, because I'm very proud of my degree of the ICOG. And your candidate for Vice President Foxy West Zone, the election dates are yet to be declared. But please remember, 
I'm always there for you, for the ICOG and for the Fox. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Girija. Thank, thank you, Dr. Girija. And, yeah. Thank you, sir. It was Please very go nice ahead, talk. Dr. Raja, uh, uh, it was very nice talk. Dr. Girija is hardcore teacher, and basically. Uh, there is no, uh, in the studies there is no no such uh, more difference about the outcome only thing is that in this uh, mcdonald and shirodkars so in rural setups so uh, we have to be uh, cautious by doing uh, shirodkar because chances of c sections are more and where the facilities of c sections are not, there and there only we should try shirodkar Thank you, thank you. It was a very nice thank talk. You. Thank you, Dr. Pardesi. I would like to add here. I would yes. like to add here, Dr. Yes, yes. Girija has spoken very beautifully, covered almost everything. But for PGs, uh, this thing I would like to add that when you are taking your lateral sutures, please keep away from vessels and take your sutures uh, on the uh, ten to uh, uh, ten to eight o'clock, so that you avoid the vessels laterally and this side from two to uh, four o'clock, so that you avoid the vessels. Just that. Thank. You. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, both of you. And yes, Doctor Sir has already shared his screen and is ready. Our next speaker is none other than Doctor Uday Thanewala, sir. He needs no introduction. He has been so active in Foxy. He has been vice president. He has been. Uh, he has led ICOG also, and he is the incoming. Chair of ICOG, he is the chairperson elect for the next year. We invite you, sir, for your talk on rescue circulage and abdominal procedures. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Surekha. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation and this talk. And I'm so glad it is immediately after Gerija's talk because uh, she has taken the basic things which we need to do. Uh, uh, Somebody is talking in between. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Somebody needs to mute, please. Please, everybody mute. So when we talk of a rescue circle, it's a little bit different than what we are talking about. And uh, uh, like when uh, it's insertion of a circlage as a salvage measure in a case of premature cervical dilatation with exposed fetal membranes. It is diagnosed often on sonography, or you sometimes on a speculum examination or when you do a PV, when the patient complains of vaginal discharge, bleeding or feeling of pressure in the vagina without any abdominal contractions or contractions at all. So it is just, it happens generally in the mid trimester. And uh, it is very different from the regular uh, indication of circlage, which you do at uh, what, what Girja has just described. This is a patient, sometimes you may not even expect uh, a patient like this. Or sometimes you may have a patient whom you have done a circlage and they again present with this with the membranes bulging and the os open up. But when the os opens up and the membranes bulge, the circlage which is done is called as a rescue circlage. And the main aim is to convert a pre viable gestation into a viable gestation. So basically, we want to make sure that this pregnancy goes through a, a very uh, premature, uh, uh, pre-viable baby like 17, 18 weeks or 20 weeks goes on to become at least 28 weeks and above so that the baby can survive. So uh, the McDonald's stitch has been beautifully described by uh, Girja. It's a transvaginal uh, purse string suture placed in the cervical vaginal uh, junction without bladder mobilization. So this is what happens. This is the sort of patient you will see when the cervix is, uh, when she complains and you put in a speculum or something, you have the cervix there and the membranes bulging out. And this is where you have to take the stitch. So wherever you see the cervical edge, you need to take your McDonald suture. It is very difficult and almost impossible to do a shirodkas over here because the cervix is short, shortened, short, cervix is open. And, the, and, and this patient you can't subject to too much of anesthesia or dissection. So it is better to do a McDonald stitch over here and you know take it as, as much high as possible on the cervix as you reach. So basically when you finish off the stitch, the cervix will probably look something like this with the knots over there once you finish it. So now is it worth doing a rescue surplus? That is the one question. Now when women presenting with painless cervical dilatation in the second trimester, 
are left with two options of management. One is expectant and the other is to do a rescue surplus. Studies have shown that pregnancy is prolonged by six to nine weeks with a rescue surplus compared to less than four weeks if you just give them expectant management. So yes, it is definitely worth doing. Now, what happens is you get this patient and there's an emergency and you do it mostly as an emergency procedure. So emergency sur uh, cervical surplus is a simple surgical procedure with lower complication rates and can effectively prolong the gestation to viability. It is associated with minimal morbidity and less than 50% and more than 50% chance of the uh, infant surviving later on. And this procedure uh, should be considered for patients with a cervical dilatation in the mid trimester who is not in labor, please remember, not in labor and is without evidence of infection or placental abruption and obviously rub membranes are intact. So uh, according to the NICE guidelines, consider rescue surplus for women between 16 to uh, 70, uh, 27 plus six week, weeks of pregnancy with a dilated cervix and exposed unruptured fetal membranes. Do not offer rescue surplus to women with signs of infection or active vaginal bleeding or uterine contractions. So what anesthesia do you use in these women who come as an emergency? You know, generally pre uh, pre prefer a general anesthesia because it's a better uterine relaxation, but sometimes it can cause the patient to cough and you don't want any movement. You want this patient to be very deep in an anesthesia when you do it because a little bit of movement and when you're taking your needle through the cervix, you may just rupture the membranes. And that is one very, very uh, dreaded complication of this because everything goes in a waste and then you have to abort them. So you, you'll be very careful of the membranes and we'll come to how to deposit the membranes back. But for that, general anesthesia is preferred. But uh, last uh, many times, my anesthetist would refuse because the patient was not fasting. We've given spinal and it works equally well because it is uh, easy to do. And uh, even if the patient is not, uh, the little bit of danger is when she's, uh, and especially when she's not fasting to give her a head low, at least she's conscious and she will not vomit or will not have any problems. So either anesthesia can be used. In the surgical steps, you require a big sim speculum with a blade which can retract the rectum posteriorly to so expose the cervix. Three vaginal wall retractors, three sponge holders and uh, needle holders. You require two uh, assistance, good exposure, and you can hold the cervix with a sponge holder. So this is the sponge holder. These are the uh, speculum and this is the lateral vaginal wall retractors now you know I don't find them in many hospitals where I go to but this is something which we are so used to because it is like a right angle retractor but it is curved you know this is curved and it very very nicely just retracts the vaginal wall anterior and lateral so basically you this is the position we have the speculum here the interior vaginal wall retractor goes there to lift up the uh, bladder and the two lateral uh, 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 walls are retracted. So one assistant is holding the speculum and one uh, retractor. The other one is holding uh, the uh, upper retractor and this. And the surgeon can deal now with the cervix, which is totally exposed. You know, otherwise, if you see videos or other people, you have to move the speculum or move the retractors to give you vision. Here, your cervix is fully exposed. And this is how, of course, you take the purse string suture. And uh, what I do, a little tip on the McDonald's stitch, I mean, this applies to even when you're doing it as a cold procedure. Once you have taken the stitch, what, what I generally do, I take the knot anteriorly. I use muslin tape and I've been using muslin tape for a very long time in all my cases. And I've had excellent results with no problems at all. And anterior uh, uh, knot doesn't make any difference. I find it much easier, especially in a case when you're doing a rescue surplus. Yes, you have to just take the knot anteriorly. You can't juggle around and do posterior knot, etc. So over here, once you tie your first two knots of muslin tape and make it tight, I put this artery forceps in between uh, upon that knot and then take another stitch of the muslin over the, uh, over the artery and then take two or three more stitches above that so that there's a length of the muslin available. So the, the idea is when you want to remove the stitch, it's very easy. You just put in your speculum, you put one uh, retractor and you hook up this uh, loop which you have made with an artery and then cut the muslin tape on the side. So this is one tip which I'm giving you, which helps you to remove the McDonald's stitch very easily. And believe me that stitch removal is not done under anesthesia and the patients sometimes are very uncomfortable and they really appreciate it when it's quick and easy. So this is one tip where you can put the artery after the first two or three knots which you have taken 
you have made sure the cervix is closed put an artery upon that uh, two knots and then take the stitch upon that so that you get a loop okay so what are the difficulties faced in an emergency procedure one is the bulging membranes and if the cervix is and the cervix is dilated and if it is a very thin rim what do you do so let's tackle with these uh, things now if you have a bulging membrane like this what is said is you can hold the cervix and with with sponge holders the other thing which i use i at least use at least three sponge holders so you have one on the interior one and the other two lateral and then you know keep taking the um, uh, uh, putting your needle through the cervical uh, tissue and taking the stitch so what you can do is pull out the cervix so the membranes retract uh, uh, below uh, behind a little bit and give a steep tender bug position or a steep head low and then take the cervical stitch once you have taken the cervical stitch you can just make sure that the membranes are in and then tie the knot now basically to deposit the membranes back uh, uh, macdonald had used and suggested to use and what i generally also use is a moisten swab on a sponge fold uh, forceps which is you know gently put the membranes inside here you can't use any force you have to be very careful because membranes you know how delicate it is and they may just rupture at any time so you have to be very um, uh, uh careful while taking the stitch and while depositing the membranes back so one is to use a moisten swab on a, a sponge holding forceps for the bulging membranes people have also used and i've tried in a couple of uh, cases is using a foley catheter the patient is in a steep tender bulk position the catheter is introduced into the cervix and the balloon is gently inflated the membranes usually retract back into the uterine cavity and then the circlage can be completed the balloon is then deflated and the foley is removed so this is something which one can try when the membranes are coming out aggressively and uh the, similarly like what we uh, saw about using ho holding it with ring forceps and pulling the cervix out people have used 6 to 10 cervical stay sutures of uh, silk and then using traction on the sutures they cause the membrane to fall back but i feel using sponge holder and the stitches would be probably the same but filling up the bladder by instilling uh, a 500 to 1000 cc of normal saline may lead to retraction of the amniotic sac into the uterine cavity thus facilitating facilitating circular placement and trans abdominal amniocentesis to reduce the tension of the amniotic cavity and allow retraction of the r glass membrane is also suggested now i have never tried amniocentesis because we feel are you know in such an emergency where to do amniocentesis first and do it but people have tried it and they say that it really doesn't matter if you take out a little bit of fluid but i haven't tried it i generally do the either the foley catheter or a moistened um, gauze on a sponge holder forceps and we try to reduce the membranes and then uh, do the stitch uh, as quickly as one can material which i have been using always is muslin tape but of course like you just said double o silk can be used uh, um or monofilament synthetic non absorbable sutures like proline can be used now dilating the cervix and now suppose the cervix is dilated more than 3 4 uh, cm and it is it is a thin cervix um and then what do you do then you what you can do is take give him give the patient a steep head low position and do what is known as the worm stitch and this is very useful and very simple to do you know this is the sort of suture that's a mattress suture of number 3 heavy braided silk first suture is at the level of the internal os from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock and a second similar suture is placed from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock this is a very quick and simple operation but is uncommonly performed saved in emergency cases when the cervix is effaced and the membranes are at the external os the operation is prone to failure when uh, performed but it is definitely worth trying and this is how the stitch goes and you know when you have no real option when the cervix is dilated far more than about 6 to 7 cm there's nothing more one can do but try and do a worm stitch and believe me it does work if if you can do it and the patient uh, progresses there's no problem i mean the, the, of course there should be no uterine activity and of course you use tocolysis for these patients and all now occlusion circlage is one step ahead of the worm stitch this is a cervical stitch uh, taken in the external os by placement of continuous non absorbable suture 
mostly in cases where cervical dilatation is more than six to seven centimeters and cases where the stitch has been taken earlier in pregnancy and in spite of that the patient comes with dilated cervix and protruding membranes you can do this you have taken a mcdonald uh, mcdonald's stitch earlier i had this case where she we had done a mcdonald's at 12 to 13 weeks because of history then she came back at around 25 26 weeks saying i've got something coming out and i can feel something coming in the cervix and we saw the membranes were already bulging out there and the cervix was open and all we could do is give her anesthesia steep head low hold the cervix and from one end to other end just suture up the cervix uh, and i did it with a, a, a continuous uh, silk uh, a continuous silk suture and we tied it uh, both the ends so the cervix was closed and the patient progressed to at least 27 28 weeks and we got a viable fetus so Factors affecting outcome that the uh, poor uh, poor outcome is because of prolapsed membranes, evidence of intraamniotic infection, symptomatic presentation when the patient has pain or fever, cervical dilatation is too much, and of course CRP and WBC count are important predictors. The questions which are raised are emergency procedure should a latency period be observed when the patient comes, you see dilated membranes, should you wait and see what is happening? And there's no no. Uh, no consensus on whether there should be a latency period or you should straight away we learn to the theater. Uh, if the membranes are lying exposed in the vagina, should a genital swab be taken? Not enough data to suggest it. Routine tocolysis, no evidence to support routine tocolysis. And investigations, of course, CRP and CBC is not mandatory before, but after that, yes. And of course, an anomaly scan should have been done to um, make sure that the baby is fine. Of course, bed, bed rest is not routinely recommended. Uh, and routine uh, USG measurement is not recommended. Once the cervix is uh, closed and the patient is fine, let it be. Why it works? Because despite an advanced degree of cervical dilatation, the insertion of a cervical suture may lead to remodeling of the cervix. By placing the membranes and closing the cervix, the risk of exposure to infection is less. That's why the pregnancy does continue uh, better and the onset of contractions is reduced. And uh, so hopefully we get a uh, this thing. Now, I don't know if I have real, real time to show the abdominal surplage, but let me just say that abdominal surplage was described by Benson and Durfee where the uh, cervix was not, it was either torn or it was not uh, generally, it had a failed vaginal surplage earlier, scarring, lacerations of the cervix. Sometimes you've got deep lateral tears in the cervix and there's no place to take a stitch when you examine the patient. And or a very hypoplastic service, and, and generally uh, abdominal surplus is done preconceptionally. But I have uh, this. Uh, we have some laparoscopic surgeons coming here who have done it very well in pregnancy. Also, now it is a very advantageous to the patient because it is, that's the only way out when the cervix is damaged or very short that you can try and save a pregnancy where the cervix is totally incompetent. It can be placed higher on the cervix at the level of the internal os. But the main disadvantage is the patient has to undergo two uh, either laparotomies or one laparoscopy, one laparotomy. One is for the placement and the other is for the delivery. And of course, it will be done by laparoscopy. So I will go straight ahead and try and show you a short video clip uh, for the... Should be very, very gentle. And uh, uh, the, the use of atraumatic graspers is advised. This is the pregnant uterus. The anterior segment is exposed by a coordinated movement of the uh, surgeons as well as the assistant hand grasper. You can see that the grasper from the right hand side is giving counter traction gently on the lower part of the uterus. There is the wide opening of the UV fold, which is performed from almost one round ligament to the other round ligament. So the UV Small fold is open from one round made. ligament to the other round ligament. We are very, ligament. very careful to avoid any ooze or any bleeding. Notice, extending the same peritoneal cut onto the left side. All movements so as to avoid any bleeder at this stage. The bladder is lifted in its entirety. The, adequately. Now, the next step would be the location of the uterine bundle on both sides at the level of the cervicoisthmic junction or at the level of the internal os. You can already see the venous plexus there on the left side. Locate the uterine artery and the vein. Extending the incision till the round ligament 
almost on the right under the surgeon's grasp. The uterine artery is now seen very nicely under view. You can see the tortuosity of the vessel there. So once we have located the uterine, then the assistant or the right hand side grasper gives a guide to the surgeon to open the broad ligament and make a window lateral to the uterine vessel. So this is what is being done and a nice window is made safeguarding the uterine vessels. So you can already see the pulsating uterine on the right side, the broad ligament window that has been made just lateral to the uterine and similar steps are now performed on the left side. The surgeon's left hand grasper now moves, pushes against the broad ligament there and helps in opening of the lateral avascular. A marceline tape here for the circlage. The needle is pretty big and so we do not want an inadvertent poking of the needle or the rare part of the needle also. So for easy passage of the needle, an adequately large window should be made. I find the muslin tape very useful because it's got those uh, needles which are already attached to your suture never slips. Using the muslin tape on and, a double needle. And, and you can easily do the even the McDonald's with this or even a Shirodka's with this. As you can see at the level of the internal loss. So this is the level of the internal loss and they are taking the, the bite over here. Vessels there. And then the same so you, tape the needle is, is railroaded below the uterine or below the avascular window there and brought out from the other avascular window which has been created here upwards and both guarding these, the uterine both these uh, things are now tied and, and it's a, a very, little bit of the uh, tissue there that's how you take the uh, stitch and then tie so by this method the advantage is that the pulling of the tape through the uterine muscle is minimal the needles are then cut. So that's how the needles are cut and then uh, the peritoneum is closed on that. So that is the abdominal circular. I'm sorry, uh, anybody interested can definitely go on to the uh, website of Dr. Vivek Salonke and Shinjini Pandey. They're, they have got excellent videos on YouTube. And this is one case where the pregnancy was around 15, 16 weeks and we had called them for an abdominal surplus and it was, uh, the patient progressed very well and delivered. So thank you very much all for this uh, 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 opportunity to talk to you about residual surplus and abdominal surplus. Abdominal surplus can be done even before pregnancies. Abdominal surplus is hardly ever done as a rescue surplus. It's a planned operation when you know that this patient's cervix is so bad, you put in a speculum, you say, oh, this, this cervix, I will not be able to take a McDonald's uh, stitch also or uh, any other stitch. So uh, we have to do an abdominal surplus based on the history and the uh, clinical findings. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Absolutely wonderful talk and absolutely wonderful presentation with a very beautiful video. And um, I'm sure that our participants have definitely benefited. And I invite Dr. Rajat Mohanty for his comments, please. I cannot see him. If he's there, please unmute and please Thank comment, sir. Thank you. Rajat Mohanty, sir, is there? I think... Yeah, Dr. Rajendra Pardesi. Thank okay. you, thank you, Dr. Uday. He has narrated very nicely, and he is a true obstetrician. And we know we cannot forget his work with Dr. Daktari sir. So he is a true obstetrician, and basically he told exactly right: pre-viable gestation to viable one. There are quite debates on this rescue circular. But he is telling, he is not um, uh, telling, no, uh, it's a point to maximum, but at least eight to nine, six to nine weeks also we will get, we can give some results yes. to the mother. Yeah, and in fact, in fact exactly. now there is a debate that whether we should do it beyond 27 weeks. You know, In India, I think because our age of, uh, in most of the towns and all, it's difficult to salvage anything below 27, exactly. 20, uh, 28 weeks. weeks. 
and uh, especially in the rural setting we don't have so much, so much of a thing so i think the definition of doing it till 28 weeks really applies to india in bombay of course we have a good uh, great neonatal setups and also sometimes we even have uh, uh, gestations at uh, at 28 weeks you may wonder whether to do a surplage or to deliver the baby but i think overall i think the definition of 27 plus 6 weeks still holds doctor would i do a friendly dilatation but uh, one my experience with irritable uterus i had given only one case actually it's not uh, uh, on irritable continuous irritable uterus and given toshiban and after toshiban That's next true. day i did a uh, yeah. rescue cyclic because same findings were there bulging membrane yes. it was yes. successful yes. 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 no yes. doubt she delivered at 34 weeks but uh, we succeeded so no, atacidan and they all are great tocolytics and in some cases you have to have a individualized judgment when you feel okay the uterus has because we sometimes give uh, routine tocolysis for couple of days to anybody whom we have done a rescue circular we will give it for at least definitely till 48 hours and then uh, maybe oral till the patient gets discharged and even put the patient on progesterone depending on the gestation later i didn't talk about all those things because the basic thing was surgery Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we quickly Uday, move. Uday, Uday, can I have a line? Privilege. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Certainly. Uday, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, very nice for the postgraduate. Uh, I would like to uh, have your opinion. After doing this thing, I agree with the tocolytics. The type of the tocolytics you are giving for the and the time also, I agree. What is your opinion about the progesterone? Yeah. So that's what I said. Well, we are me. giving it routinely when we do it. We we give the progesterone here. We give progesterone, and we are generally using that once a week uh, progesterone depot, which we carry on till at least uh, right. thirty two weeks or thirty four you know, weeks. Mm -hmm. We generally would give it because we want to make sure whatever works. Right. We should. We should. Just, should. Uh. So as a routine, we, as a routine, we are giving in our patients. Yeah, uh, routine, uh, routine, we are giving it. Tocol it is only for a short period of time. Uh, we give um, the um, the I I V or the I M only till twenty four hours and then switch over either to oral or uh, uh, tocolytics. But then that we stop after seven to ten right. days if there is no activity. Tocolytics we are not giving for long. Tocolytics for a short yeah. time. So just but progesterone we can continue. We can can continue because this right. patient has a short cervix etc. It is better to continue. Right. Thank, thank you, thank you thank very you. much, thank and we Dr. quickly must privilege yes, Dr. Anju. We will wait for the next talk, Madam, for your comments because yeah. we are running late. Yes, ma'am. I'm so sorry. We would like to start the next talk, which is by Dr. Kundan Ingle, and uh, Dr. Kundan Ingle is uh, the uh, chairperson of the Infertility Committee of Foxy 2022, and he has served as the clinical secretary for POGS and a great academician. over to you for your talk on fetal reduction uh good evening everybody ladies and gentlemen uh, first of all thank you dr uh, mitra and uh, uh, dr sureka for inviting me to give this talk and uh, a very uh, uh, congratulations to our uh, uh, president i chairperson icog dr mandakini for organizing such a excellent series and i think it's really going well and really really very really well appreciated by all other colleagues even from pune so uh, the task which is given to me today is a uh, to discuss about embryo reduction and the selective uh, termination and i think it's one of the very uh, uh, important area and very important procedure especially in the art practice and uh, lot lot many times we come across this scenario because of uh, uh, occurrence of multiple pregnancy but now with the help of vitrification and blastocyst culture and as well as uh, frozen embryo transfer technology nowadays in especially in ivf we don't see much multiple pregnancies but we see more into iui because iui we don't have certain uh, number of control on the number of oocytes ovulating or number of embryos forming so uh, uh, that is the area where we probably start thinking now uh, that this is definitely required i hope you can see my screen so in the history uh, dr dumez and dr ouri from europe and evans and hanfit from america they were the first to report on fetal reduction as a surgical approach to improve the outcome and dr mark evans at hudsel hospital in detroit he has the pioneer work in fetal reduction and it has been uh, contributed to for to his name lot many things which are uh, developed in all last 25 years uh he was known for his work in genetics prenatal screening and diagnosis and the selective reductions of the pregnancies also so this was little history about the embryo reduction 
Now, why do we need of embryo reduction? And the reason is very simple that we are coming across a lot of uh, induced multiple pregnancies because of ART uh, involvement or ART interventions. And we know that there are a lot many maternal complications uh, that are associated when we go ahead with multiple pregnancy. One of is very uh, high risk for increased miscarriages, antipartum hemorrhage. The risk for preterm deliveries is very, very high, along with pre, uh, premature uh, uh, rupture of membranes. Pre-eclampsia incidence is very high, increased operative deliveries, prolonged hospital day, and even the incidence of blood transfusion is very, very high. If we look at the neonatal complication, then yes, all the consequences of premature delivery, that is prematurity for the fetus, is uh, and their subsequent complications are something which are priority at neonatal complications. Also, we see a lot of time discordant growth, fetal growth restriction, growth discordancy, need for NICU, preterm complications, increased risk of cerebral palsy. So when we looked at the literature, the rate of cerebral palsy was 4.6 times higher for twins than the singletons per live birth rate. And the, if you look at the cerebral palsy rate per thousand was 2.3 for singleton pregnancy, which was 12.6 in twins and very, very high significantly. That was 44.8% for triplets. And I think this was a little shocking uh, sentence for you know, and that is why, which also tells us that how, what is the need of embryo reduction for, for us in present era. So it's a procedure which is designed to decrease the number of live fetuses in higher order multiples to improve the outcomes of pregnancies. And it is also considered that reduction of an apparently normal fetus, and that is what is something very important because that's a differentiating point when we say selective termination. So reduction of apparently normal fetus to reduce the risk of premature delivery of other fetuses in the same uterus. That is what is something called as a embryo reduction or a multifetal pregnancy reduction. And in this, the fetus or fetuses to be reduced is or are chosen based on technical consideration, such as which is most accessible to the intervention. This was a committee opinion by ACOG recently. Now, what do you mean by selective termination? So selective termination is a procedure when it is used in a multiple pregnancies, when one of the fetuses has a serious and incurable disease. So the fetus which we are reducing has a something abnormality or some kind of severe critical disease and or in the case where one of the fetus is outside the uterus. Again, selective termination can be considered here. Now in a selective reduction, fetuses are chosen based on the health status. So as we understood in a multifetal pregnancy reduction, the reduction, uh, the uh, fetus which is undergoing reduction is considered to be a normal health. Now, commonly also this area that is selective termination is used in a selective fetal growth restriction in monochorionic twins or for anomalous fetus. So very common area again, when you have a monochorionic twins and you have a selective, we want to reduce one, then even so that is comes under selective termination. Now, let's understand about fetal reduction. Uh, division or classification. So it, it can be first trimester reduction or it can be second trimester reduction. First trimester is again divided as the early first and the late first. So what do you mean by early? That is between seven to uh, seven to ten weeks is the early, and late is late first trimester is eleven to twelve weeks. Uh, uh, it is done during this time, and second trimester reduction is after thirteen weeks. That is thirteen to twenty four weeks. Now. Let's understand about the advantages. So when you like to do this early first trimester reduction between eight to 10 weeks, and the advantages are it is technically easy and it is possible to do very easily by a transvaginal route. What about, what are the disadvantages? Now here we miss the chance of spontaneous miscarriage or reduction. Like suppose you are having a, a, a twin pregnancy or, or triplet pregnancy, and you want to reduce, you do a reduction of one fetus and suddenly at 10 weeks, the another fetus is also lost. So here, you know, kind of situation can where we can lose some fetus suddenly and also danger of reducing normal fetus and leaving behind an abnormal fetus can be the situation when it comes to early first trimester reduction. Now in a late first trimester reduction, which is most commonly done between 11 to 13 weeks and it is considered to be the most preferred time. Why? Because you can do a NT scan and you can get the information for an abnormal fetus. So there are many things which we now uh, pick it up uh, on even early trimester scans. And of course, this knuckle translucency uh, with double marker test or NIPD will help you to identify 
uh, not inactivity, but NT scan is going to help you to identify the fetus, which is probably going to be genetically abnormal. And also it gives us sufficient time for a spontaneous reduction. And, but the disadvantage is it is difficult for the early learners, but for at the expert's hand, I think, I don't think so. It is so difficult. And of course it is slightly time consuming than the, uh, uh, than the transvaginal approach. What do you mean by second trimester fetal reduction? Now, suppose if the one fetus is abnormal, the selective termination, what we understand is been done in a second trimester, which is beyond 13 weeks. Now, also in a monochorionic twins, if there is a single fetal growth restriction, now we want to reduce that fetus so that we improve the chance of survival of the second fetus. Now, if spontaneous triplet pregnancy, they present directly in the second trimester, then yes, you don't have a choice of undergoing asking them to undergo second trimester fetal reduction. Right now or up till now, it was 20 weeks of gestation what was allowed, but with the new rule that uh, uh, with the recent uh, uh, you know, legal guideline that even in case of abnormal anomalous fetus, we can think of doing a ter selective termination up to 40 weeks also. Now, what are the prerequisites? So uh, very important is that the detail return and verbal consent after explaining the detailed procedure. Now, this is the procedure which I feel that we must uh, explain the couple in detail, chances of complete loss of pregnancy, chances of preterm labor, infection or PPRM are high, detailed ultrasound examination for assessment of total number of fetuses, chorionicity, accessibility of the fetus, detection of fetal anomalies is must and is the first step in fact to, before we plan this procedure. Uh, it's completely optional to do a urine and vaginal soft culture. It all depends on the symptoms and the upper speculum examination. And prophylactic antibiotics is something which is very important. And generally, it has to be started a day earlier of the procedure and has to be continued for five days post-procedure. Now, yes, as we discussed, progesterone is very important. So we must give progesterone and prophylactic tocolysis also to reduce the post-procedure uterine irritability for three to five days minimum. Now, this was the another way of doing transcervical fetal reduction, but this was like first discovered in 1980s by Dr. Martin Duflan. And that time under general anesthesia and transabdominal ultrasound probe, the cervix was dilated, used to be dilated with dilators and selective embryo aspiration was used to be done with a metal cannula. But always the most common problem with this kind of procedure had that increased risk of infection, not only that, miscarriage of the other fetus and the pervaginal bleeding was torrential and because of which now it is obsolete. The embryo which is close to internal loss only can be aspirated. So there was only a, a, a selective, I mean we could not select any embryo. Those which is close to the internal loss or proximity to the internal loss has to be aspirated. So now this technology is absolutely obsolete. About the transabdominal fetal reduction, which is most commonly performed, as I discussed, between 10 to 13 weeks, and easily approachable fetus, and uh, the one which is, you know, after examination, uh, you know, you have decided this fetus has to be reduced, then that is to be preferred. The disadvantage is the clinician skill is required, especially in the earlier part of learning period, and uh, also it has associated with slight increase in the miscarriage rate. But if you look at the pregnancy loss rate in a transabdominal was 16.7% versus only 10.9% in transvaginal. Little in this era, area, the transvaginal uh, approach has a little advantage. Let's see how the procedure is done. And I want to place a thanks here to Dr. Chandar Lulla, Dr. Pooja Loda and Dr. Jesh Patel for contributing videos for this uh, particular talk. And look at it. Here you can see a needle which is coming transabdominally and the tip is introduced into the chest of the fetus. Here you can make it out the cardiac activity. And once the tip is generally here, 21 gauze or 22 gauze needle is used. And it, you know, it is, it is, this is the transabdominal probe. And from the one corner of the probe, the needle enters and uh, goes into the fetal thorax. Now it is very important that when you insert, this is the needle tip you can see, the needle tip is inside, you pull the needle, if the fetus moves along with it, you are sure that you are inside the needle. And of course, you can take a help. Uh, you are inside the thorax. And of course, you can take a help of color Doppler also to assess the position of the fetal head. This is another video. Uh, so here also, again, you can so see nicely see the needle here, which is going into the fetal thorax. And 
we can inject the kcl that is potassium chloride uh, in the volume of 0.5 ml to 1 ml till the fetal asystole or cardiac asystole happens this is another uh, uh, picture where you can see that the needle is clearly seen here the needle tip is very hyperechoic and you can uh, uh, after injecting you must wait you can even puncture this is a procedure where you are in, instead of injecting you are doing a puncture of the card, uh, fetal thorax or the fetal cardiac uh, organ and because of puncture you are actually injuring and because of which the cardiac asystole happens now uh, this was another video where uh, you know how you can utilize a single puncture to reduce two uh, pregnancies and this was another video which was shared by dr chandar lulla where you can see two fetuses fortunately they are in the same plane now you can see the needle which is coming inside this particular right side uh, fetus gestational sac then it is uh, 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 pierced into the thorax you can see the cardiac activity then you aspirate dr kundan we are not able to see the video please kundan uh, no video is seen beta okay uh, i think probably that's why okay it is not it is hyperlink that is why okay i found your uh, uday's idea was great he showed from the whatsapp group here mere paas bhi the videos but mujhe wo embed karne mein can you see my slides now yeah okay you yeah, are seeing the slides i'll come back to that video particularly later mm -hmm. the next procedure is a transvaginal fetal reduction which is performed typically between 7 to 11 weeks now here the overall fetal loss rate and the miscarriage rate was higher with transvaginal embryo reduction at 7 to 8 weeks when it was compared with the transabdominal fetal reduction this was a study in 2019 by dr kim where 13.3% fetal loss was reported in comparison with the transabdominal so this was another uh, uh, you know picture do you see this video now clearly yes yeah so fine so here you can see a transvaginal probe you can use a needle puncture guide which is seen as a dotted line then you evaluate the fetuses to be wish to be reduced so finally many things are uh, considered here the uh, uh, the fetus which has got a smallest crl crl the fetus which has got a lower fetal heart rate the fetus which has shown a smaller gestational sac these are the ones which are selected as a priority here because possibility of their spontaneous reduction is higher and the sac which has got a good crl fetus good gestational sac good fetal cardiac activity uh, chances of spontaneous loss is very very less as you can see the 17 gauze hook needle is inserted uh, through the transvaginal guard uh, transvaginal probe needle guard and you can locate the fetus sorry for the poor visibility here but you can see the needle is going into the fetal thorax again the technique is quite same here only thing the more important precautions we have to take is you have to bring that fetus right in front into the line of your needle puncture that advantage you have with the transvaginal sonography and you can locate fetus and most important that the fetal has to be little still i think that's something which is uh, what we expect and we are dependent on the fetus for that particular point and once once you are inside then first you aspirate some blood because then you will see the blood is coming into the uh, cannula and which help you to understand that you are in the heart and then a 0.5 to 1 cc kcl potassium chloride is injected now once you inject you please remain into the thorax for minimum 3 minutes to maximum 5 minutes you will see that the cardiac asystole happened you can confirm it with the color doppler and then only you withdraw the needle as you can see it in this uh, video now very important is that that we know that it is easy to say and advise from triplet to quadruplets to quintuplets to twin gestation but reduction to singleton either from twin or triplet pregnancy is a very important decision and it has a guidelines to do it now for example in certain medical or obstetric reasons where elderly pregnant women or woman has a history of heart disease patient with a mullerian anomaly cervical incompetence history of severe preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy history of multiple big uterine fibroids i think it's it's good to to improve our reproductive outcome it is good to reduce directly from twin or triplet or multiple pregnancy to singleton pregnancy even a social and emotional issues like history of previous one living child patient didn't want a second uh, twins on the second time yes on that ground also it is allowed financially non affording but that is little subjective 
the methods of fetal reduction are so many different as i said we commonly uses injection of potassium chloride which causes fetal asystole followed by cessation of cardiac activity second i discuss about mechanical that is multiple intracardiac punctures third which is again nowadays commonly uses a cord ablation by laser or radio frequency ablation and a newer technique like in japan they recently use a microwave energy and the fourth which is also one of the very common procedure which is cord coagulation and occlusion by bipolar forceps through fetoscope through the uh, port now this is a, a very beautiful video of cord coagulation you can see there is first the 3 mm 3 mm trocar is inserted and then uh, the through the trocar the bipolar forceps is inserted when you see here two hyperechoic parallel lines it's a bipolar uh, forceps prongs and you can see the umbilical cord here and you try and grab the umbilical cord between these two prongs because it shows as a hyperechoic you can so nicely see uh, two prongs and you can uh, held can you see the coagulation and the fumes so nicely so when you coagulate you will see those uh, fumes which are coming out and at the same time you can have a look at the cardiac activity you can just use uh, 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 cardiac doppler also uh, i mean the fetal doppler also color doppler also to document that the cardiac activity is this but i think uh, hold the umbilical cord very properly confirm then uh, coagulate it nicely and then you can look at the cardiac activity observe it that it is completely ceased then only you can leave this now here it is very very easy procedure that way well, doctor doctor kunnan yes i'm afraid that uh, <laughs> i think the time is up sure okay Please. i'll come to last slide is that okay yeah okay sure okay sorry. so sorry no problem so i have just to summarize the trans abdominal ultrasound guided embryo reduction is the most preferred technique in present era with advantage of ability to select normal fetus for conservation and exactly opposite is selective termination where we are actually reducing the one which is abnormal and we are leaving one which is normal now it is very rewarding procedure in terms of pregnancy and fetal outcomes and ideally one should attempt to reduce multiple pregnancy to twins but if the reduction to the singleton is necessary in a selected situation as we discussed one should expect the same results in respect of post procedure complications expected pregnancy and neonatal outcomes so there are many studies which have shown that if you reduce from uh, uh, multiple pregnancies to twin pregnancies the outcome is similar if you would have not done a non reduced twin pregnancy so it outcome is absolutely similar in terms of maternal as well as neonatal so it's a very rewarding procedure and i thank you all the uh, icog team for giving me chance to speak on such topic thank you very much for the patient hearing thank you so much thank um, you dr kunal dr anju soni to kindly uh, welcome thank you very much dr kunal it was very beautiful anju ma'am uh thank you dr kunnan it was very very beautifully presented <clears throat> session you did a very beautiful job and explain everything in <clears throat> such a short manner and of course it is very very important uh, to reduce for a fetal outcome and also of course finances are important but fetal outcome is very important what very important thing is when you are reducing uh, now with lots of things fish and everything available we can check the baby in advance uh, during the pregnancy also with amniocentesis and then decide about it about the fetus number one and number two is that you should not uh, you know uh, talk about the sex which is very important in our country that the sex of the baby should not be you know uh, taken into consideration when you are talking of uh, selective uh, termination thank you mitram ma'am now yeah what i just want to say two lines only that um, let me inform the august gathering that uh, for our icog uh, course my doctor mr robson earlier and so was not able to come because we had to change the dates but what i want to say and appreciate that dr nuzat aziz if she is still logged in that i think she made it so simple that uh, at least personally i don't think i have missed that a foreign faculty could not join because she is such an excellent speaker as for dr girja and dr uday thank you so much for you know just uh, giving what i had requested you people lovely and the videos and the teaching you all are fantastic teachers and dr kunnan it is a difficult topic and i know 
that um, to make the obstetricians interested in it it was a great job thank you so much and i can see yes, that this is what to i just want to add that you know this uh, rescue circulage is something very important we should not shy away from this uh, i just wanted to congratulate dr uday and i was privileged to his chair session because i have done the same procedure seven um, seven and a half years back in my own daughter in law oh. and uh, we found it uh, when we were doing an ultrasound and she was dilated with the membranes popping and i just remember everything today the babies are very fine to one boy one girl and i pushed the membranes uh, with uh, wet gauze in the sponge holder sir i remember everything very well and uh, that is what i am just want to stress that what you have taught today is very important and rescue the class should be attempted by each and every person and uh, they are definitely very beneficial they they Thank give you time ma'am. for giving corticosteroid lung maturity and you definitely are able to uh have at least 7 to 8 weeks of you know uh, that is very very important and i think thank you have... and can we be brief no, with the comments to... please uh, so reka one minute one minute yeah. there is a question in the chat which has come twice to me that when the cervix is 6 to 7 cm dilated when i talked about the occlusion circlage when it is not necessary that the patient is in labor sometimes when this passive cervix is just opening up and it opens up to 5 to 6 cm and all and you find that the uterus is still uh, more or less relaxed you can give a little bit of tropolysis like rajendra said you know just to prevent uterine contractions and shut that cervix up because there are two or three people who have asked that question in the chat and i have tried to answer all the questions in the chat and uh, so that's what thank i want to please carry i see you be chair so to conclude please thank yes ma'am and Un unmute yourself ma'am i think everything is said but from the icog point of view i must say this is a very very educative very informative and people the students and other delegates are asking more and more see the questions and our faculty is equally you know uh, vigilant to see the questions and answering them so that is what the success of the icog and i am really pleased whatever we planned we are just going accordingly so with this great uh, you know uh, session i thank all the esteemed uh, faculty for their deliberation and i want you people to keep on coming to this forum and also guiding the student and teaching is such a noble work which all of us do so thank you each and every one uh, for this wonderful session very much madam yeah, please so go ahead yeah thank you very much madam next session will be taken forward by shazia mohammed and the chairpersons and the uh, the speakers i just want to request that shazia is new so please uh, uh, we request that one chairperson to comment after each uh, uh, talk please and shazia will indicate and invite the chairperson so that we save time also and there's a lot of coordination shazia to take over please uh, thank you ma'am uh, i would like to start uh, the session 2 now by introducing our esteemed chairpersons Uh, first is Dr. Ashok Kumar Sir. He is the head of Department of OBGYN at Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Sciences and Ram Manohar Lohia Hospital, New Delhi. Um, our second chairperson is Dr. Ragini Agarwal, Ma'am. She is Vice President of Foxy and founder of OBGYN Society of Gurgaon. He, uh, she is also founder and president Association of OBGYN Haryana. Next chairperson is Dr. Meera Agniyotri, Ma'am. she is professor and head of obgy at gsvm medical college kanpur and chairman of ethics and research state medical council she is also an advisor of women health cell ministry of health government of india the first speaker for the session is um dr aparna sharma ma'am she is professor and unit head at aims new delhi and has extensive experience in maternal health she has been instrumental in taking forward the qi movement in maternal and newborn health she will be speaking today on twins and higher order multiples over to you ma'am uh a very good evening to all of you and uh, thank you mandakini ma'am uh, dr mitra saxena ma'am and uh, dr surekha for having me here so um uh, respected chairpersons and dear audience i'm really really happy to be speaking on twins and higher order multiples and i will say that i'm not the unit head i am uh, an additional professor in my department um so uh, regarding that the uh, twins i will just begin by this uh, small giving birth here. to twins has always been trouble 
Consider the Greek myth of Leto, whose delivery of Artemis was easy, but Apollo, the second twin, did not emerge for nine whole days and nights. In the myth, Leto's labor was prolonged because Alethea, the goddess of childbirth, had been kidnapped. But in the modern world, is there something we can do to make twin births easier? Giving birth. So I will say that, you know, we are here as obstetricians to make the twin birth easier. So when I want to discuss the twin birth, so thankfully we have a lot of experienced obstetricians here who have a lot of experience on twin birth. But when we want to discuss twin birth, what we want to discuss here is timing, the setting, the route, and the techniques. So when we talk about timing of delivery, I would say that, you know, there are guidelines, there are different guidelines, but a general consensus is that if it's an uncomplicated dichorionic twin pregnancy, it makes sense to take the pregnancy up to 38 weeks, although 50% of the twin pregnancies would deliver preterm. But if you are fortunate enough to take the pregnancy, then it is logical to take the pregnancy till 38 weeks if it's a dichorionic twin pregnancy. And if it's a monochorionic twin pregnancy, we generally take the pregnancy up to 36 weeks. That is a general consensus. But any time after 34 weeks is a logical uh, conclusion according to ACOG. However, if it is a complicated twin pregnancy, including a monochorionic monoamniotic twin pregnancy, any time after 32 weeks is what we are looking at for delivery. And if it's a complicated monochorionic twin pregnancy where we have intervened like a radiofrequency ablation or we have done a laser photocoagulation, then the timing would depend on how the babies are doing at that time point in time and the Doppler monitoring. What is the delivery setting? Definitely, we need to have a place where there is appropriate trained personnel who are trained in breech extraction or internal external version, depending on the choice. And of course, cesarean facility with anesthesia facility should be available and pediatric staff should be available to handle multiple babies and transition or, and resuscitation as required. The delivery route is very, very important. This essentially determined by the fetal presentation at the time of onset of labor and the amniosity. So please remember here, I'm not saying curiosity. I am saying amniosity because this is what really determines the mode of delivery. So if we look into the fetal presentation at onset of labor, 80% of the time, the first twins are kephalic. And 20% of the time, the first twin is non-kephalic. So this 20% essentially rules out a normal delivery unless we are feeling very, very experimental. So 80% of the time, we can think of a normal delivery. But 20% of the time, it is straightway cesarean section. Now, in a diamniotic twin, now this is the major uh, uh, thing that I'm talking about. In a monoamniotic thing, we are discussed that a monoamniotic twin pregnancy again goes for a cesarean section. In a diamniotic twin, we have to go uh, think for a vaginal delivery if the presenting twin is kephalic and appropriate expertise is available in terms of internal external version or a vaginal breach delivery. This is a 2021 review in which 20,000 women who were planned for a vaginal delivery, 80% of whom actually achieved vaginal delivery with good neonatal outcome. Now, the, our main question in our mind comes is that if we do a planned cesarean delivery, does it significantly improve neonatal outcome in a twin pregnancy where the first baby is kephalic? So this was the landmark twin birth study in 2013, which changed the entire thingy and said that if the first twin is kephalic, there is really no point in doing a cesarean section. So in this women, around 1300 pregnant twin pregnancies, they underwent cesarean versus planned vaginal deliveries and the composite maternal and the fetal outcome irrespective of chorionicity was the same in both group and they concluded that if the first twin is kephalic we can allow them a normal vaginal delivery so who are the twin pregnancies who should undergo cesarean delivery all monoamniotic twins all diamniotic twins whose first twin is non kephalic and for pregnancies with standard obstetric indications like placenta previa. So if you have three uh, of these indications, then you will say that you have to do a cesarean delivery for a twin pregnancies. Now there are certain special consideration for a first twin who's kephalic and a second twin who's non-kephalic. If the trial of labor with attempted breach extraction of the second twin, are you mentally prepared for it? 
and that cesarean delivery is available if the breech extraction is unsuccessful and if the patient does not wish to attempt a breech extraction for the second twin then can you do an external cephalic version of the second twin or in the case patient is not willing for both then you go for a cesarean delivery of both twins again if the first twin is cephalic and the second twin is non cephalic there is one another important consideration that needs to be given that if the gestational age is less than 28 weeks or the estimated fetal weight of the second twin is less than 1500 grams then in that situation we have to go for a cesarean delivery also are there any contraindications to breech extraction because of head entrapment that is if the estimated fetal weight of the second twin is more than 20% of the presenting twin because in that situation we cannot do a pelvic assessment and the second stage of labor of the first twin so the first twin went into labor you gave her the uh, uh, second stage of labor and then you thought that the pelvis may not be adequate for a breech delivery so these are the situations in which a cephalic non cephalic twin combination cannot be allowed a vaginal delivery a uh, what happens to a diamniotic baby with a non cephalic presentation is of course you have to go for a cesarean delivery this is seen in approximately 20% of gestation and also there is a unique potential of complication which is called as interlocking twin which is a rare phenomena where the chin of the first baby locks behind the chin of the second baby so this is very rare so to avoid this complication you should really go for a twin pregnancy but once this happens it it really leads to a problem the babies cannot be saved and a destructive operation so how to decide the mode of delivery determine the presentation of a and b if both are cephalic go for vaginal if a is non cephalic if first twin is non cephalic go for cesarean if first twin is cephalic second is non cephalic is the gestational age less than 28 weeks or less than 1500 g again go for a cesarean section but if it is more than 28 weeks more than 1500 g and the estimated fetal weight of one of the babies is more than b then probably you have to think about cesarean section but if it is all of these factors are included considered for then in that case you can think of delivery of twin a with breech extraction of twin b so this is the algorithm that you need to follow to decide the delivery of a twin baby what about previous cesarean delivery although it has been seen to be reasonably safe there is insufficient data but whatever data is available it has been found to be reassuring that if the first twin is cephalic and it is otherwise eligible for a normal delivery you can give it a tolac but honestly speaking not all of us would be very comfortable giving a tolac to a twin pregnancy what about very low birth weight that is less than 1500 gram or twins uh some people believe that you know there is increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage but there is inadequate evidence to allow or give strong recommendation so what is the exact steps in management so adequate iv access blood product availability arrange blood type and screen allow oral intake in the first stage of labor portable ultrasound machine should be readily available to determine the position fetal heart at all times you can induce it is not a contraindication prostaglandins oxytocin induction and augmentation same as singleton pregnancies again what about the progress of labor the effect of twins on progress of labor is not clear in the largest series the second stage was slightly longer in twin pregnancies as in singleton however the monitoring should be continued on a partogram as you would do for a singleton electronic fetal heart rate monitoring is recommended for both twins in labor because intermittent auscultation is not really practical if available epidural analgesia is the analgesia of choice because it provides good pain relief does not cause neonatal depression and if you have to do some manipulation it is also available you should deliver the uh, twins in a place where immediate cesarean delivery is possible whether it is your labor room suite or ot please decide your facility if you can immediately send the patient to ot it is possible otherwise you can deliver the patient in the ot itself it undergoes extension so Thereby, you need to decide so the first part of the twin delivery the twin one is just like a single turn where you deliver a single turn pregnancy and there is nothing different that you would do in a twin pregnancy what about what happens to cord clamping 
in a monochorionic twin pregnancy it is not advisable to do a delayed cord clamping because there can be acute twin to twin transfusion and second twin could develop anemia and hypovolemic shock from exsanguination but in dichorionic twin pregnancy it is reasonable to allow delayed cord clamping for 30 to 60 seconds after birth it is very important to label twins as progressive number of clamps 1 and 2 as they come out now we come to the more important part which is the delivery of the second twin after the first twin has delivered breathe take some time assess again using physical examination ultrasound electronic fetal heart rate monitoring look at the heart rate and the position of the twins 12% of the second twin are supposed to be non cephalic interval between the first and the second twin earlier we used to be very hyper that 30 minutes have passed but now we have to understand that as as long as the fetal heart rate is all right there is no finite time at which we need to deliver now if the first twin in the second twin is cephalic you have to sometimes augment labor because labor contractions go down if the head is engaged do a artificial rupture of membrane if the head is not engaged we can do a controlled needle puncture to allow slow leak of membranes a slow leak of amniotic fluid to facilitate descent and then some people also do internal podalic version with breech extraction this is not uh, universally prescribed because this is an intrauterine manipulation for this you need anesthesia support please do not attempt it just casually in the labor room without any anesthesia support patient can faint so in internal podalic version you actually go down hold the feet and and bring the baby out not a very very commonly thing to do wait let the head descent let the head come out so this is one of the methods now if the second twin is not non cephalic and it is breech so you go for breech extraction again intrauterine manipulation aided by ultrasound visualization again you need to relax the uterus and extraction feet are uh, grasped and this is a video again i would like to show on a mannequin hands that is on the same side as the fetal abdomen after the abortion the external or abdominal hands initially supports the fundus and later can assist in rotating the fetus in the longitudinal line this setting allows the candidate to palpate so in this fetus. model you can see that the baby's feet are felt with the left hand and gradually we hold one feet of the baby and with gentle traction we get the feet out so that the baby's feet is out in the process the membranes will get ruptured of the fetal breech on the maternal side and keeping the back anterior at all times we get the other feet out the appropriate technique and the rest of the baby is delivered like you would do in a breech extraction it can be delivered by abduction thus so this is very important to be having an experienced person who is known to uh, have done previous breech deliveries if you are want to do a breech extraction in the second twin so for the delivery of the second twin if it is vertex deliver as vertex wait for the engagement of the head give oxytocin do rupture of membranes and deliver if it is non vertex can you do ecv can you want to do you want to do breech extraction intrauterine manipulation if you are doing you will need your help of your anesthetist do not put your hand inside without being the patient being in ot and with the help of anesthetist now coming to the cesarean delivery of a twin pregnancy is not any different from the cesarean delivery that we do for a normal uh, singleton pregnancy we have to be careful in between that you know we are clamping the cord whether it is a monochorionic twin pregnancy or a dichorionic twin pregnancy please be very very careful that in a monochorionic pregnancy do an immediate clamping of the cord you have to inform your pediatricians there should be two teams of pediatricians who are handling the babies that is the only care that you need to uh, be there so that there are adequate teams to be handling a twin cesarean section and in the postpartum period please be very careful now this particular uh, cesarean section we did a few years back was the delivery of a conjoint twin now we can understand that a conjoint twin could be a difficult challenge so we gave a vertical incision here so in a conjoint twin there are various types of conjoint twin and the one which is actually joint this particular thing had joint at the liver and these babies actually had a good outcome even after delivery they were separated the liver were separated and they went home actually nicely so this we gave a vertical incision on the abdomen and uh, after the uh, the we gave a wide incision however in this we gave a 
a lower segment transverse incision, although it was a wide incision, but we managed with a lower segment incision. And uh, so you see here that one of the baby's head is coming out and the, both the babies were actually joined at the point of the abdomen. So this is something that we call the omphalopagus. So this is the extreme form of monozygosity where the separation has not happened. So this was, you could say that we were following this pregnancy throughout. And then what we found is that there was only a, a small uh, liver which was joined. So if you see this, these are the babies who are coming out. One of the baby came out. And now the head is there just next to the other baby. And then we deliver both the babies together. And then immediately these babies were handed over to the pediatrician and these babies were stabilized and then operated. And then they both actually went home and they're doing fine. So this is the challenges that you actually face when you deliver a conjoint twin. And this is another interesting case of a twin pregnancy in which the babies had to undergo an exit procedure at the time of delivery. So both the babies, one of the babies had a congenital high airway obstruction. So one of the babies was delivered. However, there was a confusion on which baby because the MRI showed something, the ultrasound sent something. So one baby is delivered, kept on the cord, the, the cord is attached. So one baby is being intubated using a video laryngoscope. So after the intubation of one baby, the baby is still attached to the umbilical cord. We have not clamped the cord of the umbilicus. After the one baby was intubated, we clamped one cord. Then we delivered the second baby. This baby actually had chaos, congenital high airway obstruction. A rigid bronchoscope was put inside, but it could not go inside. So on table tracheostomy was done with the umbilical cord attached to the mother. So this was one of the most challenging twin deliveries that we have ever done. So you see this rigid bronchoscope is being introduced. You see the cord here, the cord is still attached to the mother. We have not ligated. So this is our ENT surgeon who's putting in a rigid bronchoscope, not working. Now they're doing a tracheostomy on the baby. We are still monitoring the cord. The cord pulsations are there. The baby is getting oxygenated through the cord and now the tracheostomy has been put inside. So after this, the baby was operated after delivery and the baby went home fine. So this is one of the more challenging cesarean sections in twin that we have done. So unplanned cesarean section can be done in four to 10% of the babies when you cannot deliver the second baby vaginally. Management of third stage becomes a risk because you have over, overly distended uterus and PPH can happen. A last point about what happens in, if one baby dies. Now, this is one of the most challenging situations, one of the most difficult situations. Please remember there is a dichorionic twin and a monochorionic twin. Now, if one dichorionic twin dies, it does not really affect the monochorionic twin. So, fetal, uh, so what we have to do, do is that if management in a dichorionic twin it is not a strong indication for delivery of the surviving twin. Please let the pregnancy continue till term to not deliver the baby preterm. If, however, the monochorionic twin demise has occurred, you still need to continue the pregnancy with an explanation that a demise of one monochorionic twin will have a 30% effect on the neurological development of the other twin or 10% demise of the twin. So even if demise of one twin has occurred, please understand that we need to continue the pregnancy as close to term as possible. So parental counseling, there could be spontaneous onset of labor within three weeks, steroid and magnesium cover whenever indicated and monitor uh, for after four weeks of spontaneous intrauterine fetal demise. So if you have known the cause of fetal death, continue the pregnancy and deliver and give steroids and magnesium sulfate wherever indicated. I've rushed through this part because I think I've overshot the time a bit. So if it is triplet, I will only ask two questions. Why in this day and age we have allowed triplets to continue without reducing them? And if the triplets have continued, please deliver them by a cesarean section. There's not much that I would like to say about triplets. So I would end by saying that all who would win joy must share because happiness was born a twin. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. That was amazing. Uh, may I ask Dr. Meera Agni Odhya, ma'am, to comment? Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, 
only thing i just wanted to add or comment uh, uh, world trial of labor should not be added to uh, twin pregnancy trying vaginal delivery, delivery is different and trial of labor is slightly different one secondly your presentation of this video was excellent excellent very nice um, uh, i mean i have not seen one like this doing tracheostomy and uh, it was a wonderful presentation uh, regarding uh, twins delivering monocoronic twin it is a nightmare for obstetrician i remember one of my colleagues whose daughter was in nigeria she came for confinement with monocoronic twin and i know the palpitation of the obstetrician for delivering it and uh, sending it uh, home uh, so uh, very good presentation very nice presentation uh, but uh, take monocoronic twins very seriously and uh, trial of labor instead of trial of labor we can call it is allowing vaginal delivery uh, whenever you ask your juniors uh, among the com complications of the twin pregnancy they will come up with the first lock twins which is the last to be told uh, thank you very much excellent presentation shahzia next talk please thank you ma'am um, now i'd like to the next speaker for the session is there is some okay the next speaker okay. for the session is dr preeti ma'am preeti kumar ma'am she is chairperson of safe motherhood committee of foxy and vice president of lucknow obgy society she will be speaking today on manual removal of placenta and its nuisance over to you ma'am thank you so much are my slides visible yes, yes. ma'am it's visible okay okay thank you so much um, uh, first and foremost at the outset i would like to thank dr mandakni make dr parag my dear friends dr mitra and dr surekha for inviting me to this very prestigious platform uh, and i have to deliver a talk on manual removal of placenta after vaginal birth now i just want to uh, uh, express uh, my views here that you may not be sitting at a very tertiary or a high end center i think manual removal of the placenta is the maneuver or procedure that every obgyn should know so my presentation would be very basic and uh, i would like to touch upon very practical points that every obgyn should know with due permission of the chairperson my teachers dr Ra meera agnihotri ma'am dr ashok kumar sir and dr ragini agarwal i would like to proceed on with my topic that is manual removal of placenta and manual removal of the placenta is one of the maneuvers that saves the life of a mother i must mention here that the references in this context have been taken from the who recommendation from the up to date 200 in 2020 and safe delivery app that i really want to comment here that is a wonderful app everyone should download it and it is a labor protocol app which is very useful for the healthcare workers now coming to the third stage if you are stuck in the third stage how long should you wait should you wait for 15 minutes should you wait for 30 minutes or should you wait for 60 minutes defining retained placenta is lack of expulsion of the placenta within 30 uh, 30 minutes of the delivery of the fetus when you are doing a active management of the third stage of labor and we all know that delay in the placental expulsion is a life threatening condition for the mother and when you are doing expectant management and we hardly do expectant management it can be extended up to 60 minutes so when you are using the active management of third stage of labor the placenta should be expelled by 5 to 10 minutes or maximum 15 minutes i would like to talk upon the uh, on the active management of third stage of labor because this is a procedure that reduces the incidences of retained placenta and therefore the maneuvers like re manual removal of the placenta i must tell you when you are doing the manita uh, training programs most of the centers are still not aware of the active management of the third stage of labor and i just want to read out the components of active management of third stage you have to administer oxytocin 10 units im should not give iv after ruling out the second twin mesoprostol should be only used when you have you don't have oxytocin available there delayed cord clamping control cord traction and it should be done by skilled birth attendant and of course uh, followed by uterine massage and examination of the placenta there are several studies to quote how long to wait for the placental expulsion just to summarize i have taken just one study that more than 30 minutes have been linked to more of the blood transfusions pph and infection so it is always advisable to have a look and guard 
on 30 minutes and after that the action should be taken. Now the types of placenta, retained placenta, the etiopathogenesis has been uh, classified as trapped or incarcerated where the placenta gets detached but it is not expelled because of the constriction ring or the os closes and one of the very important causes that we see in the periphery is use of methargin, untimely use of methargin. Placenta, adherent placenta is, is the most common one which we encounter during retained placenta and placenta accreta spectrum usually is not found because most of them are detected in antenatal period and we deliver by them by cesarean section. The physiology of the placental separation has been divided into four phases. It is important for us to understand. The latent phase is that when all the myometrium contracts and except the portion where the placenta is attached, then there is a second phase is the contraction phase where the retroplacental myometrium contracts and then there is a detachment phase and then there is the expulsion phase. So any of the derangements in these phases can lead to the placent retained placenta. Coming to the risk factors, again, very important if there is a previous history of retained placenta. Preterm, mind you, is very important because that all depends on the gestational age. The lesser the gestational age, higher are the chances of retained placenta. There can be defective placentation in cases of preeclampsia, FGR, or stillbirth, or there can be uh, other causes, as I mentioned, like in use of injection ergometrin, where most of the centers are still using. Uterine anomaly has also been linked with the retained placenta. Maternal age, previous cesarean section, we all know, and velamentous insertion of the cause. Now, the important complications that we are afraid of are PPH, postpartum endometritis, and definitely uterine inversion when it is done by untrained pro professional. And I have taken this uh, thing when, whenever you are stuck in the third stage, do not panic. It is very important for us to understand, always call your senior. Do not just be panic in looking what happened or what not. Important thing is you talk to the patient, counsel the attendants, watch for the vitals, pulse rate, BP temperature, and vaginal bleeding. Vaginal bleeding is very important to assess because your management will depend upon whether the patient is bleeding or not. If the patient is not bleeding, the expected management can be extended to one hour. And if the patient is bleeding, definitely you have to immediately proceed on with the MRP and uh, under sedation, and you have to remove the uh, placenta and do MRP. The first thing that we teach most of the healthcare workers is that whenever there is a retained placenta, encourage breastfeeding because this is very important. The breastfeeding will stimulate the nipples and will release the oxytocin and thereby uterine contraction. This can be easily done and you can counsel the mother as well. The informed consent has to be taken. The procedure needs to be explained and the complications are to be told to the patient, uh, to the attendants and the consent to be taken. And then, then you have to arrange for the blood transfusion and the risk of blood transfusion to be explained. Now, coming to the drugs before MRP, oxytocin is a drug of choice and everyone should use oxytocin. Antibiotics before MRP, a single shot WHO has recommended that single shot of antibiotics is good enough. We will be touching on that. Tranexamic acid, if there is a bleeding, then you have to give tranexamic acid. Coming to mesoprostol, if you have a facility of sonography in your labor room, you can just put a sonography, uh, the, the scan on the abdomen, and you can see whether the, the placenta is separated and is retained, or it is still adherent to the uterine wall. It is advisable not to use mesoprostol if the uterus, the placenta is still adherent to the uterine wall. But yes, if it is separated and retained, then mesoprostol can be used. So this is very important. We, we quite often use uh, these medications. So if it is attached, it is, it is advisable not to use mesoprostol because when you proceed on with the MRP, then you can face problem. Now coming to the oxytocin, if you face that they're, they're, after 30 minutes, the placenta is not expelled, the first thing that you can do is give her give the patient 10 units IM uh, syntocinone as you give in the active management of third stage of labor. Now, some of the OBGYNs, they give intraumbilical uh, prostadin or they give intraumbilical oxytocin. That, but the recent studies have shown that this is not of any benefit and it does not aid to the removal of the placenta. Now, then after giving a 10 units of uh, intramuscular oxytocin, you can same way try the control contraction as you do as what is called as brand induced technique. And if that fails, you can opt for the another technique that is windmill technique that is control contraction perpendicular to the axis of the vaginal canal 
and the rotated uh, the, it is rotated the clamp is rotated 360 degree clockwise and you can try to expel out the uh, placenta then again it is very important do not be too vigorous because you can cause the inversion of the uterus now coming to the manual remo removal of the placenta it is very important that it should be done in ot uh, it should never be tried in the labor room the first thing but if the patient is bleeding and you see that the patient is collapsing definitely in under sedation you have to do the removal of placenta under the guidance of senior in the labor room the consent to be taken the sedation or anesthesia is used hand hygiene and asepsis is very important bladder catheterization should be done gloves should be used elbow length then mrp to be done and then you have to do the uterine check and followed by uterine massage and uterotonics NSDC anesthesia I've already talked about. If the patient is bleeding, you can go ahead with the sedation. If it is active, it's not active bleeding, then you can wait for one hour and then you can proceed for the manual removal of placenta. But most of us usually try to re, uh, go ahead with the procedure after 30 minutes. Now coming to this glove part, this is very uh, looks very simple, but most of the centers we don't have the elbow length gloves. So what you can do is you can simply wear the normal gloves. cut the portions of the fingers in the second glove take the second pair just cut this the portion of the finger and just slide the second pair of the glove over that the previous glove that will make you the elbow length glove and this is what we teach to the healthcare workers now coming to the antibiotics 2 uh, gram ampicillin or 1 gram cefazolin has been recommended is good enough for the prophylaxis uh, for preventing postpartum endometritis but if that is the patient is allergic to the drug you can use clindamycin Tranexamic acid is useful when the patient is bleeding, and then again, women's trial have shown that for within three hours, tranexamic acid is effective, not beyond that. So it is very important for un, un, to us to understand better. You deliver the placenta as early as possible. More delay in delivery of the placenta will cause more problems, and you will land up in more problems. The first and the foremost procedure is I have taken these diagrammatic uh, presentations so that you can understand well. empty the bladder this is very important hand should follow the path of the cord and it should reach the lower end of the placenta insert the entire hand with the fingers opposed find the maternal placental interface interface and cleavage and try to gently separate the placenta to and fro movements from below upwards while other hand maintains at the fundus of the uterus this is very important you need to stabilize the fundus of the uterus if you have want to have the grip of the placenta if you are not stabilizing the fundus of the uterus it is very difficult for you to catch hold of the placenta the grip should be complete and gently take out the placenta and once you come to the lower segment then again you have to push the uterus back as you do when you do the uh, uh, removal of the placenta pushing uterus backwards Uh, as soon as you come down in the lower segment recheck for the uterine cavity for any retained products and then you do a uterine massage again there is a dictum whether you should do a check uretage after doing a manual removal of placenta it is not as advisable to do uh, the check uretage after manual removal of placenta you should not put unnecessary uretage in the uterus again if you find that some bits or uh, the some portion of the placenta is stuck to the uh, to the uh, to the myometrium please do not if the patient is not uh, bleeding much do not disturb it because that can be uh, a myometrium can be very thin at that point of time and you can have perforations i have seen doing uh, these instrumental evacuation where the uterus had been perforated and that rotary was done so surekha was asking me to share the experiences say experiences are many but 15 minutes time is i think less to explain the uh, ex uh, share the experiences so i just wanted to touch upon the basic concept of manual removal of placenta because every obgyn every resident should be aware of this maneuver that is manual removal of placenta of course the patient is in shock resuscitate and manage pph we are not going to touch upon the ma basic management you have to call for help lower the head end fluid should be given oxygen and aortic compression because this is a maneuver where you cannot just uh, put you try and balloon because the placenta is still inside you have to do aortic compression for the uh, for decreasing the blood loss again i want to emphasize on this pph bundle response the figo is recommending this if you have removed the placenta and the patient is bleeding the first thing is the bundle response that you have to do is you try and massage iv fluids uterotonics and tranexamic acid 
again tranexamic acid to be given 1 g in a diluted dose do not give it concentrated straight away bolus and then the supportive measures that treat, treat the tears empty the uterus and empty the bladder then if refractory ppg patient is again not responding then you have to opt for the aortic compression you try in balloon tamponade or anti shock garment and you if, if the facility is not well equipped with the procedure because mrp is a procedure that may land up in many complications it should be done at a tertiary center or the center which is well equipped for the laparotomy procedures so post mrp monitoring and again is very important for first two hours you have to observe every 15 minutes and then for next four hours you have to observe every 30 minutes and what you need to observe is the general condition of the patient talk to the patient uh, ask her to breastfeed vitals you try and tone bleeding and urine output just two or three slides more and if the patient is bleeding and you are not able to control put a uterine balloon tamponade and then shift that patient to a tertiary center instrumental uh, evacuation may be uh, uh, may be needed if it is not possible to insert the hand but in ga it is it is done but if it is adherent you can evacuate the uterine cavity but it should be done by experienced person so i've already told uh, about after the removal the utotonic drip should be continued for at least 12 to 24 hours and the bleeding to be monitored and if needed the additional utotonics can be given now post op care antibiotics the single shot shot is good enough but if you, if there are tears or you have done a repair of the tears then definitely 4 to 5 days of antibiotics uh, should be extended puerperal pyrexia should be observed catheterization for maximum 24 hours anemia correction is again very very important you need to correct the anemia and blood transfusion there are certain referral protocols that need to be followed resuscitate if there is a bleeding utotonics to be given refer with someone or paramedic who is well equipped and trained for managing emergencies or ubt or nsg in place must tell you that nsg is the garment which prevents the which, which can hold on the patient for a longer period of time it is not a procedure to arrest the bleeding it is a procedure to check the to treat the shock and maintain the stability of a patient till the patient reach, reaches the referral center so emergency referral protocol do not refer if emergency is not control never refer a pa patient if in a uncontrolled bleeding after emergency management and when she is stable only then refer the patient quickly organize a transport and financial aid inform the referral center this is very very important it is crucial that the woman is accompanied by a healthcare worker and consider to bring the relative who can donate blood so quality statements at the end is retain placenta for more than 30 minutes increases the complications the timing of intervention should be taken into account how and in which stage of gestation it is done because I, as i mentioned that lesser the gestational age you can just wait on for a longer period of time pph is a major complication intra umbilical oxytocin or prostatin are not helpful in uh, in the removal of the placenta no role of routine curettage after fdp so it's a motto to teach a healthcare workers these are the training programs that we are doing Uh, to the healthcare workers in the manita you can see that we are teaching them about the active management of the third stage of labor it's a time to strengthen the healthcare workers it's a time to strengthen the uh, healthcare providers because that will definitely save many many lives and every mother will be insured and every child will be safe thank you so much for giving me opportunity for this wonderful platform Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful session. May I ask uh, Dr. Ragni Agarwal, ma'am, to comment? Ashok Kumar, sir, kindly comment. Uh, may I ask Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir, to comment? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Priti, for your uh, uh, excellent talk. And uh, see, MRP is a emergency. I just like to. Uh, add few more practical points one is uh, active management is very important as madam has told but uh, under ga one has to be carefully performing this that you should not injure the uterus and uh, when you are entering the uterus with the gloved hand it is always better to uh, warn the anesthetist that you are entering the uterus so that uh, he or she can just uh, help in the procedure so that uh, they relaxes the uterus more and uh, you yes. can easily enter that you should not go against the resistance 
because sometimes os is uh, closed or something little bit tight so it becomes very difficult to go inside sometimes you fail to enter also so you have yes. to take the help of the anesthetist at that time and uh, when you are coming out you should not move out your hand until unless uterus is contracted again so as madam has told that you have to start the oxytocin and just see that uterus starts contracting then only you remove your hand along with the placenta that has to be taken care otherwise patient will have pph because of the uterine atony so these are the little bit more and one more thing which i would highlight here that uh, uh, our teacher used to tell us and we also experience when we did mrp that uh, until unless your shoulder and full arm doesn't pain yes. for next 24 hours your yes. mrp you have not done properly not that means yes, it was sir. a it was a not a case of retained placenta then so yes. these are the few things which you should remember and i think it is a real emergency and uh, everyone has faced these type of situation and uh, in the end i would like to thank dr mandakini madam and team icog for organizing such a wonderful obstetric program and uh, uh, enlightening and educating all of us thank you madam thank you madam thank you sir uh, our last speaker for the session is uh, dr chinmay rath ma'am she is fetal medicine expert and chairperson of fetal medicine committee ogsh she will be speaking on exit procedures modifying obstetric operations for fetal indication over to you ma'am thank you very much uh, can i just share my screen please yes ma'am at the outset i thank mandakini madam for this wonderful opportunity mitra madam and sureka madam uh, for this beautiful program and i have been enjoying the talk so far and from what uh, preeti madam described as something that every obstetrician sh should know and something that you are going to encounter every day and it's extremely important i am going to go to a different platform altogether where an exit procedure is a procedure maybe even in Fetal maternal centers we do one or two every year. I have done about six of them, but uh, really this is something which you should know because it comes under modification of obstetric procedures for fetal indications, and it's not uncommon for a fetal um, obstetric uh, procedures to get in uh, modified for fetal indications because we know of many things that have been listed here, like doing an LSES for example instead of a vaginal delivery, early clamping of the cord, delaying clamping of the cord, delaying cord blood collection. So these things are always done. But the ex utero intrapartum treatment is a different procedure altogether where there is a unique modification to the cesarean section, and this is known as an exit procedure. Oops, oops is not because I made a mistake, but because that is exactly what these procedures were called in the beginning. They were called operations on placental support. And this was described way back in 1996 when they described a particular uh, method of managing airway management in prenatally diagnosed tracheal obstruction. So it didn't necessarily talk of the exact exit procedure, but it talked about uh, establishing a fetal airway while the baby was still on placental circulation. The exit procedure particularly was described by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia group in 1997 when they mentioned a procedure to undo the tracheal occlusion that was done for treatment of in utero treatment of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. A plug used to be placed in the fetal trachea to allow for the lung growth. And at the time of birth, this plug had to be removed. So if the baby was uh, detached from the mother before the plug was removed, it would get asphyxiated. So before it gets detached from the placental circulation, a fetal airway needs to be established. And that is exactly the ex utero intrapartum treatment. So it's an extension of the usual cesarean section. And once the baby is partially delivered, you don't deliver the whole baby, you only deliver the head and the neck of the baby. And while the baby is still attached to the umbilical cord and the placenta is still supplying the uh, fetus, a patent airway is established by a neonatologist or an ENT surgeon. And once the exit is completed, then the umbilical cord is clamped and the rest of the cesarean section proceeds. Now, this may look like just an extension of a cesarean, but it's a little more complex than that because it requires a multidisciplinary team and a coordination between maternal fetal medicine specialist, neonatologist, pediatric ENT surgeon, and sometimes even the pediatric surgeon operating on a newborn baby. So what is the rationale? Why exactly do we need to do an exit procedure? When the fetus is in utero, it, supply, it is supplied oxygen by the maternal placenta and the umbilical vein brings in oxygenated blood into the fetus. Now, the lungs are 
in a fluid filled condition, they are not actually contributing to the oxygenation of the baby before birth. At the time of birth, when the umbilical cord is clamped and the baby comes out and cries, these fluid filled lungs become expanded and the alveoli become air filled and then they become the area of the air exchange and they become responsible for oxygenation. Suppose a fetus has any condition where the airway is either blocked or the lungs are not in a functional condition, then the baby will get asphyxiated after birth. So we need to bypass this asphyxiation by getting a patent airway or arranging for some other form of oxygenation for the baby, like say an ECMO or anything else. So that is what happens in an exit procedure. You bypass the uh, initial lack of oxygen because of the cord clamping by letting the cord still supply oxygen to the baby till the airway is made. So the cord is clamped after a delivery and eutrotonics are given in a normal cesarean section to facilitate placental expulsion. But in the exit, the modification that happens is you actually give uterine relaxants after the delivery of the head and the neck to continue the uh, placental blood flow there. So when would you do an exit procedure? When there is a large fetal neck mass with obstruction, like a cervical teratoma, a lymphangioma, goiter, neuroblastoma, a congenital high airway obstruction sequence, the thing which Dr. Uh, um, uh, Aparna showed in her talk, tracheolaryngeal atresia, severe micrognathia, even when the chin is very small, the baby is unable to swallow and there, there, there can be problems with the high airway uh, formation in those cases. Chest masses with intrathoracic airway obstruction like pulmonary airway malformations, bronchopulmonary sequestrations or mediastinal teratomas, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, that's a very common indication and in fact most of the procedures that we have done are for congenital diaphragmatic hernias and severe congenital heart diseases in some cases and of course conjoined twins as she showed them. So before planning an exit procedure, we need to have a good radiological evaluation. So now we do ultrasounds for all pregnancies and most of these fetal lesions are uh, diagnosed on ultrasound. So what we need to establish is that the fetus is in a cephalic position. A cephalic position is an ideal position for an exit procedure because uh, even the video that you saw in the past, the baby was in cephalic position. So first the head and neck could be delivered. Whereas if it is in breach, it will be the other way around and it won't be an ideal candidate for an exit procedure. But if the fetus is in any other position, either you will have to extend your ex uh, incision to get the baby in a favorable position for intubation, or you may have to do a kind of version before you try the exit procedure. The other thing that you need to check is the placental position. Suppose the placenta is anterior, then you may have to go above the uh, placental edge because you can't really cut through the placenta if you want to do an exit procedure. Then again, if the neck masses are extremely big and they are hyperextended, you may not be able to get the fetal head in a position that you will be able to deliver the head in a favorable position for uh, intubation. Cystic neck masses, if they are, uh, the lesion characterization says it's cystic and non-vascular, sometimes one can try draining up that mass before delivering the baby so as to make the whole procedure easy and uh, stabilize the baby better. The other things that can be done is fetal MRI to get a global view of the entire fetus and better lesion characterization because unless they are calcified, ultrasound cannot help in delineation of the uh, lesion characters. And of course, fetal Dopplers because with their very vascular masses, they can decompensate a baby and that appropriate measures for fetal cardiovascular stability have to be taken at the time of the exit and the neonatologist has to be told accordingly to be prepared for those kind of uh, emergencies. Again, polyhydramnios can change the the position of the placental edge. So before, when you are planning your incision, that is going to be an important thing for you to consider. So uh, especially the, you need to have a very clear idea of where your incision is going to be on the uterus for, for you to have a successful exit procedure. Now, these are the things that need to be checked on any uh, imaging uh, modality before an exit procedure is planned. And as you can see, their ultrasound uh, does not help us in getting the airway distortion, the anatomical location of the fetal tongue, or a global anatomy in twins. So in all these things, the MRI helps. Espe uh, only thing it doesn't help us in is assessing the respiratory function, because as you know, motion is a deterrent for MRI imaging. We need a, st a like static baby for an MRI imaging, but all other 
procedures which can be done in static positions, the MRI scores better than the ultrasound in terms of evaluation. So one must have a fetal MRI and a good fetal MRI before you take a decision for intervention in these cases. Anesthetic considerations are very important because the anesthesia that is given to the mother is only considered the um, uh, anesthesia which will trans, um, transfer into the baby. So usually we use general anesthesia. Although the studies say that you can use both general and regional anesthesia, but if you use regional anesthesia, you have to add uterine relaxant separately and you have to add some fetal paralysis separately. So instead of that, giving a general anesthesia helps because inhalational anesthesias can provide reliable and a titrable uterine relaxation with quick reversibility. All other methods, you need to add more and more uh, adjunct medicines and they can aggravate the hypotension in the mothers and make them unstable. How much time should it take for the exit procedures? If you review literature, it is difficult to exactly calculate the time because nobody really mentions the time of placental bypass. But on an average, it has been between 5 to 25 minutes. But sometimes if it's a you know multiple failed attempts of um, airway establishment, it may last up to 50 minutes. That's another advantage of doing a general anesthesia where you know, you're not struggling against the time for the maternal relaxation. Then, uh, like I said, both uh, general anesthesia and um, regional anesthesia are good, but at the same time, one needs to kind of understand that if a mother is under regional anesthesia, she's also witnessing what all is happening at that time. And in during an exit procedure, life is not always easy. Sometimes, like in the case we saw, you know, you, you're not able to put in a cannula, you, you're not able to do a rigid bronchoscopy, and then you have to do a tracheostomy. All this will play on the mind of the mother. So that is another advantage of giving general anesthesia that at least, you know, she she is calm and you know she's unaware of these traumatic events at that time so on a case-to-case -case basis one can decide what anesthesia one will use the most important thing is an optimal planning of a step-by-step -step procedure because like i said even in busy units once in a year or once in uh, twice in a year is the frequency of these procedures so everybody is not like completely geared to these so just before you're planning an exit procedure one has to have a meeting with all these people you know the anesthesiologist the assistants the pediatric surgeon scrub nurse everybody and everybody needs to know where they are going to be at which point of time otherwise they'll all be you know uh, striking with each other so it's a good idea is to do a mock drill before doing an exit procedure and everybody knows step by step that what am i going to do in the beginning of the procedure what am i doing to the middle of the procedure and the end of procedure so the start of the procedure is a standard fan and steel entry into the maternal abdomen uh, but since adequate exposure of the uterus is critical if necessary a vertical uh, abdominal incision may be considered don't bother about cosmetic at that point because the actual uh, problem is in saving the fetus. Once the entry of the to the uterus is determined, and uh, the placental uh, location may also necessitate an entry via a fundal uh, entry into the uterine cavity, depending on where it is. So initially, a histotomy can be made of only about two centimeter, and thereafter, while we extend it, here we do it uh, in the regular way and put artery forceps if there is any bleeding. But otherwise, there are typical uh, histotomy staplers which help in holding the um, incision wherever it is without more extra blood loss because we are going to now relax the uterus. So the obstetric team starts operating and only the head and the neck of the baby is exposed. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of temperature loss of the baby. So just expose the head and the neck and hand it over to the uh, neonatologist and the ENT team. And then they go in inside and intubate the baby. Once they uh, establish that airway, then the baby can be uh, just, you know, uh, removed from the uterus. This is a, a video I have taken from the uh, uh, internet because, you know, when we have done it, we have done it in cases where you the stress levels have been so high that nobody has bothered recording the whole uh, issue there but uh, you know this is how the baby is there inside and the um, uh, uh, once the airway is established then the baby can be taken safely into the uh, neonatal unit now the uterine relaxation and maintaining of uterine volume these are the two important things so because a lot of amniotic fluid might drain away if necessary you can keep replacing that with warm uh, ringer lactate or normal saline because the umbilical cord inside also needs to be kept warm and moist uh, so that it doesn't start contracting or uh, shriveling on its own and then a rapid sequence inhal inhalational agents are used along with IV nitroglycerin sometimes for uterine relaxation. So all these things can change maternal hemodynamics. So the anesthetist has to be on guard. And then uh, at any time that there, there is a, you know, 
gross problem or some kind of an abruption or something really bad, a consent for a cesarean hysterectomy needs to be taken in advance because that is like a, um, it's a plausible complication, although really in uh, actual terms, it doesn't happen that often. And uh, the fetal anesthesia, of course, is maintained through the maternal an anesthesia, but if required, additional intramuscular uh, fetal anesthetics can be given uh, to the baby in the shoulder. So once you do fetal intubation, just because already Dr. Aparna has shown this, so I'll just go through the flow chart. So you start with attempting the uh, laryngeal tube. If that doesn't work, then you put in a rigid bronchoscope. If that also doesn't work, then you'd go ahead and do a tracheostomy. At any point, if the mother is unstable, then you just pull out the baby and do whatever after that. So, uh, you exit the uh, exit procedure. But if the mother is stable, you go stepwise and try and establish the fetal airway before dividing the umbilical cord. Now, once the fetal airway is secured, the umbilical cord is clamped and cut and the intubated newborn is handed over to the neonatology team. Now, here it's important that uh, the management of uterus is aimed at maximizing uterine relaxation to maintain the plac uh, placental support. But once the fetus is separated, again, the goal is to rapidly uh, reverse the uterine hypotonia. And here, again, the co co coordination with the anesthesiology team is very important because now you have to quickly close the uh, uterine incision and achieve uterine tone. During procedure, also ultrasound can help because you can constantly guide the um, surgeon by showing the surgeon where is the edge of the placenta, where is the head of the baby, what is the attitude of the fetus, because if the fetus is non-cephalic in an ob oblique position, you can guide your incision like that to get the best access to the fetal head. The obstetric complications as expected are PPH and need for uterotonics. Fetal complications may be as bad as fetal uh, death, but they could be usually minor things like fetal bradycardia. The future direction to exit procedure, because you know this is important, but it has so many complications, is now described. This is a fetal diagnostic and therapy paper, uh, and recently it has been discussed in one of our uh, webinars, where uh, the suggestion is to do a fetoscopy guided endotracheal uh, in, uh, intubation, and then do a routine cesarean section just uh, the way it is done. So just prior to the cesarean section, instead of doing this entire jing bang of the exit, you just put in a fetoscope, put the uh, endotracheal tube in inside the fetus and then deliver the baby as normally and then take it. So an 11 French cooked cannula can be put in, a 3 mm orotracheal cannula is a, 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 like established inside. And just like it is done for diaphragmatic hernia, a tube can be put inside and an in intubation can be done. So this is what we think will be a future for the exit procedure that instead of doing this a little morbid procedure, we go there. So to conclude, I would say exit is a safe entry of uh, the fetus ex utero. Until exit, the prognosis for fetuses who had this airway obstructions was very dismal. But with successful exit procedures and meticulous planning, attention to detail and coordinated seamless transition between various components, things are getting better. So as we start doing better fetal imaging, accurate visualization, and we learn more about fetal anatomy, we definitely get things uh, into perspective. And with these minimally invasive techniques that are actually coming in, I think that will further modify the exit procedure and make it safer. So exit from the past and feti into the future, because that is fet fetal endotracheal intubation that we are looking at. So like Mary Angelo said, do your best until you can do better. And when you can do better, do better. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. This was um, for want of time. I would like to request uh, ICOG chair uh, person, uh, Dr. Mandakni Meg, ma'am, to conclude. And also the questions to be taken by faculty from chat box. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Tinmay, and all the faculties. It was such a wonderful talk. Preeti, very, very practical and informative. Aparna, it was too good, and everybody, you know, appreciated all the practical tips which has been given by you, Preeti, and Tinmay. It is something very, you know, unique and new to see the intubation while doing the, you know, cesarean section. I think in the days to come, it is going to be a norm slowly, slowly to improve the you know, the um, viability and less complication in the newborns. So wonderful and a, a great thank you from the ICOG, ICOG team for making our program and certificate courses so popular and, you know, highly academic. So uh, 
मैडम नमस्ते मेरा अग्निहोत्री मैडम नमस्ते नमस्कार एंड प्लीज कीप कमिंग एंड कीप यू नो एजुकेटिंग अवर पीपल एट आईसीओ जी यू कैन सी हियर अराउंड नाइन हंड्रेड पीपल वी आर अटेंडिंग एंड टिल लास्ट यू कैन सी द सेम नंबर यू नो अटेंडिंग सो थैंक यू वेरी मच Thank you very much, uh, Mandakini, ma'am. We quickly move on to our next, which is a guest lecture by Dr. Asha. Dr. Mandakini, we have wonderful yes, chairpersons. Dr. Mandakini, can you hear me? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes. I extend my heartfelt congratulations to you for you. such an innovative program. Thank I you. believe our postgraduates, those who are appearing, will learn a lot yes. because you have kept only practical aspects to be discussed. which is very very important theory can be learned anywhere but the way this practical uh, importance was given preeti and chirmaya they have presented very nicely it was a wonderful presentation for twins and all these things thank you very much mandakini it was an excellent program it's a great honor for me to be a part of this program thank you once again welcome thank you ma'am and shazia kindly share the screen for our chairpersons The first chairperson is none other than Dr. Suchitra Pandit, ma'am. She is a teacher par excellence and a great personality, and she has been the past president of Poxy and ICOG also, and she has uh, been also the president of ISOPARP. She is doing such a lot of work for a great organization like Gestosis, and ma'am has done. A lot of publications and awards she has to her credit. Welcome, ma'am, for chairing this very wonderful session. We have another chairperson that is Dr. Lakshmi Shrikande, also a very illustrative personality who has done. Please go ahead with the uh, uh, next slide, uh, Dr. Shazia. We have Lakshmi Shrikande, ma'am, being the medical director of Shrikande Fertility Clinic, and yes. Madam is the chairperson designate of ICOG 2020, and she also has been the uh, done a lot of work for Foxy for last 25 to 30 years. Welcome, ma'am. Next chairperson is Dr. Asha Bakshi, ma'am, and Asha Bakshi, ma'am, is the vice president elect of 2022 West Zone Foxy. Welcome, ma'am, for the session. And I now invite Dr. Lakshmi Shrikande. kindly introduce dr asha rich singhani yeah thank you so much surekha at the outset next slide at the outset i must say that icog chairperson led by icog chairperson dr mandakini may is really doing a great job and your this course on emergency obstetrics is a great hit yesterday with 1100 participants and today it's a pleasure and privilege to introduce our guest speaker dr asha rich singhani for this certificate course of our own icog she is familiar to we all but even then just to formally introduce her she is a maternal fetal medicine consultant and she is assistant professor at john hopkins university she is a pog member since 1987 and she is associated with many organizations above all that she is a great human being humble a great academician with so many publications to her credit and she is a great great orator as well so i don't want to come between you and dr asha dr asha the floor is all yours thank you very much um i'm actually a professor at uh, albany medical center and at university of iowa currently i trained at johns hopkins i was an assistant professor at johns hopkins 25 years ago i'm still with johns hopkins but uh, how do <laughs> i share my that is what i saw on internet but then i saw this is the cv slide you shared so <laughs> no let me tell yeah, you no, my, my fault is focusing <laughs> her slides her cv runs into 19 pages oh. <laughs> so this was just an abridged version okay okay it's a very long cv and we are very proud to have you yeah yeah most welcome asha to you thank you thank you having a live session that is really commendable because of the time difference between india and usa asha hats off to you for your commitment 
it's totally my pleasure i feel really very privileged that i was asked to do this i'm very thankful to dr mitra saxena and you know all of you um it's it's just been phenomenal so i'm trying to figure out how to turn on my powerpoint here so i'm going to talk today about something very routine very mundane but from mundane it could suddenly become something very tragic and we all have faced it and um this is something which any obstetrician practicing will face a few times and it's going to give them a moment to think about where they are headed and sometimes they'll think about not wanting to do obstetrics anymore i have had those experiences multiple times especially when you work with residents and fellows so it's on shoulder dystocia so this slide uh, just remember this slide and and you don't need to remember anything else so it's unpredictable it's not your fault it's unpreventable potentially very dangerous and if you are prepared if you have had drills and you have practiced on mannequins or practiced during my time we didn't have mannequins we had no drills so we had to practice it live but we always had a senior a uh, person a professor or somebody with us every time for every delivery over here in us you have to have an attending physician with the residents so we were well covered and so if you are if you have practiced and you have seen how to deal with it it's not that difficult you just have to be prepared that's it before i go forward i just want to you know let you know that i put this candle I, I think it's showing up. I put this candle here for everybody in India, and you know everywhere. So what you two to point two to three uh, percent of all pregnant uh, women will experience these types of complications in labor, and why such a big difference? It depends on which institution is reporting the incidence. If you're going to a tertiary center that takes care of diabetics. so like in our diabetes clinic we have 80 registered currently registered diabetics that are on um insulin i'm not talking about the gestational diabetics i'm talking about type 1 and type 2 that we are treating with the insulin pump uh, in those cases it's much higher in uh, a community hospital it's much lower and the definition is when you are unable to deliver the baby with a gentle traction we give a gentle traction all the time a downward gentle traction when that does not cause the anterior shoulder to deliver get prepared and i typically prepare all my deliveries as though every single delivery is going to be shoulder dystocia uh, there are of course risk factors Uh, but these risk factors don't always hold true you could have the skinniest person and a smaller baby and you could still have shoulder dystocia so um the reason i have put these risk factors in a lighter gray color is because they are not really uh, what you will see you will see this of course this will be associated with a slightly higher risk but anybody can so prolonged pregnancy prolonged second stage bigger baby forceps delivery i do not allow my residents to put forceps on diabetics ever that is an absolute no no if they do it you know i i i don't let them work with me then um strong word traction be careful do not do that especially if it's a big baby or a diabetic mom and you know majority of them will not even have these risk factors that's why i put them in this lighter gray color it's potentially dangerous for mom and baby and mom can tear and have atony and postpartum hemorrhage and baby of course can get asphyxiated and have brachial plexus injury um the thing to remember is uh, one study showed that about half of these babies with shoulder dystocia will be small less than 4000 grams and majority will be non diabetics when we see a diabetic and a bigger baby we get more concerned but you need to be prepared for every single patient um recently mm -hmm. this is as of 2 months ago there was a study that was done to look at macrosomia and shoulder dystocia in relation to macrosomia 
and the, for 40 studies with over 66,000 patients and macrosomia was not that predictive. It's only weakly predictive with a likelihood ratio of about two. So don't go on that. Um, the current literature does not support ultrasound screening. People have tried doing ultrasounds. They've tried estimating fetal weights. As you know, bigger babies and even term babies have a plus or minus 20% error in estimated fetal weight. And so if you go by the ultrasound, you are not going to be able to diagnose these as um, you know the predictability is extremely low. So, and it's not clear whether screening for suspected macrosomia will um, help you, but there is a big study that was started recently called the big baby trial. It's a randomized trial of large babies and you know, we'll hear more about it when it happens. So initially people used to call 4,000 grams as LGA and over 4,500 grams as severe LGA, it still is, but in the US it's over 4,500 grams that we consider really abnormal. This, this is very routine. Many of our babies are close to 4,000 grams and give or take 200. That's sort of the average weight and an average woman who is uncomplicated. If you use the 4,000 grams or the 90th centile to call it LGA, it's only 50% sensitive. Um, the Hadlock formula is slightly better in the likelihood ratio of predicting it versus the shepherds. And the AC is also you know, pretty decent, the abdominal circumference. I use the abdominal circumference when I'm on labor and delivery. And if a patient is progressing very poorly, I'll usually go and do an AC on at the time of labor, because um, obviously the fetal size is not going to be reliable with the head molding. And if the AC is really large, my threshold to sectioning them is very low. But if the AC is small, then I, I'm, you know, I, I will do my forceps. So here is the likelihood ratio for a 4,000. You can see it's only like 2.2 or so. So not very, 2.1, sorry. Mm -hmm. So not mm -hmm. all that reliable. Um, so the false positive diagnosis is pretty high on ultrasound and therefore there's, you know, it's discouraged to do it because it increases the risk of C-sections. It increases the risk of doing many C-sections. There was a hospital I was associated with while I was at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore called Franklin Square. They would scan everybody. Everybody under over 4,000 would get a C-section and majority of those babies were not 4,000 grams. So, you know, doing, see, doing an ultrasound is not helpful because it'll only increase your C-section rate and harm the mom. Now, if you have, there was a study uh, about a few years ago, about five, six years ago, babies that were predicted to be greater than 5,000 in non-diabetic moms. In diabetic moms, they used 4,500 grams. And then in those, they looked to see if there was going to be significant shoulder dystocia, brachial press injury, fetal injury, maternal injury, fetal death. And they concluded that if you suspect a large for gestational age baby, then you should really induce them. Don't wait, induce them. And you know, the ARRIVE trial as of, when was it? I think 2019, that also says induce patients in the 39th week, don't wait until 40 weeks because your C-section rate will go up if you wait until then. So always, always, always be prepared. Call for assistance, get your two nurses, get a little step stool because you may have to do suprapubic and you won't get enough pressure down if you're standing on your toes. So you need a little step stool. Anesthesia, get another helping hand by an obstetrician, especially if the baby is going to need resuscitation. You may want to get terbutaline over there. In case you're trying to do the Zelvanelli maneuver and you're trying to push the head back, you will need uh, terbutaline. So have that ready on your labor and delivery and have like a PPH card. I don't know if you have a PPH card. We always have a PPH card where we have all these medications where the nurse will just pull the PPH card and she'll bring it to the room uh, at a minute's notice because these moms do tend to bleed. Um, patient, when you're trying to do all these procedures, patient has to stop pushing. She cannot push. Bladder should be drained. And then, you know, these are the fetal procedures. I'll go through these fetal procedures one by one very quickly. So, you know, it's, you, you all of you know this, but just, you know, refresher. So, McRoberts 
what I do is even if I have a 3000 gram fetus and the mother is a primary gravid, all the nurses know that I want all patients to do the macrobits. I just routinely do it. And I've had, personally, I've had very, very few shoulder dystocias. I have been called in because the resident is doing something or the fellow and they get into trouble, you know, and they have not done McRoberts. So I do it on everyone. I just walk in and I tell the patient, I want the knees at the level of your ears. And even if she's a multip, doesn't matter because multip patients are at risk for postpartum, uh, sorry, for uh, shoulder dystocia. So just bring the knees way up. You can see how the pelvis opens up, allows the baby to come down. So this is these are maternal maneuvers. This is suprapubic pressure here. The OB is doing it, but you really want a nurse or a resident or somebody on a stool on the side, pushing that shoulder down so that it comes underneath that symphysis and it gets delivered. If you have to go to a fetal if those two don't work for you and most of the times those will work for you if those don't work for you the next one you should do is delivery of the posterior shoulder so put your hand back and sort of bring the two shoulders together because it's the best acromial diameter that is causing the baby to get stuck and when the best acromial diameter is in the ap uh, diameter of the pelvis, that's when it gets stuck. So if you put your hand behind and just push that shoulder anteriorly, then the bisacromial diameter decreases and the baby will slide out. And I, I put my entire hand back there and it's very easy for me to do. Some men that have bigger hands, it's hard for them to do. So often when I was a resident, they would call me and I would just slip my hand in and do it very very easy to do if you know just lubricate your hand and if you cannot hold the head up have somebody hold the baby's head up so your hand can go back there um so put one hand into the vagina and you know grip and then you need to grip this arm so that you can you can pull it out and it'll it'll slide out the wood screw maneuver you're going um you, you will put your finger anterior to the posterior shoulder and you're going to push it back which will make the baby roll um, anteriorly the upper shoulder will will move um, anteriorly and towards the right side in this case if it's an lot or lop or loa and you will deliver the posterior arm first because when you do this again you're decreasing the bisacromial diameter um, it's uh, you apply the pressure to the to this anterior shoulder right here, and then that will turn the baby forward by 180 degrees. Opposite of it is when you put the fingers behind the shoulder, not anterior, and baby doesn't move forward; it moves backward. I'll just show it to you. That's called the oh, this is a video. Let me let me hope that this works. Here it is. This is the wood screw. You're putting your hand behind the one baby and then the other hand, I guess the other hand doesn't come here, but there it goes, anterior shoulder and push that and push, push that shoulder backwards when you with your fingers anteriorly, there you go. And out it comes. So your fingers on top of the anterior aspect of the shoulder is what really works better. Um, and then the Rubin technique is opposite of that your hand is on the back of the shoulder and the baby moves in the opposite direction you can see it's in the opposite direction i don't have a dvd i don't have a you know video for that but it's opposite it, it, instead of coming forwards it goes backwards and so you're adducting the posterior shoulder and rotating the fetus 180 degrees um, in the opposite direction I have never tried Gaskin's maneuver and I don't think I ever will because some of our patients want to deliver this way. You know, they love nature and the nature, the animals deliver this way. So they want to deliver this way. And I'm like, forget it. I'm not an animal. I'm not going to do it this way. So I, I freak out when I see this. I will not allow this, but this is supposed to be a method to deliver the posterior arm because then the baby falls down. But, you know, I don't know that the baby falls down. It cannot. It's pretty badly stuck. So I, I've never seen anybody do this, but it's been described, the Gaskins maneuver. 
Now, should you do a large episiotomy? The thing is, if you do a large episiotomy, there are more chances it's going to turn into a fourth degree. So be careful. I, you know, if I'm, if the introitus is very tight and I'm not able to put my hand back there, I will give a little episiotomy, not a large one. And it extends when my hand goes and it extends. And I've never had it become a fourth degree, thank God. But um, so I give a smaller one. I don't give a large one, but this large one is questionable. If you're giving a large one, give it mediolateral. Try not to do it midline. Now, as a last ditch effort, what do you do? You have to put it back in. So a little story about this. So Dr. Zelvanelli, he described it in 1978, but earlier than that, Dr. O'Leary had described it and he had described the... Uh, there was there's a Dr. Gunn who had who had I think performed five such procedures in 1975 but never published it. So Dr. O'Leary, James O'Leary, published it, and so then he told Zelvanelli that you cannot take credit for the name. Our names need to go too, and so it became a Gunn Zelvanelli O'Leary maneuver. By the way, Dr. O'Leary was my chair many many years ago. I was his resident. And so what you do with that is you want the uterus relaxed. The mom cannot push. She has to be relaxed. And you have to do reversal of the cardinal movement. So you want to turn the head so the occiput is anterior. And you want to flex the head, push it back into the vagina. Give her a bit of turbutaline. That will make it easy. The risk is that if you are really rough with it and you really push hard, then you could rupture the uterus or lacerate it. But you know, since most OB doctors now are women, even in the US, I don't think they are using this excessive force. But I actually have never seen a Zelvanelli. One of my partners recently had it and it was terrible, but anyway. So here is a Zelvanelli, you know, you turn the head so that it's occipital anterior. This is the first step you will do. Without doing that, it's not going to go back in. Um, I think I have only a couple more minutes to go. This is a video of the Zelvanelli. You can see the doctor is turning the head and then it just slides in. Put a lot of lubricant so it slides in. The first surgery he did, I think it was well over an hour before he did the C-section and the baby came out fine. Now, what is your last ditch effort? I've not tried it, but you can, one of my um, co-fellows at Johns Hopkins, Peter, he used to push on the clavicle because he said that with the bisacromial diameter decreases, but it's really difficult to crack the clavicle. You know, he's a bigger guy, so maybe he did it, but if you're going to try to crack the clavicle, do it upwards away from the lungs. Otherwise you will end up with pneumothorax and you will end up with maybe brachial plexus injury. And the funny part is clavicles fracture all the time, but it's not intentional. It happens unintentionally. Um, never use a sharp object to crack the clavicle because that can crack other things in the baby and in the mother. And as a last ditch effort, you can do a symphysiotomy. We recently, actually last year had a diabetic. She weighs about 45 kilos, very skinny thing. Her baby was about six pounds and that baby had the worst shoulder dystocia on earth. And so one of our newly minted res she, she was a faculty she had just finished her residency um, completely totally freaked out and so she actually did a symphysiotomy and it, it was terrible but i saw the patient last week she's pregnant again with her second baby and her baby is doing good so you can do a sharp dissection of the pubic symphysis in the midline please avoid the urethra because you can cause injury and in try to avoid this it's not really the nicest thing to do. So in the US, we our guidelines is that if a primary gravid has a baby more than 5,000 grams, you can do C-section. Diabetics greater than 4,500 grams. I would think in Indian women, this would be lower. We used to use 4,000 for the US women and we would uh, um, diabetics and 4,500 if they were non-diabetics. So I think that would be more appropriate for an Indian patient. I don't know, I'm just saying it. Perhaps you have you know, your own data available. Um, but whenever you come across shoulder dystocia, please do macrobits first. So maternal first, so macrobits. So do prophylactic macrobits on everyone. You will never regret it. Um, 
then do suprapubic, then do the posterior arm, and then do you know the wood screw and so on. And please document because we have had residents that will document that it was so terrible and you're standing there and it definitely wasn't terrible. So then that woman in her future pregnancies will be condemned to getting a C-section versus I once did a consult on a patient whose baby had a palsy of the you know brachial plexus injury, herbs palsy and required therapy for over a year. And when I called her doctor up, the doctor said there was no shoulder dystocia and she remembers it as being terrible. So documentation is critical because the patient may go elsewhere next time. And so what you have written is what's going to help the other doctor or you, because you may forget about it. Simulation is extremely important nowadays. You have it, why not use it? So please do it. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, you know, thank you to the whole team that invited me and organized it. What a privilege, what an honor. This is a very, very simple, basic talk. I'm sure all of you know this. If you want me to send you the PowerPoint, that's my Gmail. I'm actually moving to Seattle. I'm going to be a professor at University of Washington in Seattle in a couple of weeks. So this is my Gmail I'm giving you. Um, you can, you can it's, that's misspelled, but you can email me on my Gmail and I'll be happy to send it to you if you want the pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that very illustrative. I invite the comments of Dr. Suchitra Pandit. Uh, thank you, Asha. Nice to see you after a long time. Uh, hi, Asha. And first of all, congratulations on your new assignment as professor. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, moving forward and yes shoulder dystocia is a nightmare and you know those of us who've seen patients having this problem know exactly what uh, you know you talked about and i'm very glad that you brought up the point even as a practice uh, i tend to use a microbiome position for all my patients while delivering and sometimes the nurses keep wondering why does madam want this particular position so you know it's uh, you're, you're very right you know it you never regret that because if you feel that there is something happening you can quickly go on to the rescue and start with their supra pubic pressure. Thank you very much. And I think those animated videos, that particular portion was really very good. And I'm sure, uh, you know, if this copy can be shared with the ICOG, it'll be there on the website for anyone to see. Thank you, Asha. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Mandakini. Fantastic program. Uh, your thank comments, please, send Dr. Me an Asha email. Bakshi. Send me an email so I know where to email it. I'll do it right away. Dr. Asha Bakshi, ma'am, please. Hi, Dr. Asha. I'm Asha here as well. Uh, it was really a nice, very nice talk, a very important talk and very important for each and every obstetrician. And I liked your points about prophylactic microbirds. And another thing is having lots of drills. I think drills are again important so that you don't come across unexpected things. And one more thing, one more point that you made, I thought that was very important that all the patients are not diabetics and hardly 50% patients who had shoulder dystocia were diabetics. But I think what is happening is maybe the women are putting on a lot of weight, excessive weight gain during pregnancy. That is another cause and let of, lack of exercise and all those things. So I think we have to be ready to face more and more shoulder dystocias and uh, very important to do antenatal classes for the patients, let, not let them put on a lot of weight, which most these days you won't be surprised. People, our women are putting more than 20, 25 kgs in each pregnancy. So I think that is again a very important risk factor. So congratulations, Mandakini Madam, for such a uh, successful program and to Dr. Mitra and to Dr. Surekha for all the efforts. Excellent program. And Dr. Asha, it was an excellent talk. Thank, Thank you very much. I see you Dr. chair, ma'am. Dr. Asha, uh, I have uh, written on your uh, you know, Facebook and other places to where to send the presentation. ICOG office at the gmail.com. Okay, cool. I'll look at that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have lots of uh, I have lots of messages on Facebook, so I'm going to do it this afternoon for sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, stay I, healthy. You I, know, my heart is broken. The, the I just can't believe what's happening to India. It's just terrible, and I'm just praying that you know that mutation that they have found the B1.617. I just hope it disappears as fast as it came because it's just a terrible, terrible variant. 
So you. stay healthy. Covaxin is supposed to be better for that. So I really sincerely hope they make lots of Covaxin and everybody gets that, you know, in addition, if they need to get in addition to the COVID shield, but please stay healthy. Thank you very much. So MOC, please go ahead with the other sessions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all the chairpersons and thank you, Dr. Asha for joining. And I request uh, now Dr. Pravina to kindly proceed. And uh, also I request the chairpersons that uh, 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 the comments will be invited after each talk for you. Dr. Pravina, are you there? Please yes. continue. Thank you, so Thank you, ma'am. Let's move on to the next session. <clears throat> Our first chairperson is Dr. Vidya Thobi. Madam is chairperson of Food and Drugs, Food, Drugs and Medico Surgical Equipment Committee, FOXI and ICOG Governing Council member. Welcome, ma'am. Our next chairperson is Dr. Varsha Basti. Madam is a senior gynecologist with 30 years of experience. At present, she is chairperson of International Thank Academic you. Exchange Thank Society of Foxy. I welcome you, ma'am. Our next Thank chairperson you. is Dr. Ashwini Bhalera Gandhi, ma'am. Ma'am is a gynecologist from Mumbai with an illustrious career. She is a past vice president of FOXI, past president of MOGS, and former chairperson of FOXI Adjustment Committee. Welcome, ma'am. Our first speaker of this session is Dr. Shashi Kabra, ma'am. Madam is a maternal health expert, Lakshmi mentor, and she has expertise in high risk pregnancy and obstetric hemorrhage. Welcome, ma'am. I now invite you for your talk on uterus conserving procedures. Thank you. Bilinch and stepwise devascularization. Thank you, Dr. Pravina, for such a kind introduction. Good evening, all. And at the outset, I want to give my sincere thanks to Dr. Mandagini, ma'am, Dr. Surekha, ma'am, Dr. Mitra Saxena, ma'am, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So now I'm sharing my screen. So my topic for today is uterine conserving procedures, bilinch and stepwise revascularization. So these are the different types of brace sutures, bilinch. Every OT, maternity OT should have this laminated bilinch and Hammonds and jaw suture. Now the suture materials which have been used over time are chromic catgut number two, vicryl number one, and monocryl polygliocapron number one. And the length should be length of the thread should be around 90 to 100 centimeter, and the needle length 17 millimeter, and needle should be round body needle so that it do not injure the uterine musculature. Now look at the building suture. Here you see this is the LSCS scar, and uh, this is three centimeter. This point A is three centimeter below and three to four centimeter medial to the lateral side. And the same here, point B, three centimeter above and three to four centimeter from medial from lateral side. And similarly, we have point E and F. And at the level of a triangle corner, our thread should pass four centimeter medial. So on the posterior side, we have point C and D at the same level as we had shown on the interior side, point A and B and E and F. And they are also three to four centimeter medial from the lateral side. Now I'm showing you a live demo of the billing switches. Is the video seen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So this is the atonic uterus you see, and after compressing, we have found we have realized that it will be held by billing switches. Now you see this is point A, three centimeter below the lower incision line. I'm going from outside to inside. Now through the train cavity coming out three centimeter above the upper flap and this is three to four centimeter medial from the lateral side. Now culling it over the fundus, four centimeter medial to the cornu. And here I'm pointing it through the point C and coming inside the cavity. Again in the time cavity. And now again from the cavity, I'm going posteriorly, coming out at point D and curling it over the fundus. 
distance from the train cone is four centimeter of the thread. And now I'm adjusting the threads, which is still flabby. And now anteriorly, again, three centimeter above the upper incision line at the level of E, I'm going from outside to inside. And again, in the cavity, through the cavity, I'm coming out through the lower flap, three centimeter below the incision line. So now we'll, I will get hold of the sutures with an archery forceps. Yeah, now the one important thing is we have to suture the LSCS incision. So I'm taking care of the angle now. The assistant is constantly compressed, keeping the uterus compressed. Bleeding is reduced a bit. I've completed the suturing and now you see the billing suture is in place and now I'm about to tie. My first knot will be a surgical knot with two turns. Just see how I apply the knot. Yeah, it will remain fixed, nicely tied. You can see the billing sutures in place and the bleeding is reduced. Three knots given. So this is the anterior side and this is posteriorly how it does look like. Yes. Now coming to the stepwise revascularization, these are the points. Uh, here I just want to highlight a few things that at point C and D, you must include the Descending uterine artery and vaginal arteries, our one bite is through the broad ligament and one bite through the musculature of the uterus. And one important thing is that ovarian artery ligation is a misnomer. We do not ligate the ovarian artery, which is here, which is a direct branch of aorta. We ligate the uterine ovarian anastomosis here. And this is most important, internal iliac artery ligation. It is a life-saving procedure. Uh, it works by reducing the pulse pressure by 85% and the rejection in blood flow by 50%. It converts the arterial flow into venous flow and this facilitates coagulation and bleeding is reduced. I've done in many cases and with very good results. Now, uh, for this, we have to open the retroperitoneum and this video will show how we open the retroperitoneum. See here, this is uterus and this is round ligament. I'll make a nick on the round ligament, almost at the junction of one third, medial one third and lateral one third. You see here I'm making a nick very gently and carefully, so as not to in injure the structures below. And very thin peritoneum is lifted. And from this side, I will go to the lateral pelvic wall, parallel to the infundibular pelvic ligament. And this retroperitoneum is being opened. We can enlarge it up to six to seven centimeters. You should practice this in a routine gynecological surgery, how to open the retroperitoneum. An excellent surgeon can open it in 30 seconds. Now I have kept all the instruments away because there are big vessels inside and I'm just spreading it through fingers, the loose areolar tissue, just spreading through fingers. It is a vascular area, loose areolar tissue. And you see here, it is beautifully shown. This is the ureter in the middle flap. 
This is psoas muscle. This is external iliac artery. This is internal iliac artery. This is the common iliac artery. So it is very important to recognize the bifurcation. Now, I made a model for demonstration of internal allocatory ligation. This is the model. And I'll show you how to do internal allocatory ligation so that we can practice in dummy. This is common allocatory, this is external allocatory, this is internal anterior division of the internal allocatory, which we have to ligate. And uh, here I just want to say one thing that when we press the femoral artery, this is a, this external iliac artery is a continuation of continuous femoral artery. So when we press the external iliac artery, then the femoral pulse goes, and uh, it is when it is released, then it comes back. And this is how we recognize the internal iliac artery. Uh, with the internal iliac artery, there is uh, no change in the femoral pulsation. So this is the division, anterior division which you need to ligate. Posterior division is given before, and now here I am showing in the since posterior division is given before and the anterior division we have to ligate and it lies three to four centimeters below the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. So in live patient, in how in live operation, how we will detect, how we'll detect, find the site. So you see with my thumb, I'm measuring with the scale, it is three to four centimeters, my folded thumb. And now I will apply it here below the bifurcation. You see, I'm measuring it here, three to four centimeter. And this is my proposed site of ligation. Normally in a pool of blood, the posterior division is not seen. Now this is very important. Uh, this is called right angle forceps or mixed forceps. It is right angle and this is rounded and this is not sharp. So no, it does not injure the important structures. And I use this for both the di dissection and for the ligation both. Now you see, look at the moment how you do the dissection. You see here, it is a sheath like structure. This internal, sheath and we have to separate the sheath. You just see the look at the moment, how I do it. This should be parallel to the incision and we do not do it along the whole length. I do it just only at the proposed site of incision. You look at the movement of the mixture forceps. I am doing it. This is parallel to the vessels. You see just I'm removing the sheath nicely, very gently. Only on the, I'll do it on the opposite side. This is done. And now I made a place for passage of my ligature and this is to be introduced from lateral to medial. And one very important thing that since the arterial wall is thick and the venous wall below is very thin. So the movement, when I'm showing, moving the mixture force from lateral to medial, it is grazing through the artery, not through the vein. So very gently, and now I'm getting hold of the loop of silk. And this is number one silk, which I use. And very gently, I'm pulling it very gently. I make a loop because I want to pass below only once. And now we'll cut it into two parts. So now there are two parts. And I will separate the threads nice. Sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. Now I time is about to get over. Yes. Time is about to get over. Oh, no, uh, let her finish, finish in one to two minutes. Let her please finish. Yeah. Now you see, uh -huh. one more important thing here is that uh, we are giving respect to the artery. I am going in front of the artery. I, if I pull the artery, then it will come in my hand and will lead to massive bleeding. So I am going my head and doing the ligation here on the superior surface of the artery, very gently, not pulling at all. You just see. First knot was surgical knot with two turns, and then I'm applying three knots. And very gently, I will cut it. I cut it myself. I never tell my assistant to cut it because they usually pull. And this is how internal iliac artery is ligated. And I will do the second suture similarly. And the distance between two is 0.5 to one centimeter. Next slide, my dear. So these are the anatomical relations of internal iliac artery, anteriorly peritoneum, medial ureter, inferior medial internal iliac vein, laterally psoas muscle, and infralateral obturator nerve. 
and uh, these structures we can enjoy. But I tell I tell you, if we practice it routinely, especially in a gynecological hysterectomy case, then we can become an expert in doing this and can avoid these injuries. And this is a picture that this right angle clamp is from lateral to medial side because if we insert it in medial to from medial to lateral side, that will just hit the internal iliac vein. And these are my important tips for internal iliac atrial ligation: open retroperitoneum from round ligament to infundibular pelvic ligament, or this, this I have shown you, and this second method is two centimeters below and two centimeters lateral to the sacral promontory. You can open the retroperitoneum. Only do finger dissection inside the retroperitoneal cavity. Locate the bifurcation, which is an inverted V structure. Recognize internal iliac artery as medial structure, not causing change in femoral pulse, and it is a posterior medial structure. Movement of right angle forceps or mixer forceps should always be from lateral to medial. Careful not tying in the cavity, never make haste, never pull it. And the distance between two ligatures is 0.5 to one centimeter. And always do bilateral, always do bilateral because we have seen in many cases, chances of free laparotomy and morbidity increases if we do unilateral internal ligation. Thank, thank you so much. And my message is that every... Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I, I request Dr. Vidya Thobi, my comment, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Shashi, as usual. And uh, for your uh, presentation, I congratulate you. But uh, I must say that all the postgraduate uh, must be trained for this internal iliac ligation. But uh, also, the bilateral uterine artery ligation also sometimes suffices. So that also, how to take an uh, stitch uh, with the, along with the myometrium that should be taught. The anatomy of the various vessels should be taught to tie it properly. And about your uh, delinch, which are, there are so many modifications of these delinch. And especially after vaginal delivery, uh, you can open and you can do, uh, without opening the lower segment, you can just modify this and uh, you can put the hem and stitch. And secondly, uh, the lower segment uh, bleeding should be tackled with the cervical isthmic suture. That should be added and that should be also taught. Uh, there are a few questions that you can, in the chat box, you can answer them directly or uh, 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 whether we can I... take some questions, I don't know. And secondly, I just wanted to tell about the hysterectomy. Hysterectomy is a last resort for atonic PPH, but it should never be delayed yeah. if it could be life saving. Yes? Okay. Thank you very much for... Uh, we are having... Uh, this one, Ravina, and, please uh, go ahead. Dr. Yes, Gita wants to text. Yeah, we are running Thank short for such so, informative talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Geeta Balsarkar, ma'am. Ma'am is professor in Sage GS Medical College, Mumbai, clinical secretary of MOGS, and associate editor of Jogi. Welcome, ma'am. I now invite you for your talk on uterine balloon tampon. Uh, my excuse me. You muted. Uh, my Zoom. Dr. Geeta Balsarkar, ma'am. Ma'am, I think you are not audible to us. Yeah, I, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear yeah. you. Now. Okay. Uh, that. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, in fact, one slight correction. I don't know. I'm the editor of the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about the uterine balloon tamponade. Dr. Mitra Saxena actually asked me to show a video, but I realized that uterine balloon tamponade is as simple as putting a Foley's catheter. So actually showing a video will not help. And uh, I have got 10 take home points from my presentation. So to start with, I want to tell you that uh, the first publication about the pressure balloon therapy in uncontrolled obstetric hemorrhage has been published in our journal. That is a journal of OBS Gynec of India. If you can see the um, slide, you can see Dr. Suvarna Khadilkar, who is our emeritus editor, whose name is already here. And they have worked on a large series of patients over 11 years. And Jogi is the first journal to publish about the balloon tamponade. And this was how the Shivkar's pack is actually described that there is a, a you know, saline, that there's an IV set, a Foley's catheter and a condom over the Foley's catheter. This is Dr. Shivkar's pack and it was first published in our journal. The Shivkar pack publication is in Jogi in July, August 2003. The next large series was the 
Saiba Akhtar Balloon publication that is even later than us. That is the September 11, uh, 2003. That is the next publication. Now, if you see this, this is uh, as early as 1999. People were trying to use various devices and Bakri Balloon device for control of obstetric bleeding was published as early as 99. But the number of patients were much less than what the Indian data. And then they have been trying to innovate the balloon. It is called as a Bakri SOS balloon and they needed about and they had they have worked with the balloon and they have you know sort of uh, brought up many new modifications but this publication was only of five cases that is the tamponade balloon for obstetric bleeding this was from the international journal of obs and gynec in 2001 and this had only five cases and now this is the balloon. It is very, very simple. It contains a central lumen and a silicon balloon where you can infuse up to 500 cc, a silicon catheter of 24 French with a length of 58 centimeter. And the most important thing is a drainage port in the center, which can drain the uterus and the and the, uh, you know, uh, this to insert the saline. So if we see this, we, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, compare it with the others, we can see that the non-uterine other specific catheters were used in about 76% and Bakri was used in about 24% in this particular publication. Now, this is a balloon tamponade. Basically, it has been found, uh, it has actually, uh, we all know that necessity is the mother of invention. So when we want to try and do something for the postpartum hemorrhage in patients, sometimes we find that the lower uterine segment is very flabby and it is the lower uterine segment which doesn't have the much uh, you know vascular uh, musculature which uh, you sort of bleeds and then you get this um, this balloon tamponade is very very good for such a thing now we all know that what is physiological tamponade it is a muscular structure of the uterus the shape of the uterus and the the, the actually the way the muscles uh, the muscles you know sort of uh, come around the blood vessels. When these muscles contract, the blood vessels get uh, constricted and the bleeding is stopped. So when in, in, in an atonic uterus or a partially contracted uterus, which doesn't actually deserve hysterectomy, we should be able to sort of control it with a balloon. Now what the balloon does it is in, in the warm water, which is filled in between, the balloon tends to, you know, sort of uh, comp the, the musculature compresses is from outside and the balloon tends to compress the uterus from inside. This is how the balloon tamponade helps. Balloon tamponade helps. Then this is how the balloon tamponade is in a uterus. We have to insert it inside first till it reaches about the fundus and then the ultrasound can also be used to see whether the fundus has been reached. And once we know that the fundus has been reached then maybe we can we have to put saline the amount of saline that will be required the amount of saline that will be required to fill this particular uterus is depends on an individual basis but roughly somewhere about 450 to 500 ml should be okay if the, there is a cesarean section even you can put your hand on the uterus manually and determine if the uterus is actually very tense or distended or we need more saline now this is how ideally your balloon has to sit inside the uterus remember there's a central lumen which will drain the blood and the blood will not come from the sides of the balloon it has to come from the central lumen so that you know we know whether there is any bleeding inside now what is most important is we have to prevent the displacement of this balloon if the uterus is contracting over the balloon because we are giving oxytocin and if the uterus contracts there is a tendency that the balloon will come out into the vagina so we, we necessarily we have to pack the vagina with an iodine or antibiotic soaked gauze but remember please do not extend the packing into the uterus it will prevent the balloon from doing its full action now if it is a cesarean section many people have said that you can use the this uh, you know the lower segment cesarean section you can insert the balloon before you suture the uterus but somehow it has never suited me i have never been able to do that so what i do is i close the uterus from above and then uh, you know give the patient position and try to put the balloon from below whereas the assistant will guide me as to exactly what amount of you know tensile strength is needed to stretch this particular uterus but even you can do a transabdominal placement initially and try to distend the balloon from below 
even that can be tried no matter what you use for tampon at the uterus very very important to always pack the vagina of insertion of any balloon or any uterine packing because as the uterus contracts this balloon will tend to come into the vagina and your packing will become loose and there there could be a possibility of a bleeding then uh, it is very important that as the uterus contract and we normally keep the balloon for 24 hours a small amount of the uh, of the balloon can even come into the vagina therefore we have to see we can even use ultrasound for this purpose that the correct uh, you know insertion and placement of the catheter inside the lumen or the uterus is very very important it can be used for a post vaginal delivery it can be used in cesarean section even after b lynch where we compress the sutures from above b lynch we can use even a balloon catheter now this paper is very very interesting it is it is by dr professor arul kumaran it has been published in clinical obs and gynec in 2002 it says that whether we need to seal, open this patient or to do laparotomy we have to assess by using putting this intra uterine balloon when we can distend it into 75 to 150 ml of warm water and sodium chloride until the balloon is visible in the cervix if there is my, only minor bleeding or a small trickle then we can put, keep the balloon and pack the vagina keep the balloon in place and give oxytocin for 12 to 24 hours cover it with a broad spectrum antibiotic and the next day we can deflate the balloon and check if there is bleeding first stop the oxytocin and then after 30 minutes remove the balloon but suppose if this with 75 to 150 ml of water warm saline if you find that there is still a large trickle then this patient might not get controlled with balloon and may need an hysterectomy so we may need to open this patient so this is a very very interesting paper and this is a some guide as to how we can approach these patients now uterine tamponade tools first even manual compression is a form of uterine tamponade we can do laparotomy with sponge or gauze and bimanual compression then bakri balloon which is by cook medical condom catheter or shivkar's pack then there is a seng stick and black and mo tube foley's catheter and a bilin suture these are all the uterine tamponade tools remember we have to consider consider A, B, C, D, E for postpartum hemorrhage. A is assess the bleeding and anesthesia. B is bladder drainage, which is a compulsory requirement before using a tamponade balloon. Check for any lacerations. C is check for any lacerations, any tear. Check for uterine rupture. D is dial for help and E is evacuate the uterus if there are any placental bits or anything before you put the balloon. Now keep in mind the possibility of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Very, very important. This balloon tamponade will not work if this patient has got disseminated intravascular coagulation. Therefore, always keep in mind the possibility of a DIC. Now various forms of balloon tamponade are available uh, with varying costs. This, uh, there is a buckry balloon, there is a Seng stick and black and more tube. There is a BT cap which is available. There is a rouge hydrostatic which is available. But remember, all of them are expensive. When in in a situation like India, all of them are very very expensive. So we may have to use a very you know innovative Indian method which is a shivkar pack. Now this is the same like a shivkar pack. This is by from Bangladesh by Ashtakar and team. This involves the same I, uh, the IV set, an IV bottle, a Foley's catheter which is connected to it and a condom over the Foley's catheter. Now in which cases we cannot do uterine tamponade when uterine rupture is suspected or when a disseminated intravascular coagulation is suspected or if hysterectomy is indicated for this particular uh, uh, and your uterine tamponade will not work. Now the main important question question is when do you remove the balloon note the maximum indwelling time is 24 hours this is written in the bakri manufacturer guidelines the balloon may be removed sooner upon the physician judgment of course in particular cases when there is not so heavy bleeding and you feel that you know patient is okay in six to eight hours and you want to remove the balloon you can remove it but the maximum time you can keep is up to 24 hours the balloon or the condom can be deflated slowly 
over several hours while monitoring the bleeding do not immediately deflate it at one go and remove it you know oh, little by little we can deflate it slowly once fully deflated remove the vaginal packing and gently retract the balloon and discard but we have to continue monitoring this patient for signs of uterine bleeding now this paper is a uterine balloon tamponade for the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage in resource poor settings this is a systematic review which has come however w who has in 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 recommended that there are no rcts for identified on the use of uterine tamponade for pph this is because we cannot have randomized control trials in management of pph so we have we there have been no rcts and the success rate according to who is only about 60 to 100% i guess this you know 40 to 40% of these patients either has been you know wrongly used or there has been associated dic or these patients required hysterectomy or the bleeding was very massive now if what we do basically because of the balloon tamponade is a uterine sandwich technique where the muscle tends to contract over your balloon and your balloon pushes the uterus from inside so that the blood vessels get sealed this is somewhat is a sandwich technique and if you see the bakri balloon this is how is a scheme diagrammatic representation of how a bakri balloon is used the iv stand is slightly elevated and then we can slowly let the saline go into the balloon to insert the balloon to spread inside the uterus and over the lower segment of the cervix and the close and bleeding this remember the central lumen is still open and it will have all the collection or the bleeding come from the central lumen now this is another form of the condom catheter and very sorry about the quality of how we can use a condom for the uterine packing remember there is a foundation called as a give their foundation from dallas texas usa who are very very dedicated to affecting the postpartum hemorrhage and the maternal mortality in india and they have started working in india with a pure peril sepsis kit but now they even donate uh, the bakri balloon to for for patients with the postpartum hemorrhage only thing is it, it is given as a donation so we need to give them data afterwards as to how and in which patient this was used now this is the address this is a local amdabad address of this jivdaya foundation it is in amdabad and this is a number and it is jivdaya at jivdaya. trust.org or if you apply there they will give you a bakri balloon especially for the educational institutions and the government institutions but the moment it is used we have to give them the data and then they will replace it with a new balloon so that is all i need to tell you but remember while we teach we also learn so i would like to you know take questions or or, or comments or more points about this you trying tamponade thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, i request dr varsha basta ma'am to comment please yeah excellent excellent dr geeta balsawar that you are the chief editor yeah use the jogi uh, presentations also to use uh, and uh, to give this presentation so you try balloon tamponade is as simple as putting police catheters that is very very simple thing you have told us so you can use patch 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 like condom with the, the the results were out in 2003 and the paper about bakri balloon was um, in 1993 Uh, for obstetric bleeding so this is a silicone balloon having 400 500 capacity of the saline and the balloon tamponade is for uh, lower uterus movement because it doesn't have that much of vascular reacher and uh, no contractility so physiological tamponade is not present in lower segment or in atonic uterus warm water in the balloon compress helps the constrict you know constrict the uterine from inside and so it is like a sandwich uh, te technique that you have explained very well 400 to 500 ml of saline is put inside central lumen drains the blood that is very very important you have to pack the vagina with gauze so that the balloon doesn't come in the vagina and keep it for 24 hours and slow release of the balloon when the procedure is done or the um, bleeding is uh, corrected the correct insertion is very important and post vaginal delivery or cesarean or even in bleach and bleach operation you have advocated to put it the balloon and laparotomy can be avoided a b c d e is very very nice you have explained about for pph detection and dic can occur there is no role of the balloon for preventing dic 
So you have to be very watchful. Shivkar are the Bangladeshi um, are uh, very cheaper. And the last thing that you have told us that Daya Foundation is giving their some preparation sepsis kit with donation of this Bakru balloon. That is a very, very important um, message you have given us and the, um, even the sourcing also. So it is very important um, to use it whenever it is needed. And so laparotomy or hysterectomy can be avoided. Thank you so much for your lucid presentation and use uh, as a chief editor of Jogi, you have given the papers also as evidence. Thank you, thank you, Gita. Thank you, thank you. Pravina, thank move, move, move. Thank you so much, ma'am. Our next speaker is Dr. Parikshit Tang, sir. Sir is presently joint treasurer of Foxy. He is a former chairperson of Safe Madhurud Committee of Foxy. Sir is a great clinician and academician with various awards to his credit. I now invite Sir for his talk on obstetric hysterectomy. Sir, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Praveena. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, the ICOG course today. My thanks to Dr. Mandakini Meg uh, for having such a wonderful program stretching over the last uh, few days. Uh, thanks to Dr. Mitra Saxena in particular for inviting me and to all the conveners. So if I can uh, just start sharing my screen, uh, I hope it's visible to everyone. Yes, sir, it is. Right, thank you. Uh, I think uh, by now, as we come towards the end of the session, we accept that obstetrics is bloody business. And I'm going to talk about a subject which uh, does send a bit of a chill down every obstetrician's spine, and that is obstetric hysterectomy. Let me at the outset uh, make it very clear that the obstetric hysterectomy for placental spectrum disorders and the obstetric hysterectomy for atonic or traumatic PPH are two completely different surgeries. Because the type of hysterectomy, the type of surgical preparation, etc., considerations that we have when we are faced with an adherent placenta, those considerations are very different. The level of planning that today is possible is also quite different. And yesterday, uh, this August audience had an opportunity to listen to Dr. Paili on this subject, and I will therefore leave it out of uh, my talk today. I think we must accept that preparation is half the battle. And unless an obstetric unit runs drills, has a good team and a able leader with the adequate systems and infrastructure and a profuse availability of blood, we are in deep waters as far as obstetric hemorrhage is concerned. So these are the absolute basics which need to be there. I'll begin with a quick clinical vignette uh, just to you know, kind of lay the clinical setting and then take it from there. 30 year old primey delivers a four kilo baby vaginally after a labor which was augmented, hemoglobin was 10, placenta comes out followed by clots. Uh, the standard first line management with medicines, medical therapy is started but the bleeding continues. There's a bit of tachycardia which has come up now. So at this point, almost every clinician is going to follow the step-by-step -step approach towards postpartum hemorrhage. That is initial assessment and treatment, including resuscitation, trying to find out what's the etiology, sending of basic lab tests, then directed therapy, either for tone, tissue, trauma, or thrombin. And then if it's getting beyond a certain point, it's not stabilizing, we call for help, do manual uh, compression measures, local control, build up the blood pressure, and then think about surgical interventions, including what have already been spoken about a little earlier in this session by Dr. Kabra and Dr. Balsarkar. So the key questions for this clinical vignette as far as obstetric hysterectomy is concerned, when should you ship this woman to the operation theater? What should you do until the time you decide to do the laparotomy? And when should you perform the laparotomy? If you can answer these three questions, then the next step becomes easy. What, what to do until you decide to do a laparotomy? Counsel, 
consent document this should be done by a senior member of the team note down the timings take a consent for laparotomy and a hysterectomy even though this may not be something pleasant that you would have to discuss with the attendants but you do have to do it call for help get all the staff on board call your friends call the other obgyns who are in the hospital if you need call a surgeon friends neighbors just call as many hands on board continue the medical management prepare the theater anesthesia trolley material push in a uh, antibiotic and an antiemetic and then get ready for the laparotomy respect the golden hour because that's your opportunity window when you can make a difference make a decision your decision may not always be perfect but you know what kills women it's the inaction it's the fact that nothing was done that's what kills women when you do a laparotomy it's your choice uh, you can make an incision transverse which is now really speaking for the average obgyn the default incision as far as pelvic surgery is concerned or you might make a vertical incision if you are comfortable with that when you open the peritoneum look for free blood because free blood indicates some kind of trauma it could either be a ruptured uterus or a hematoma which has burst open deliver the uterus out keep it compressed and look for hematomas because if there is a sub peritoneal or a broad ligament hematoma that has two implications one that's a source of collected blood which you'll have to empty out in order to get vascular control and two the other important implication of a hematoma is that the pelvic anatomy is significantly changed in the presence of uh, this event because now you just can't say where the uterine vessels are Uh, how laterally displaced the ureter is, or is it at the same place where it should have been? Where do you need to take or place your clamp? So, if you've got hematomas, you've got to empty that and then go further. What should you do at the laparotomy? Stepwise devascularization, internal iliac ligation, uterine compression sutures. All this has already been spoken about. I will not even touch upon them because they were dealt with so expertly. i am going to talk about obstetric hysterectomy now there are no fixed steps as far as the laparotomy is concerned it's dictated by the clinical state intraoperative findings my general principle is that each step you do it give 10 minutes to assess whether it's working or not if it doesn't work move to the next step and believe me the most difficult part of an obstetric hysterectomy is making a decision to do the obstetric hysterectomy so now we are at a point where there is pph you've done everything that you know every trick in the book has been exhausted and the uterus is crying out please perform hysterectomy pph so that's where we are at what are the highlights what are the most important things as i said earlier the trickiest part even for an experienced obstetrician is taking the call making the decision that okay now i've done everything i can enough time has passed it's time to go let's do a hysterectomy the other important thing which i would like to stress upon right at the outset is the technique is clamp cut drop until the uterine vessels are taken or at least clamped don't try ligating the upper pedicles preferable to do a total but there are certain circumstances where you can get away with a sub total we'll look at those so as far as doing the actual technique of the obstetric hysterectomy is concerned we begin with the upper pedicles and the entire coronal structures can be clamped all together this allows for a good traction upwards this traction is essential and one assistant is going to be responsible to continuously maintain the traction because it keeps the vessel stretched and it keeps the ureters away from your next clamp so coronal structures have to be clamped all together and lifted up you'll take the round ligament separately because typically 
you know, if it's a small gynac uterus, you're okay taking the whole cornual structures together, no problem. But in an enlarged globular vascular uterus, if you try to do that, there's going to be a lot of raw space in between the round ligament and the utero ovarian ligament. So if you make a big fat pedicle, it's going to be too bulky. The tie is going to slip. So you better do it separately. And once you've done the round ligament, just watch out for the Samson's artery, which tends to be quite enlarged. And, you know, in a routine hysterectomy, you might not really pay too much attention to it. But here you need to. Once you've done the round ligament, our most common tendency is to make a window in the broad ligament. But please don't do that for an obstetric hysterectomy because the vessels are engorged. They are full of blood. And if you hit one of those vessels with your finger, you're going to have a hematoma forming within minutes. And that's going to be one extra thing to be dealt with as you go along. So don't make that window and avoid large bulky pedicles. How do you deal with the uterine vessels? The broad ligament is easy to dissect, but be careful, don't be in a hurry. Watch for shearing, oozing and hematomas which can form. A partial skeletonize, skeletonization is enough for the uterine vessels at this point. You don't have to completely bear them. There are small vessels in the broad ligament which can open up if you go too close to the uterines in your attempt to bear them. So mobilize the bladder a little bit more than what you would to just enough put the clamp. You need to mobilize the bladder a little bit more to give you some leeway. And then the clamps which you are going with vertically start becoming a little more horizontal as you approach the uterine vessels. So just to make a diagrammatic representation, your first point is traction. You need to give upward cephalic traction to keep the vessels stretched and the ureters away. The Samson's artery is enlarged. Take the round ligament separately. Be careful of that artery. Partial skeletonization of the uterine vessels and tie the pedicles after securing the uterine vessels. Until that time, just clamp, cut, drop. How should you take the vascular ties? Well, you've got a choice of occluding or sub-occluding sutures and either you can do a free tie or you can do transfixation. Whatever may be your choice and I'll just show you what these things mean in the next slide. Uh, make sure you tie all the pedicles double because the tissue is engorged, it is edematous, your tie can get loosened up. Keep a clamp on the specimen side. Don't try to tie that. Just keep the clamp there to avoid the field from getting too bloody. Yes, the blood loss is specimen side blood, but if there's a lot of blood in the cavity, in the pelvic cavity, it just makes your life a little bit more difficult. Before you drop the pedicle, check. Make sure there's no ooze and then move on to the next one. So this is a free tie and it is completely occlusive. In the same way, you can do a transfixation by puncturing and occlude it completely. You could do a transfixing sub-occluding or you could do a double transfixing sub-occluding. Now, the difference between an occluding tie and a sub-occluding tie is that an occluding tie is more hemostatic, it's more secure, but there is a small risk of necrosis of tissue. So some authors prefer sub-occluding sutures. There is a difference of opinion again about whether you should do free ties or you should do transfixation. Transfixation is supposed to be more secure, but if you puncture a vessel in that pedicle, again, then you've got another source of oozing and spotting. So my choice usually is to do a transfixation in the first go, completely occluding, and then take a free tie, which is also completely occluding. Once you've done the uterine vessels, your next question is total or subtotal. 
So there are certain situations where a total obstetric hysterectomy is mandatory. If you are doing it in a situation where it's a low-lying placenta, placenta previa, it's a traumatic postpartum hemorrhage where the lower segment or cervical trauma is there, or if the bleeding continues even after the uterine vessels have been taken, you just have to do a total obstetric hysterectomy. There's no way out. When is a total hysterectomy preferable? Well, ideally all obstetric hysterectomies try to do a total, but when can you get away or when is a subtotal obstetric hysterectomy acceptable? When it's purely an atonic hemorrhage or if the bladder is very densely adherent near the cervix, it's an inexperienced operator, you're not operating, but say a second or a third year resident is operating, or if there is a surgical exigency, the anesthetist tells you that, look, we've got absolutely no time. This patient is crashing. I want to move her into ICU immediately. Just close at whatever earlier stage that you can. Once you've done the uterine uh, pedicles, the lower pedicles and the vault have to be taken. And here, don't underestimate the vascularity. You will notice that the field goes dry once you've taken the uterines, but these pedicles can also bleed. So mobilize, the, uh, mobilize and retract the bladder now. Now you've got time. The bulk of the bleeding has stopped. Now you've got time to see that you don't cause urological injuries. So dissect the bladder, use blunt dissection with a finger, not a gauze piece, because that can traumatize and shear off tissue. Use your finger or you do sharp dissection, depending on whether there are adhesions or not. Once you've retracted the bladder adequately, you've got to identify how low to go. So you've got to identify where is the cervix. This can be a bit tricky when the woman is, say, fully dilated or very near full dilatation and you've delivered her. Well, uh, you know, it's not so easy to find where the cervix is. We we'll look at how to do it. Take the vaginal angle separately, not as a part of the lower pedicle. No, don't do that. See that you secure it separately and close the vaginal vault with adequate bites of continuous sutures. So how do you identify the cervix? You can milk it by palpating it externally, or if the uterine cavity is open, pass a finger into the lower segment and feel inside and hook the cervix up with your finger. That's where you've got to go if you want to do the, the total hysterectomy. And as you go lower and lower, your clamps are going to be more and more horizontal rather than vertical. So that's how you place your lower pedicle clamps. Once you've done that, you've got to check vaginal bleeding before you decide that it's time to close. See that you've got adequate hemostasis. It's not always going to be pinpoint. Hemostatic adjuvants is something I'm not much in favor of because they might help with oozers, but they'll never help with bleeders. Use a surgical drain because it will help early detection of post-operative bleeding. Close the sheath and skin with care. Review the antibiotics. And then depending on what infrastructure is there, what condition the patient is in, you might decide to shift her to the ward or the HDU or the ICU as the case may be. Once everything is done, you've got to document. Do it immediately. Don't wait for the next day to do it because you'll forget half the things. Complete the charts, blood labels. What were your decision-making steps? How did you arrive at the point where you decided to do the hysterectomy? See that the consent is completed and what communication you had during the surgery. Once the mother is reasonably in a better shape, explain the events of what has happened to the mother and the attendants. And later, it's necessary to review the events with your own team to see what uh, you could have done better, faster, uh, whether your decision was timely or not, so on and so forth. So thank you once again for your attention and this opportunity. Uh, fortunately, these are events that most obstetricians face 
only rarely but it's good to keep abreast uh, with these difficult <laughs> techniques so that the knowledge is there at the back of our minds and we are able to perform the needful decision and the technique thank you very much thank you sir i now request dr uh, ashwini bhalerao gandhi ma'am to comment please uh, thank you parikshit for your uh, excellent talk and you have finished your hysterectomy in time i must congratulate <laughs> you for finishing your presentation in time and you have told us the importance of uh, drill that we should have uh, so that when the emergency uh, occurs uh, we know exactly what to do and what not to do you have also told us about the uh, importance of the golden hour uh, you rightly told us about the uh, uh, different problems one faces doing obstetric hysterectomy like in placental issues yes it is really very difficult sometimes and in pph we have seen that we can do some conservative type of uh, uh, techniques which the previous speakers have highlighted already but when all these fails i think the only option remaining is the obstetric hysterectomy uh, i would like to thank uh, dr mandakini meek uh, dr mitra dr taide for uh, inviting me for this session and i really enjoyed all the three talks very much thank you all you and i want to thank dr mandakini me dr surekha and dr mitra madam for making a part of this excellent excellent academy so much refreshing up of our knowledge and really wonderful thank you yes. thank you so much Thank wow. you, thank you, Dr. Mandakini from my side also. Uh, Dr. Mandakini as well as Mitra, Dr. Surekha, they have taken lot of efforts to make this uh, successful, and everybody is enjoying this session. And uh, so many attendees I see. Even it is late night. Also, the yeah, people yeah. are attending. More than seven hundred, eight hundred are there. So hearty <laughs> congratulations, Dr. Mandakini, Madam, and uh, Surekha, and. Uh, so much dedicated efforts they have done for making it successful so practical everything line, was perfect i want to say one yeah. line to all Thank the you. seniors here that uh, we have had excellent uh, you know the starters and the main course and all that yes. so it's a very big <laughs> desert to come and uh, because it's very late and i am feeling guilty because the hello will be shouting but still i will say that all of you seniors i will request uh, mr uh, dr amit if uh, those who would like to actually give us their parts in the panel to come we can give them panelist i mean you all are already panelists basically so yes. even from the general uh, attendees so uh, first of all for the session i am extremely extremely grateful to the wonderful speakers and the chairpersons you all have really really given every line which has been spoken on this platform today from 5 pm everything is a pearl of wisdom and i think together we have really really learned a lot so thank you all of you and i thank think thank you dr pravina can you no no i see the chair to conclude please ah, yeah, i invite dr mandakini megman to conclude this adam please this session, yeah. this session. i have to just say everybody said everything and i don't want to delay but from the icug point of view from the students point of view just now i got a beautiful you know comment i think you all have read from the pg student that madam uh, such kind of from last three days we are continuously attending and you have made us you know all the pg a oh, oh, great program which we were longing for and please keep on doing such program just you can see in the you know there are so many post graduates they are writing to us that you are and so many lectures they have not heard also so i mean that is our actually the achievement of icud that is our achievement of all the faculties that i can say reaching the unreached uh, that is already become you know so i covering, think it is simple madam word, covering the uncovered yeah so in the yeah. words our goal is achieved and still will be achieved with more and more program so thank you asha ji for getting up so early uh, in the morning and adjusting time with us that's i think for the usc people when we have meeting it is a great sacrifice on your part and i no, will I, request, I didn't get up early i, I, yeah, I will, get up at 5 i got up at 7 okay. today so i request parikshit and everybody because people are asking for their uh, presentation so we want to put the presentation on the website so already please, sent ma'am okay ha send it on our icug email and we will share it because the students want it so thank you very much dr mandakini thank you and please uh, go ahead with the next session
thank Kevin you ma'am yeah. let's yeah. move on to the final session of this lecture series it is a case based panel mm -hmm. the topic is tough situations tougher decisions destructive procedures inversion and core collapse moderators for this panel are dr mitra saxena ma'am is chairperson elect uh, practical obstetrics committee of foxy and convener of this program of course and our next moderator is dr renu yadav ma'am dr renu she is professor obhy and consultant at uh, sharbati surgical and maternity home mahindragarh haryana our first panelist is dr indrani roy madam madam is hod obgy at nazareet hospital shillong next is dr abha rani sinha madam is professor obgy at skmc muzaffarpur and icog governing council member at present dr savita rani singhal madam is our next panelist she is a senior professor and unit head of pgims rohtak dr shailesh kore sir He is a professor OBGYN in LT Medical College, Sion, Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Hafizur Rahman sir he is professor of OBGYN at Sikkim Manipal Institute of Medical Sciences at Kangto and member elect for ICOG Governing Council. And next is Dr. Alka Pandey, ma'am. She is vice president elect of Foxy. She is associated professor of OBGYN department, Patna Medical College. I welcome you all for this panel discussion. and now i hand over this session to the moderators ma'am uh is the screen visible yes ma'am okay no sorry sorry you know this we not so smart so as i said that obstetrics is very very interesting so what i found is that uh, let's have a little bit of a flip flop so my uh, moderator with me dr renu yes. are you ready for a challenge yes. can i make you a panelist so that i have more panelists then also my seniors who are there in the audience uh, we will really benefit because i have i don't want to make it a theoretical thing i want that uh, of course we know that uh, destructive operation that we are going to discuss they are obsolete they are not there so all the other seniors who have some interesting horror story to share please do uh, because you are already faculty also so welcome to all the panelists dr indrani dr abha dr savita dr shailesh dr hafizur and dr alka and dr renu i may ask you to be a moderator sometime and i may ask you to be a panelist yes, i sir. hope you are happy with that so we all know that uh, destructive operations along with their instruments they are not having any place of much importance and uh, some of the senior faculties also confessed to me that dr mitra what topic are you keeping we have stopped asking our post graduates i was so happy when dr jaydeep tank took up the challenge and yesterday he delivered a very fantastic talk so all the pgs who've learned his uh, heard his talk would uh, really benefit so i would be omitting a few uh, topics from there and uh, what we have to why i included is that we as seniors did see it and did get opportunity once in a while to tackle such patients but our country is very big the population which we cater to are very inhomogeneous those of us who are practicing in the remote areas they may still come up with obstructed labors neglected labors and where they could safely save a cesarean section so the disclaimer is that these um, topics are not so much favorite with everybody but yet we will go ahead with the um, panel discussion we'll be discussing these cases and uh, they have a very limited role we all know that because we all consider cesarean section is a very very safe alternative and we nobody wants to get into the litigation part of a destructive operation and most importantly that the present generation has not even witnessed these operations i would have loved if i had found some videos but alas don't find also we have to recognize that sometimes if we can save a cesarean section we may save some complications because indiscriminate use of cesarean also has its rising problems 
there are very few studies that i could uh, get my hands on but there are there are uh, uh, consultants who have documented destructive operations successfully with no maternal deaths and achieving what they started for so these are a few uh, studies that i have just put them together and from pgi chandigarh very big study of two to three cases so the bottom line is that some day some time it may be important that this discussion may help someone um what is very important to understand is that we cannot do it always especially when there is grossly contracted pelvis or the cervix is not fully dilated and all these whenever there is a uh, obstructed lower segment and we are fearing a rupture uterus these are the images of those long forgotten instruments however i would say that an embryotomy scissors in our labor room the simpson's perforator was actually very blunt but i saw my uh, consultant i pay my regards to dr sunita tiwari who would very deftly she was trained in kanpur so she was very deft at using embryotomy scissors for any destructive operation she always told us that if you have just one long heavy scissors i think you can always go ahead so these are just for historical reasons let's go on to the cases so this was a patient who was brought as an emergency in the labor room primary with convulsions but and the fetal heart sound was absent so dr abha i put it to you if you are in a stand alone setup and you are you know from that era where you can actually deliver the patient vaginally and in case the baby is stuck uh, would you consider that you would avoid a cesarean section at any cost because oh, i right. see that the younger generation uh, opts for a cesarean even in iud's i would uh, invite you dr abha yes uh, dr mitra i think uh, a cesarean section should be avoided in a case of iud and one should do all efforts to avoid it because what happens whenever the patient party they come to us they have one point bachcha mar gaya hai ab sharir mein zahar phail jayega i think counseling is a big point in these patients we have to counsel the attendants that a vaginal delivery is safer for the patient safer for a future obstetric career and we should take all attempts to deliver these patients vaginally since this patient she has come with 8 cm as we have mentioned head is 25 palpable and uh, what about the membranes are the membranes intact no ma'am they are ruptured she they is are ruptured a... okay so membrane are ruptured so we have to see whether if it is 25 palpable uh i think the caput or the if, it, if there is a caput i think it will be showing right up to the vulva sometimes it happens so so we have to see the patient and if the baby is dead we have to give her some time we should not just fix that second stage of labor should be two hours if the patient is having good contraction she is progressing we should allow her to progress and as it is a borderline pelvis she might deliver on her own with some efforts but if 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 we find that she is not able to deliver because she may be exhausted, we may go in for craniotomy. But in that case, we need a proper counselling. Counselling of the relatives is very important. Documentation is very important. And I think the first the general can and before under doing a, a craniotomy or any destructive procedure, as you have rightly said, there are contraindications, and we have to rule out. rupture uterus i think that is one point many cases of obstructed labor when they are opened up we find rupture uterus late cases of obstructed labor neglected cases of obstructed labor so what we have to do we have to rule out obstructed labor before doing a destructive operation and as it comes to my experience of doing it well in my housemanship i have seen my consultants doing it and when i was a resident in my first duty my hod dr shantiram madam who was the chairperson of aicog which we did in patna she i was her resident she came and she told me abha this baby is dead it is an obstructed labor you go for the craniotomy and that was my first hand craniotomy that i did uh, uh the simpson's perforator was not there because it was the evening shift the morning sister had put it in the store and it was not available i got the embryotomy scissors and with that i did a craniotomy uh, and what happened while pulling it with the volcellum one of the spicules it got stuck in the lateral vaginal wall and the patient had profuse bleeding 
she had profuse bleeding so i think these are the points which we should remember that at the time of introducing the instrument we should protect the anterior vaginal wall and the bladder and we should be careful in incising and again at the time of extraction also we should be very careful like if we are not careful as i had uh, not done it properly and i made an injury in the lateral pelvic wall and that was bleeding like anything the patient had to be transfused two units of blood so we have to be careful while we know but unfortunately these procedures are not being done these days our younger residents and uh, they are not conversant with these procedures i can say that now it is one of the dying art okay and the after care is also very important dr mitra yeah. because you should always examine the utero vaginal canal properly you should inspect and always explore the uterus because in one case there was a craniotomy one of my seniors were doing when i was doing my post graduation and as soon as she put her hand, hand inside she found it was a ruptured uterus immediately laparotomy had to be done so always exclude rupture after the procedure because in these cases of neglected obstructed labor there may be impending rupture and with the instrumentation then may these patients may have a rupture and second putting in a catheter a catheter should be put in at least for 5 days we should watch for hematuria and antibiotics since these cases are cases so, of actually uh, basically basically dr abba what i was looking for is that uh, we should at the start of a destructive operation we should always be quite sure that the uterus is intact and after the procedure taking full care we have to rule out a definitely a definitely if, I, I, if we are suspecting that the uterus is not intact then we should not go ahead so dr hafiz can you just uh, enumerate the steps of craniotomy uh, how would you do it dr hafiz Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Actually, I just want to tell the audience. I just want to tell one small thing that when I was speaking to Dr. Hafiz, I was thinking he is a young person, so I don't know whether he will like me to introduce him to the panel. So I thought that uh, I want to have the younger lot also. And then I was very surprised to know that Dr. Hafiz Zura has done a lot of destructive operations. So I think you are the right person to just for the benefit of those who are listening. just go step by step how to do the craniotomy yes ma'am uh, thank you as you told uh, that is uh, this destructive operations are actually i would like to say that is uh, as they, it is also important how we are trained actually as this these days postgraduate students actually i will have to also agree there is not too many the postgraduate students are not able to see what my uh, what my the things they actually what Now, how many cases I did? It is more than whatever I assisted in a, in a medical college like Guwahati Medical College, and I must agree that the training forms the foundation. Where we have so many referred uh, cases from periphery in a medical college, and you have fortunate to be trained by someone and some of the uh, the, the great officers and those who are that is they are very much they consider it that is for the beneficial of those women. but i must agree that is these days there is as very much uh, uh, reduced it is as well as the interest of the post graduate as well as the uh, the others uh, and other thing is that the patients you know as uh, avarani madam told there is the many times that you need to the consent and counseling once you ask the patients that is your baby will be like this you will have perforated head so many of the even the patients relative also uh, they don't agree for this so you really need a at actually a great session with them and counseling that that will one need to do the every effort to deliver it baby and to try the best and to have a safe end. now coming back to the craniotomy step section what you are uh, madam it is very important that it is the examination because uh, doing a right decision at right time is the most important the other doing the harm so it is not only the heroic step because these are the unpleasant things no of tradition actually would like to do but it is sometime done for the beneficial of the patient considering the future of the patient so great judgment is important examination is important patient that whether one will go with or not go but once the assessment is done one is uh, relatively sure that is i can deliver designedly it's very important to evacuate the bladder and reassess the 
the absolute contradiction is told that is too much uh, CPD should not be there. So if the hot head is most of the time in this situation or it is already is in the fix, but still you can, uh, sometimes you can ask to fix the head with the one hand and with the putting the two speculum that is an entry and post service, you can uh, find out the area where you want to perforate actually. The sites of perforation is very important. Now, as I told now, I had the this perforator, actually Simpson's perforator, when I was uh, trained in, in, in the, uh, my undergraduate and the postgraduate days, it was more of a like the perforator is used. But rather, when you are my uh, inexperience uh, in the, the clinical experience in this, my current medical college, it is most of the time the scissor have been used to give the incision. And on the, suppose like in a, it is in a, Vertex presentation, or the, uh, the perforation is in a parietal with the cruciate incision and rotate the scissor so that you can get the contents. And once you get the contents with the finger or with them, sometimes you can just evacuate the, con the contents. Now, in my most of the time, it's experience is that the valsalum is one uh, option, other is the cockers, they force it. That is, you can hold it two cockers once the contents are out significantly so that you can gradual traction, whatever is done is there. So it's very, it's very important to you give the traction in this way. And once the contents are reduced, so head is delivered, so it is not so difficult. But again, it is essential that the injury and all this is more of a like when you are going to uh, the perforate. So it is always important. So we have a go very carefully while the perforation, because that is the most important step. Once somebody is perforate and done the enough perforation, it is very easy to take out the contents. So uh, the, that is that is the more important step than after that is there. Now the so yes, perforation to... side, as it is in the vertex, it's right. Yes, ma'am. What, what I want to ask the any one of the panelists can take this question, which has just come in my mind, that when you are extracting a diff, uh, uh, head which has already collapsed, what is the part that you that causes the most trouble? Is it the cranium vault or is it the base of skull? It's the base of the skull is more important because the cranium is actually, once you take out the contents, so it's more of a like com uh, compressed, very, which the base true. of this the is, skull is. This is exactly a very fine point of craniotomy that I wanted the people who are attending to realize that even after you have decompressed the head, so the craniums, uh, because all the cerebral contents are out, yet it is the base of the skull which may still get stuck. And uh, just, uh, I want to add on one thing, Dr. Mitra. Yes, yes, do, Dr. Uh, first of all, a very good evening to all. Myself is Savita Singhal. Yes, yes. And uh, in the beginning, you showed two slides. Actually, this was my, this, uh, yes, exactly. that we published 51 cases I published in 2005 from PJ Can I go back to the slide again, friends? So, this was in archives. Uh, this is a publication. Yeah. It has been uh, cited by so many papers yeah. after that. Actually, um, because it was a ring oh, single at all. Yeah, this single at all. This is a my publication in archives, which he published in 2005. 51 total cases. And after this, one latest publication is 2018 from Nigeria. So they have published 72 cases of this. And again, craniotomy, this, uh, craniotomy is the largest chunk of the destructive surgeries. So I think uh, craniotomy still has some role in modern obstetrics because it leaves destructive surgery out of the all the destructive operations. And the one of the most prerequisite for doing the craniotomy or any destructive surgery, the at least the diameter, shortest diameter of the pelvis should be more than eight. If it is less than eight, we should never, never venture for any destructive operation. Reason being the diameter of the bimestoid is 7.5 to 8. So that should be able to come out through that pelvis. If severely contacted pelvis, never, never venture for any type of the destructive surgery. So this is the prerequisite for doing that which, but you are talking that which is more important base of the skull is more important to come out and uh, like dr hafiz has just said that we catch all of the cranium with the what is my technical experience which we did so sometimes we use two and three not only one instrument not only one wall cylinder. this cocker is a very very good option i usually use used to use three cockers so the better grip is there once have three edges three cockers and they pull the head so it was it used to come in a greater force and in a better way. So this is a practical experience. I still remember Dr. Sunita Tiwari. She was a pioneer in the destructive surgeries. We learned from her. Yes, and yes. 
one message i to give uh, to the all newcomers so that uh, so they should never venture these destructive they had to be very trained or at least witnessed few destructive surgeries at least they should have this witness otherwise sometimes complications can be there more than except this craniotomy uh, this can be done by the junior lot as well that was very good in and uh, so um, another thing is that uh, this is a place where when you are handing over the baby as dr aba had pointed out or uh, that uh, the uh, baby when a baby is handed over to the parent the perforation has to be covered so that the respect is given to the um, uh, dead baby also so dr renu or dr shailesh one of you please uh, enumerate where other places you could uh, you know do craniotomy apart from uh, just uh, normal cephalic dead baby other cases where uh, craniotomy can help us save uh, cesarean section dr shailesh is so, there cr craniotomy per se uh, uh, the in hydrocephalus it is generally not called as a craniotomy because you drain the hydrocephalus baby but sometimes some malform baby again you have to uh, see that the the diameter of the pelvis should not be less than 8 cm otherwise it will not come and very rarely though i have not uh, uh, though i have done in uh, cephalic presentation few craniotomies but after coming uh, head of breech sometimes it is mentioned that i don't know maybe dr singhal must have done but uh, uh, we can uh, deliver the baby after doing a craniotomy And some I have never will... done for after coming head. I have never done for after yeah, coming head. It is mentioned in the books uh, that it is one of the indication. Lock twins also is one. Uh, yeah. I think uh, lock twins also Pitra, is. Pitra, I want to share my experience. Yes, please, madam, uh, Dr. Mandak. Well, there is a very interesting thing going on, yes. and uh, yesterday also I mentioned, uh, and Shailesh, I also want to mention that there was a case of. Uh, you know breach um, presentation which other unit was doing in kama hospital it was in teaching hospital and i was called at uh, in the middle of the night uh, that uh, baby is you know in a hanging position since last 5 to 6 hours and uh, there must be cpd or the, you know they uh, who couldn't uh, deliver the head of the baby and the head of the unit was not contactable so then they they contacted me and when i went it was all edematous yesterday i described it so edematous that it was to retract also was a and i had to use my surgical knowledge skill and whatever equipment i'm using in the ot you know it was something different so i thought what should i do and it is difficult and somebody said you do the cesarean section after 6 hours of hanging it was you know just unfair so what what we did is that i asked two of the resident to hold the you know the edematous portion and don't allow it to come in between and i asked my staff nurse to give the second puncture wala trocar small trocar then you know it is a totally new procedure because i also thought ki maybe it will work it will not work then i went into the nape of the neck then with the hammer a small hammer we saw and the trocar i put it in the because it was not hydrocephalic it was a normal head so uh, there was no question of putting a needle so we put a trocar which was a very small size a trocar went there and then after that i asked for the mtp uh, suction cannula which was six number and every time the flap of the uh, this thing was going inside and while coming out it was you know the hole was getting lost so i had to actually put my small finger and two three times i, I was able to negotiate between the uh, you know in that small hole which i have created and here i kept a big bowl of the water and every time three times i could do i could uh, take out so much uh, brain matter and the moment third time it went the baby came out so you know it was you know such a great relief and domal deshmukh madam was the hod of the jj hospital and after that we presented this paper and everybody was so and, and this procedure was not known and nobody tried also it was just by you know i had to try because i had to save that cesarean section in the mother and it was uneventful patient went down very well but i must share with the people this in case you find such a situation so go ahead do a small craniotomy 
with a, whatever instrument uh, you have uh, take care of the soft tissue of the uh, mother because they are all adjacent and in that case and then uh, use the mtp uh, suction cannula for taking out the brain because it's not hydrocephalic so fluid is not going to come and within 2 3 minutes uh, you know the baby will uh, the head will come out and this is my own experience i think Uh, we have uh, given it to the JJ Hospital for publication also, but it was not published that time. But I will like to publish it. So, so thank you very much for allowing me to share my experience. No, no, definitely, okay. madam. This session actually, I uh, thought that it will be much better because yeah. uh, the evidence is not so much as much as experience, and also you know there are little little points like if we can compile everything that dr aba dr afiz dr savita and you have summarized about uh, craniotomy no, because people are doing it so, now but this is a rare case i have not done yeah. many because this was a yeah. case where i had to do so we have even invented this case so please go yeah. ahead improvise your... improvise yeah. away so the point is the basically final... these are uh, destructive or mainly with the neglected labor actually so in modern us we not seeing these type of patient that uh, breech is hanging for 6 hours or the patient is in destructive almost obstructed labor we are getting not uh, such type of case in present scenario that's why these incidence has decreased uh, because patient coming quite early so one patient that one is there early iud will be there we don't allow the early iud to go for the stage that we should try just thinking prior that will do the destructive in this patient this is not the condition that's why not going for this yeah and second Same important thing i think uh, uh, the uh, apart from uh, the training the other thing uh, the paper uh, people fear is about the medical legal implication exactly so probably that is because of yeah. that the uh, the chances of doing or incidence of doing this destructive operation is uh, less now so basically the final message for the audience would be that craniotomy is not something which is unthinkable mm -hmm. and after assuring that the mother the uterus and the medical legalities and your own competence is assured and very carefully the procedure is not difficult but what is very important as rightly brought out by all the panelists that it's not just doing the procedure but it's also getting out the baby so very yeah. importantly things have come so let's come to another Some, case ma'am just uh, yeah. i would like please to add my that. my view here Yes, uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, like my views i just wanted to share because uh, i am from this part of the country where uh, in this state uh, the concept is totally different you know uh, my experience with destructive operations craniotomy i have seen only during my post graduate days and after i have come to practice here in this place shillong this is a place where it's all uh, mostly uh, 99 percent people are all christian people catholic people and uh, for them like you know destructive operation is something which is not you know once the baby is born uh, be it whatever they will want the whole burial to take place in a proper manner you know so the destructive operation is like out of question so when i first came here after my post graduation I was really surprised, you know. Even with hydrocephalus baby, uh, I had learned to do craniotomy then, and putting a needle to drain the fluid. And suddenly, I come in this place, and this is not acceptable. You cannot, like, you know, the baby. The they they want the baby intact, and they respect the burial so much. So, like, it was such such a difficult thing to digest. You know, IUD baby uh, had to, if they are not delivering vaginally, had to be put up for sections. So I thought, like you know, just to share this thing, like in yeah. this part of the world, in this part of in this India, this is also very important. That yeah, the, the, from the time the baby is born, the like even for um, if the mother there's a maternal mortality, you know, you have to do a post mortem section, take out the baby, and hand over the baby. baby to the mom, mother so the uh, to the attendants like you know that they, they want a proper burial of the baby okay so one thing before i start the second case um just for interest if we had a hydrocephalic uh, breach and uh, we want to save the cesarean section what would be the choice would you like to do a per abdomen needling dr savita or would you counsel and later uh, do a needling from below What is it again? Your... Yeah, it again depends how much big is the hydrocephalus. Yeah, let's see. I mean, like it's a big one. A... If it is very big one, sometimes it is. We I have seen cases and done in the kefal sentences in these cases. A very big head was there. Me just middle of the abdomen. 
Prasad Chai. So in those cases, even if a patient goes into late labor, head will not descend at all. So we have to go, it will not be accessible for the vagina. I have done by the per abdominal route. If borderline hydrocephalus is there, then we can go by the per vagina. Especially I have done, I have seen two cases which were having spina bifida associated, open type. Then we introduced a catheter through that and did the drainage through the spina bifida also. So very big, it is not able to descend in the pelvis. We have to go by the per abdomen, borderline, not too big. We can go by the vaginal route. That is a not kefal, this uh, this is a kefal synthesis. We will label it as not the craniotomy actually. Okay. In, uh, so, in, in present scenario, we are not getting such type of big hydrocephalus. No. We are not getting. So patient come quite early and if it is 11, 12, we go for the cesarean because even after delivery, they score for the baby. And uh, as Dr. Indrani has uh, pointed out very rightly, in that time also, when we, in my uh, these uh, younger years, we were doing these, uh, de these decapitations. We were suturing the baby first. Switching the neck with the, that, and then we're handing over, and we take proper consent that baby will be mutilated. If they agree that mutilated baby is uh, agreeable to them, only then this uh, should be done. Yeah. Because okay. sometimes they want to name the baby even after death, and they want to take the photographs, like yeah. Dr. Dani has pointed out. Okay, so let's go on to another interesting self confession, second case. Uh, this is from, of course, my own residency time. Uh, we had a primary who had come with hand to love, dead baby in obstructed labor. And we were all very keen because those were the days that uh, we were very enthusiastic because our seniors would do destructive operations and we would uh, see the decapitation knife and embryotomy scissors. So we used to be cured, uh, quizzed about all those. So we were all very enthusiastic and this was an impacted shoulder. It was not an appropriate case at all. So uh, uh, Dr. Renu, uh, you haven't answered anything and I've made you a panelist. Will you tell me why an impacted shoulder is not an appropriate case for a uh, of, uh, destructive operation? Actually, uh, the impacted shoulder uh, would uh, naturally, um, uh, you cannot uh, assess, uh, assess anything. And secondly, she has been into prolonged labor. So lower segment and all would have been uh, like very much distended and uh, uh, liable for rupture. So I think so that may be the most difficult part, accessibility. And, uh, very from, true, very right. That, that is, is the most important thing. So our enthusiasm of thinking and seeing a decapitation was actually quite wrongly placed because we were young. And what happened was that we did... Um, be doing destructive operations we had taken all the consents etc but actually as dr Enu has rightly said we were quite a big failure and let me tell you let me confess that uh, after a long wait from spinal to ga and from the registrar to the lecturer to the consultant and finally when our hod was called up and she gave a big telling and she said what you girls are doing why don't you section her and just get it out now can somebody tell me what was our trouble any panelist? What Actually, for doing the decapitation, the neck should be always, yes, always accessible. Dr. Savita, Dr. Savita, please listen to the question. So, finally, after Dr. Usha Varma had given a yelling on the phone and said, Tum drama band karo or iska cesarean karo. So, our consultants and everybody decided to do a cesarean for a hand prolapse, neglected shoulder. So, I want the uh, esteemed panelists to tell the audience, what is the trouble we must have faced taking out this baby? So Dr. Hafiz wants to take it. Please take it. Or uh, Dr. Abba, Dr. I think, sorry, Dr. Yeah, Alka. Uh, the first answer. thing is actually... One second, Dr. Hafiz. Is Dr. Alka there, madam? Dr. Alka, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Fine, fine. Right. Madam, aap bataiye fir ki humko is uh, neglected hand prolapse mein cesarean section mein kya taklif aai hogi? Cesarean section में एकदम impacted रहता है इसलिए निकालने में दिक्कत आई होगी इसलिए हम लोग को पहले तो उसका hand wound paint करके उसको अच्छे से अंदर करके और उसके बाद उसका पैर खोजना होगा और पैर खोजकर उसको खींचना होगा Okay so madam let me tell you that we were not able to do anything of this uh, the uterus was so tight on the baby actually there was a retraction ring no place to introduced the hand. It was a big baby. Finally, 
on table we had to do now dr savita will tell <laughs> you you have done a decapitation after doing cesarean section no no not decapitation madam <laughs> Doctor Renu, Doctor Savita, anybody, any guesses? Doctor Mitra, I think so. Best would I think so? You may have ruptured the abdomen and eviscerated the baby. Yes, yes, like, exactly. You know? And did you yeah, cut the bandage ring also? Hindi, sorry. Cut the bandage ring also to extract. Yes, there was actually the point was <laughs> this. Then finally, our senior who was doing it, he said, "We can't save the baby. Let's try and save the uterus because." madam if we would have tried to take out the baby intact we are sure the uterus would have been torn very badly so that was the decision on table we went out tried explained to them the relatives that we are going to do eviscation we are going to take out baby piecemeal otherwise the uterus is going to be torn so this is one uh, message i wanted to say confess that often we made some wrong decisions because of our inexperience but this can be any time that evisceration may have to be considered and have to be kept at the back of mind that you cannot afford to uh, injure the uterus on table so that's exactly what we did ji so, haan ji haan haan ji bolye ma'am for cesarean section also you could have done evisceration before uh, embarking madam wo hand prolapse aise hi tha as the picture hand was down the shoulder had risen up whenever it is impacted shoulder the neck goes up and there was no liker and the uterus was distended with a bandel's ring and i am telling you it was very difficult for us to even do the evisceration but we were lucky and the uterine incision didn't extend so what i am telling is that sometimes destructive operations have to be kept as a thing in the mind that they may come to rescue uh, our uterine incision the baby is already dead we know it and now to try and get out the baby of course at that time let me confess we didn't know patwardhan or anything but now maybe uh, like uh, if we can try uh, but i want to bring this case only for this that finally uh, okay so we've already done so um, who would like to mention how evisceration is done how do you do evisceration dr renu please would you actually i have never done it so i think so i am not the right person to answer but okay, whoever whoever wants to take it dr ava dr savita uh, i also don't have any personal experience of evisceration but usually the embryotomy scissors that is used for doing it and the part that is accessible the part of the abdomen that is accessible a cut is made in that and then the contents of the abdomen they come out the bulk of the abdomen it gets less and then it's easy for the fetus yeah. to come out so basically if the abdomen anterior abdominal wall is there it is easier because if it is the back is posterior then we may have to do spondylotomy and that is cutting the spine which is very difficult not easy so actually what clear cut i wanted to tell the audience is that we have to anticipate it's not so simple as think ki humne distract करना और कर ले जाएंगे यू हैव टू नो दैट एवरी स्टेप इज वेरी केयरफुली टू बी डन सो ओके सो बेसिकली द स्टेप इज जस्ट दिस दैट यू हैव टू नो व्हिच एवर पार्ट इज एक्सेसिबल द कांसेप्ट इज द सेम एंड दिस एम्ब्रियोटमी सिजर्स बून व्हाइल वी आर यूजिंग द सिजर्स वी हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट द सॉफ्ट पार्ट्स ऑफ द मदर आर नॉट इंजर्ड that is the basic thing and one assistant has to steady it and the other person after making a good rend has to evacuate the contents and once it becomes smaller and then it is easier to remove and of course once the baby is all out we have to reconstruct so that we can make it presentable to give it to the baby so dr indrani you already said that you wouldn't uh, haven't seen no, uh, i have seen i have seen during my post graduate days it is one okay, of the so decapitation one of the most difficult like to share have you yeah. ever seen decapitation yeah, i yeah. haven't I, seen i have seen i have seen during my post graduate i have seen my seniors perform i have done four or five decapitation i have done difficult, already difficult difficult procedure you know uh, it should be judged uh, like whether the baby should be a medium size the average size if the baby is too big then the neck has to be accessible to do a deep decapitation so if it is not accessible then it will be always advisable then to go for cs actually okay so i want to share one interesting thing in decapitation is that uh, the main thing is while 
deciding for decapitation is ma'am there is whenever we assess the patient and especially giving uh, prior to deciding that is we are going to do decapitation so it is the giving the traction if the hand is outside so how much we can move so that is one given give you the hints whether you can go able or not as it is stated if it is a jump pack and you are not able to move it it is not an appropriate decision to go with the decapitation so decapitation is actually whenever you can see they can move the hand a little bit of accessible so that should part should be done whether you can because first the assessment is more important that whether you will be able to pass the scissor or your finger that is the two finger thumbs and hand and you can put the scissor at least so that's it's more important but it is the person who will be doing the decapitation so the assess first by pulling the hand whether the appropriate space is there or not so dr savita please share your uh, so i just want the so yes ma'am so decapitation once done it is it may not be so difficult if a hand is prolapsed and we have to give traction i might have done five six decapitations but more difficult part is to deliver the head after decapitation for the yes. the head the body comes and in one case you don't have a doctor gulati ever hod she has to go for a cesarean section again for removing the head head was she not able to remove head by any method it gets lost and uh, there is nothing to get hold of it Usually we hold by this uh, valsalam or the sponge holder force and try to remove the head after decapitation. But in one case, we had to do cesarean just for delivery of the head only after the decapitation. I want to share this thing. Yes, Doctor Savita, I was going to mention that case which you have. So you were also there, I think, at that time. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is unthinkable, but we have seen this. So uh, the thing is, if you ever. want to do a decapitation be very careful about the head which can get lost so okay uh, so as dr hafiz had already mentioned that whenever we are successful in doing it we have to stitch up the neck and then only give to the parents so okay dr aba ma'am uh, okay i think we've already talked about yeah. gross hydrocephalus so how will you counsel the patient relatives and discuss the route of delivery and manage labor so just slowly slowly just tell all the post graduates the important thing in counseling the patients and relatives about the uh, baby which is hydrocephalus okay uh, once a um, uh, patient comes with a gross hydrocephalus i think we know that most of the brain tissue that is damaged so in that case we have to explain and if she is coming late usually these days these cases are coming quite early in the um, uh, second trimester we are able to diagnose it and even at uh, 13 weeks usg we are able to diagnose it but if this patient is coming at 34 weeks we have to counsel her that the chances of this baby having a normal neurological function might be that the baby may be delivered alive but it is there are chances that she may have neurological abnormalities and after taking their consent but in this case we cannot terminate the pregnancy or we can so what we have to do we can say that we can reduce the bulk of the head and then send the patient to the uh, send the send the baby to the pediatric surgeon so uh, for shunt procedure or um, uh, whatever so we have to make this counseling part very important we have to be empathetic in our counseling we have to explain them about the disease we have to explain them about the procedure and then we go for it okay so um thank you so much so um, the bottom line is assessment and uh, counseling and documentation so another thing is that i'm not going to stress too much on cleidotomy and symphysiotomy but yeah as uh, yesterday dr um, jaydeep tank and today madam asha also had mentioned i would ask my panelists frankly i have never had an opportunity to get a first hand uh, vision of this uh, procedure anybody from this panel or act... to interrupt ma'am yeah. yes. one hour is over ma'am okay we will quickly anybody has seen they can mention their um, experience otherwise we'll move i have the experience of you not me not the simplicity of me thank you Yeah, we uh, we have come across a shoulder dystocia while pulling. It was an inadvertent cladotomy. It was not a intentional death, yes, but the clavicle got uh, fractured. fractured and the ba baby delivered. And then uh, baby had a big hematoma on the neck. And uh, but fortunately, uh, a, a minor neurological problem, but baby uh, could went home. Okay, so uh, 
Okay, so anybody else, Dr. Savita, you were telling that yeah. you... Yeah, I did not for the live baby. I did for dead baby only. Me. I did not me. Not able to deliver. Then the baby is already dead after this uh, me itself. It was so big that we had to go for the me. Okay. And Dr. And I now explain with the same Never after did. Doing... Yes, ma'am. So no, it is no, after actually actually in the dead baby because I have been in two, three instances, especially once in a postgraduate after I do deliver five kg baby delivered, the head is delivered and the shoulder is very badly stuck. So I had the experience of delivered fracture of this, uh, the clavier, the clavicle. And I must say it's, it's very difficult to fracture. It needs lots of effort and lots of to do with your two finger to break the clavicle. In a five kg baby that is uh, we just after breaking one clavicle, that is, you can deliver the one one hand and shoulder, so it was not difficult for the other to deliver. So in a five kg, that is a IUD baby, intra and death baby, that delivered fracture, that is with the intention of doing the clavicle. But yes, it needs lots of uh, effort and as well as energy to break a mature baby, fracture the clavicle when you want to do intentionally. Okay. So Dr. Abba, were you going to say uh, something about uh, some... I don't have a personal experience of doing it, but I have seen one of my senior teachers doing it. Okay, uh, I so was a male gynecologist and I, as Dr. Hafizud has, has said, it took a lot of effort to do it. I think it is very difficult to fracture the, to cut the uh, clavicle. I think uh, he had to do a lot, to take a lot of efforts in doing it. Lot of okay, so and I like one of the panelists to quickly uh, just enumerate all the things that we have to think when we are doing a destructive operation. So what all we should do, the checklist. It's just a revision we say. Um, Actually, the checklist there should be preferably the cervix should be fully dilated, and there should be no severely contracted pelvis. It should be a moderate pelvic contraction, mild pelvic contraction. Always, always catheterize the bladder before this and rule out the rupture uterus. Yes. Before proceeding with this, and then after doing the procedure, always, always explore the uterus. Put the self cleaning catheter for at least uh, one week, and. Uh, that's all, and give the antibiotics also because it's intrauterine. So give antibiotics. So to the we patient. have to take care that the no. uterus. If the that's idea is defeated of doing a destructive operation if the uterus or the bladder or the rectum has been injured. So that is the important thing we have to remember. In now, penetration also, madam has to be taken care of. Pardon, madam, please. In rupture, we rata hai. Ekdam bahut patla lower segment. Ah, definitely, <laughs> very important point, Dr. Alka. Thank you, because even if it is papery thing, we have to be very careful. I have Thank a you. point. I have a point to make. Uh, I think so. it is very important that we know all these operations because most of us are doing them in the second trimester, because uh, most uh, we are using all these methods uh, for delivering that baby when we are doing a second trimester MTPs or even abnormal children. So I think so everybody should be at least knowing the whole procedure because the, after we are using all these techniques they, at that very moment. So that is a very, very relevant point for the youngsters that, okay, uh, don't do it in the term babies if you haven't seen, but it's very good to know these procedures because whenever you are stuck with a 24, 20 weaker abnormal baby or a dead baby and it's a malpresentation, all these procedures can be safely done. Dr. Renu, that was a very, very good addition, value addition to that. So Dr. Savita Singhal, you're going to be managing this patient who has been brought by a dai with, I mean, you know, she's in shock with soft boggy mass. So why, uh, why this um, inversion? That is clearly soft boggy mass outside the uterus. Means outside the vagina, I think it is. Yeah, I'm, so sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we need to wind up. Yeah, just give me 10 minutes more, please. Yesterday we went up to 11, but we'll go only till 10 minutes more. So um, most likely she went into immediately shock and some boggy mass is coming out. It can be this uh, inversion uterus. Most probable I mean, some boggy mass is coming out. Or yeah. sometimes it can be just uh, some polyp is there. Or incomplete uh, separation of placenta is there. Only half placenta was separated and half is again coming out due to PPH. She went into this uh, shock. So this is the possibility in this patient. 
then on examination we can just find out whether it is an inversion uterus or it is a polyp or it is a placental part dr savita one second i just want the audience to know that inversion we call it obstetric paradox patient is in shock but there is one thing very important from hypovolemic shock and that is the pulse here the pulse may not be there may be no tachycardia bp is very low but there is bradycardia so uh, that is because of the neurogenic shock yeah neurogenic shock so i think which is usually in case of a uh, inversion uterus yeah inversion uterus and um, i will like to hear some horror stories of our esteemed panelists also i will skip these uh, classifications causes etc and uh, the most important thing is that uh, there will be patient will be in shock because of pain neurogenic shock so uh, clinical features i mean what are the signs and symptoms whoever would like to take this question please do that for the audience dr renu yeah actually when i had uh, two patients of uh, acute inversion Uh, so they were uh, very suddenly rushed from the civil hospital and i was very thankful to the doctor over there who diagnosed it very efficiently early patient was uh, severely hypotensive and uh, quite anemic also and uh, definitely the bradycardia was there and uh, immediately we took her up into the ot and arranged immediately the things were going simultaneously the iv fluids were started and the uh, investigations for blood anesthetist was informed and the team was all ready and me i was all gowned and put in my hand inside and trying to push in gradually before even the anesthetist could do something we uh, removed the uterotonic which was going on and the main point was that when the uterus relaxed the relaxation point was the point when it suddenly gushed inside and the whole hand had to be just put inside and the pushing was from the cervical side and then uh, the anesthetist gave a relaxant i think so and then suddenly i just full uh, felt that the whole fundus which i was holding on gradually as the uh, that ring cervical ring relaxed it went inside and as it went inside i immediately got it from the abdominal side and caught hold on to it and put my hand inside and uh, asked everybody to give all the uterotonics immediately and then blood was arranged and uh, that was the way we did it in first two patients so and what uh, is what is very important is that the dramatic um, presentation and yes. even faster recovery recovery right. yes so dr hafiz dr. actually this has to be reposited as early as possible if delayed that it takes little time and it is mixed type of uh, the shock is there. it is not always neurogenic only but mainly it is hypovolemic is there but neurogenic part is also added on to this so a mixed type of uh, shock is there and immediately you reposit sometimes as dr renu has said patient comes immediately after delivery if it is in front of yourself itself then you can reposit it immediately main thing is that reposit immediately put your hand inside the uterus keep it there start the oxytocin drip give the oxytocin Once the uterus is completely contracted, only then remove your hand. Otherwise, it may come back again with your hand. So uterus should be made to contract. I would say one thing, Doctor Savita. Sorry, I may be a little bit off the mark, but I would say that acute inversion, the first half is neurogenic shock. The pain because of the inversion and the pull on the infundibular pelvic ligaments that causes immense pain. So patient is in neurogenic shock. and of course if the placenta starts separating or as our yeah. patient is the enemy then the hemorrhagic element comes in and so also the other uh, blood loss and all occurs so anybody else would like to share their case i remember the first one i did my mother had guided me and she had just given morphine injection and with morphine sedation only we had reposited so i would like to share the experience of my panelist who else has done immediate reposition they would like to recall their first case uh, dr hafiz i can yes, see you what is uh, important is that is like in a medical college or a lots of patient are is there 
where in a busy setup, actually immediately you are seeing the patient is that it's not difficult to do manage this patient because you are nearby there and immediately reposition as Dr. Savita told, you just skip it in, give oxytocin, resuscitate the patient. But sometimes such acute in person, I would like to say two patients I had managed like this, one patient who delivered in the, uh, in the night and then the next night came to us from a very peripheral health center. Her placenta was removed, patient was totally in shock, the it was in the outside. What is more problem? This is also within 24 hours come patient, it will take as an acute inversion. Very good, most very of the time, good. most of the time you see the patient is in shock, as you told, bradycardia and hypotension is there. This type of patient actually uh, is really difficult to manage because by the time so much hours the uterus is outside, it's very, very, really difficult. So you cannot day in the on-site labor room, you need general anesthesia and you need a weight re resuscitation of the patient. And as I say, the, uh, the hydrostatic the method, you can just try, it will take time. But these days, the earlier we used to try with these, the, uh, the normal saline, the, with the, uh, the drip, but actually the, sometime we use for a hysteroscopy doing the manual comfort VP for inflating the, Designer, that really helps. So that was the first case. The other case I would like to say that where the placenta was surprisingly partially separated, but sometimes as you told, that is because of neurogenic shock and the in the uterus is outside, sometimes if such a time takes referral of the patient, they may not bleed sometimes. The placenta was outside, but not so much bleeding, but patient was in shock. Maybe she has already lost blood or it is the compression which made a have to reduce the blood. But the swelling and all this really causes difficulty. And in those situations, it is better to place inside. And if it is required, the partially separate place and it can be put inside the vagina. Otherwise, then you try the hydrostatic method. And I'm sure it's giving the anesthesia. And then after some time, it is most of the time it's possible to reposition the uterus. But these are the cases actually when it's difficult to manage. When you, the patient, referred patient after 12 hours or 14 hours will come to you. And with the last swelling of the uterus when it's outside. So, Rather than what happens in the inside, the lever and immediately they replace it. That's easy to manage actually. Any, any panelist has a personal experience? Personally, I have always done acute uh, inversion and immediate reposition. And there was one patient, as Dr. Afiz mentioned, this patient came a bit late, but it was complete inversion and it was immediately within 24 hours and she was anemic. So in that patient, we tried the hydrostatic, but we couldn't. So we gave her four units of blood and actually we did a leprotomy and we did the Holtens at that time because we had to reposit. It was a full parturient uterus. Yeah. However, I would like to ask my panelists if yeah. anybody has can I, can experience I of experience? hydrostatic. Yes, yeah. Dr. I have one. Uh, I have seen one case with the hydrostatic. I was at PGI Chandigarh doing my house job in uh, anesthesia. Anesthesia, not in gynae. And one patient came from Himachal, from Shimla, with inversion uterus. The, the team was not able to reposit it by the simple method, so they did the hydrostatic. I myself did not do, but I have witnessed one at PJ Chandigarh. And they were able to reposit it by this hydrostatic, just handling the drip there, and uh, everything it was done with them. Dr. Indrani, you want to yeah. say I want to share. I had two experiences. Uh, like one patient, I don't know, patient was lucky. She reported after 48 hours. Patient was hemodynamically stable, but then I had posted her for OT. And I thought, let me try once vaginally and like with the whole setup ready. Otherwise, I'll open her up and do a Holtens. And somehow with great difficulty, I tell you, like, you know, I could able to reposit, though it was 48 hours, I had reposit it vaginally. And the second case, I, I had another experience, but she came quite, it was a chronic inversion. And then uh, that uh, I had repaired by Holtens method. So, um, Dr. Uh, Mitra, can I yes. share one case? Please, madam. Every yeah. Uh, well, uh, apart from this manual replacement, once one of my intern, she was delivering the baby and suddenly she called, Madam, Madam, kuch nikal aya hai. I went, it was an, imme and immediately I could repose it. So the person, if, if the person who is standing there or the person who reaches first should try it and do it. So that was a very simple case done. The second case that I wanted to say that with all preparations for Halton, in a case of we could not manage it uh, manually or by hydrostatic pressure, we took it for Halton's. But when we opened the abdomen, we went for this Huntington's method. Yeah. We put in a, first we dilated the cervical vaginal ring by putting our fingers inside and the faucet. And then we 
with two ellis forceps holding the dipping it inside and then pulling the myometrium up and slowly slowly i think what happened suddenly jadu jaisa wo laga ki wo pura upar aa gaya and we were there were some abrasions on the surface of the uterus but it was really a very good experience by we have also done holtens many time i think three four times we have done holtens also but this huttingtons was really sabko maza aa gaya everybody said are 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 ye to nikal aaya nikal aaya it was really and there the kinetic pressure dena pada tha kya kya ni fresh niche se to ek ko push kara ke hum log rakhte hi hain whenever we are doing this procedure one or four assistant is making a fist and pushing it from below and the other case in the uh, what i would uh, just explaining that instead of putting a finger um, this the instruments sometimes it may cause tear so we can put a vacuum the vacuum yeah. cup the smaller vacuum cup Elastic. and and uh, i have heard one of my seniors uh, sharing this experience and then they attached it to the suction and then they were able to repose it so actually basically uh, all obstetricians are very smart and now so many instruments and so many other modalities are there it's just putting your mind so the elastic cup can be used to uh, do the hydrostatic because initially when we were doing the hydrostatic we had to occlude the vagina yes. so that we could pull and believe me what people who do the hydrostatic they say they swear by it that the pressure of the water is so much if it can generate uh, power why can't it not reposit the uterus and quite atraumatically but you can put the elastic cup make a seal and then push the fluid and achieve it again um, so as dr aba has very nicely said huntington method where you can avoid a incision on the uterus and use as you said so there it is this is called jugad indian mm-hmm. jugad that you put the uh, uh, elastic cup and bring it out so okay um what are the complications and how can it be prevented uh dr dr shailesh would you like to take that question dr alka yes yeah please what are the complications of this uh, in this inversion and the uh, mm, acute inversion so mainly it can uh, again recur back one uh, is this very important yes uh, uh, yeah very good yeah and um, uh, we have to treat the shock this is the second complication and uh, i don't think we uh, the uh, one thing i would like to say is it needs a lot of strength to push that uterus inside the inverted part of the uterus inside it it's uh, it's it, very true those who have done it will know how much pain mm. it pains it it's really painful after you repose the uterus it is really painful so the dialogue today of dr preeti kumar was also ki agar hath mein dard nahi hua to iska matlab there wasn't a retained i mean like manual removal of placenta just a placenta separated one and you actually didn't do the procedure so if you are going to in uh, reposit a inverted uterus you have it needs some uh, steady hand and patience i would say so okay uh, i will go uh, i think um, okay now so i think i must conclude so the most important thing is that our operation theaters and labor rooms are war zones so for all obstetricians my and everybody's mantra would be always to anticipate prevent and manage and especially for stand alone practitioners my message would be always have a junior or a senior or a contemporary along with your neonatologist and anesthetist who are always there as a rescue team for you no need to panic always a detailed history examination and workup and visage the problems that can arise if the challenges enumerated are not sorted out easily and of course medical legal safety and documentation so we have to focus on skills drills safe obstetrics as i said is a love story with a happy ending which is only possible if we anticipate prevent and manage and it's a teamwork the theme of this uh, operative obstetrics uh, course was uh, uh, experience evidence and excellence so experience of all the stalwarts dr mandakni made leading us with her wonderful lecture on cesarean section under local anesthesia which was 
really such a big treat to listen and evidence all our faculty provided all the evidence so i'm sure that all the people who have attended the three days would have found something to improve and add to their excellence thank you very much my dear friends success is all about team and i thank my co partner in crime dr surika taide and our combined respects to dr mandakini dr parag dr uday dr parul dr lakshmi the team icog and everybody who has joined in and the 428 attendees still with us thank you ever so much from the bottom of my heart thank you ma'am thank you dr mitra thank you I dr renu i would thank now invite icog chairperson dr mandakini meg ma'am to conclude this session as well as the lecture series thank you very much mitra i wanted to invite your you know that uh, discussion but i was keeping to myself no no please uh, madam you you know that case you know. which i saw yes everybody described but i you know vividly i remember it was a neurogenic shock it was inversion by a senior gynecologist in amravati and she kept the patient for 24 hours more than that because she was feeling guilty how to uh, transfer the patient to the district hospital but uh, finally she did it and there were 100 cars uh, you know that you know private private patient coming to the general and they say you have to save the patient and patient was actually what i saw is a neurogenic shock because when i opened the abdomen because it was not possible to uh, reposit it manually it wasn't possible i did not want to lo lose the time at all immediately i opened her up and from down below i asked my one of the senior person to you know slowly 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 uh, try to you know repose and later on when i opened the abdomen i what i found you know everything they say rasik hai ke kaise karte na so you can uh, the ovaries are gone the ligament are gone then i understood why the patient was pulseless and the moment slowly slowly when we started to you know uh, take it out and the pink color which was a blue color it has started becoming the pink the moment full uterus came my anesthetist said pulse has come back so i wanted to share this uh, case but i was you know keeping i said aap logo ne itna sab bata diya fir mujhe kya batane ki zarurat nahi madam ye bahut important baat aapne batayi hai ye kaam remarkable story hai it is not all the time blood it is yes. not all the time mrp whatever you said usse alag hai because maine jo experience kiya ki it was nothing the moment the ovaries and everything came out na the pulse started Yeah. So then I understood it was a neurogenic shock. Yes. So delegates, you see, it is not all the time hemorrhagic or something. It's maybe a neurogenic shock also. So I think I don't have much of the uh, saying. Every thing has been said by Surekha, Mitra, and the faculty remaining every day not dinner at ten thirty. And I think third day conclusion is so so much important and wonderful lectures. I want to share my screen. Just a minute, please. Please, ma'am. Ah, please. So this is a vote of thanks. Proper protocol wise, what? Can can you see the uh, slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I think a great namaskar, thank you, or sab log. Jo itne bhi log hai, I think they made this program such a. And I want to share with you, Mitra and uh, Surekha, my dear conveners. The uh, attendance was sixteen hundred. because just now he told me that uh, on the youtube and everything they come you know in that software na so attendance was 1600 yesterday day before and today also attendance was more than 1100 so a uh, great thanks to all of you to the faculty and uh, uh, this is the foxy icug uh, online certificate course ninth course and it was inaugurated by our dr atul munshi and dr cn purandre couldn't make it but then dr usha sarya and my conveners here smiling always and uh, the second day was also uh, graced by the dr kamal bakshi she spoke so well uh, let me take five minutes mitra for my <laughs> you know thank you because uh, because kamal madam said one thing which touched my heart that we should not invite the we should not invite any film stars to our program because when we doctors are suffering and we are you know being uh, man handled uh, and we are getting 
all uh, you know brick beds so we no film star or nobody has come forward in support of us so i like that statement and i want to give this statement to all my students here everybody that we should not be after the glamour or something like that but we should be uh, keeping the solidarity see how many senior people are giving their time for your teaching it itself show their devotion their sincerity their hard dedicated way i don't think any other profession so i clap for my profession i clap for my obstetricians who are really doing such a great job of teaching and sharing so i bow my head in front of all of you and second thing which i uh, really uh, very well said by dr ajit virkur those who couldn't uh, listen to him that all the new doctors are financially suffering because they have taken lots of loan for four five years back you know we are very senior so we don't bother but the senior the people who have taken loan they are suffering they cannot uh, pay the you know emis and they have to keep a bold front so they he has given very nice tip you people should develop those people should develop some alternative like youtube uh, videos or you know teachings or you know private something some alternative art to survive in this situation this two things really touched my heart so i just wanted to share with you those who were not there a great program uh, i can say um, zurekha and mitra and all the emocies and everybody see the program here everybody was a authority they have done the work and nobody was talking from the uh, you know theoretical books everybody has that experience and they talk so convincingly and we are very very blessed to have such senior teachers alka kriplani mudliyar pai parul kotlawala every jaydeep tang we pili and all rare subject nobody actually touches this subject destructive operation is a taboo nobody wants to discuss so you know and people are asking where are the destructive operation we have not heard of it so i think uh, a great job we are, we could actually do justice to all the operative operations to be known to the uh, post graduate and the students and everybody then girja vag uday thana wala aparna sharma today sessions uh, chinmay and uh, geeta parikshit and the uh, asha rai singhani and last no, but not the least our own mitra oh what a beautifully conducted and you could take out from the you know confessions i can say confessions from the <laughs> from all the, and even i was tempted to confess because i was feeling little tired that why should i you know it's okay but then i wanted to uh, give that my experience also so thank you very much so uh, thank you for attending the all the attendees for the certificate course you were very patient you could though the program was to be over by 9 o'clock or 8:30 but you are all there up to 11 11:30 so i think a uh, great thank you to the delegates also and you i hope you have been enriched with the knowledge and with the expert faculty and uh, the, you know and you can see few of the few of the photographs whatever i had i put all this photograph looks nice to see all the beautiful photographs here and that is the beauty and the slides and see and everybody it will go in the archives of the icug courses we have you know the record keeping thanks to all our uh, you know chief guest i have just mentioned and a big big thank you to my both sisters mitra and surekha without you it is not possible and see all the chat box is full of praises so i am great uh, it's great thank you to yeah. my alpha madam one thing only hmm. alone we are nothing together we are all yeah, of us thank you. not just so, the yeah yeah thank you very much alpesh gandhi said that why, why their absence also they are uh, they are present because yes. alpesh gandhi is a big support and he doesn't interfere he said whatever you people are doing please keep on doing i mean that itself is a by absence his his support is there even if in absence so great thank you jaydeep parul parag uday and lakshmi thank you then thank you to all my chair persons you know i want to mention their name anita archana parag ragini dinesh rajat i can take their first name because i am senior most except mira agnihotri <laughs> anju soni vijaya usha sharma madam pushpa thorat alka arun basav rajendra ashok varsha 
रमणी देवी अश्वत कुमार मिलिंद शाह आशीष कुमार अर्चना वर्मा मीरा अग्निहोत्री मैडम एंड अश्विनी बलेराव अ ग्रेट थैंक यू टू ऑल द चेयरपर्सन वेरी ग्रेशियसली एक्सेप्टेड नेवर सेड बी वॉन्ट टू गिव अ लेक्चर ओनली वॉट एवर यू नो गिव टू देम एंड देव ग्रेशियसली एक्सेप्टेड आई थिंक स्पीकर पेंटाबुलस गुप्ता साधना गुप्ता नोजर सोर्ण खाडिलकर माई सेल्फ वॉज पेंटाबुलस इज इट मनीष वाजपेयी परुल कोठड़ा वाला मुदलियार पई एंड यू चोजन द रियली वेरी वेरी गुड स्पीकर प्रीति कुमार चिन्मय रथो अलका अवर सर सुब्रत अरुल कुमार आशा सो नाइसली वीपी पायली जयदीप टांग मंजू पुरी नजीज गिरजा वाग उदय ताना वाला कुंदन इंगे शशि बकाबरा गीता बड़सारकर परीक्षित टांग एंड एमसी पटेल एंड व्हाई आई एम रीडिंग बिकॉज व्हेन द इवन दे आर एब्सेंट दे से मैडम आपने मेरा नाम नहीं लिया सो so, हम लोग आईसीयू जब में हम लोग पिंच लेके तैयार हो गए हम लोग सबका नाम लेते बाद में ये न्यूज़ सबके पास जाती मैडम आपने मेरा नाम नहीं लिया आई सेड ओके सो सो दैट इज हाउ बी पेशेंट विद मी आई हैव टू थैंक एवरीबॉडी मॉडरेटर सुजाता सुरेखा जैन प्रोमिला जागृति अलका पांडे मैडम देन इंद्राणी राय आभारानी सिन्हा सविता शैलेश कोरे एंड अ ग्रेट ग्रेट एंड सच ए एक्सपीरियंस आई कैन से एवरीबॉडी वाज टॉकिंग फ्रॉम द हार्ट एंड माय एमोसिस ब्यूटीफुल वेरी वेल समटाइम्स कभी-कभी लगता था यार क्यों बोल दिया मैडम आपके 2 मिनट खत्म हो गए कभी-कभी लगता था सीनियर लोगों को बट दैट वाज नीडेड सो ब्यूटीफुली डन प्रियंकुर यू आर द मोस्ट you know in demand uh, moc for everybody renu a silent but a nice worker amita tandon great job shaila always very popular sarjia and pravina you have done a great job and we couldn't uh, have done and this is for the participant participants please see the website and please don't disturb us ki mere paas nahi hai as you can see the uh, chat box madam mere ko aapne question nahi bheje madam aapne agar main 16 se logon ko aisa kehte rahungi to mera to ho gaya so 3 days compulsory unhi ko jayega question jin jinhone 3 din ki attendance hum log sab today we are seeing the record and the questions will be sent tomorrow morning up to 11 o'clock you have time up to 7th may you can answer them and you can see the result in front of you you will see the result whether you passed or not if you have 50% marks then the certificate will be given after 4 weeks because we require that time to make the certificates so a participant please be don't be impatient be patient with us because we have done a big course it is 1600 people it requires time even in university if, uh, for eight student they take 3 4 months so please be patient with us and we are also human beings our clerk uh, they are working from the home we got very bad situation in bombay and in spite of this we could pull this course so successfully so nicely so i think ek bahut bada dhanyawad aap logo ko and i i don't have much more words aur bahut acha laga mujhe so i think uh, and rachin mai tum log abhi tak achla so nice to see you abhi tak late mein अभी तक हो आई मीन इट मीन रियली ये कोर्स बहुत ही सक्सेसफुल है जो आपको यहाँ पर भी रखा है अभी तक चलो तो ये हो गया मेरी तरफ से अब आप फ्री हो बात करने के लिए मेरी नहीं थैंक यू एवरीबडी एंड एवरीबडी इज नाउ यू वॉन्ट टू गो ऑल्सो एंड स्पेशली वी वुड लाइक टू थैंक ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट वर there till the end and the faculty and special thanks to meg ma'am because she is the one who is spearheaded she is the one who guided so much systematic she is and till the end she is there without yeah. eating anything you know without and getting, uh, without getting up also <laughs> <laughs> so i think dr mitra we need to thank madam yes. for the opportunity yeah. and for the guidance and the patience totally. and totally. the honor totally and i think we hey, should take the lead chinmay, let the chinmay say first you know chinmay got something different to say 
I wanted to say three cheers, ma'am. Hip hip hooray <laughs> to the way ICOG has gone this year. I, I mean, under your leadership, ma'am, I think ICOG एक पूरा काया पलट जैसे हुआ है. The way we have worked this year and your vision is enormous, ma'am. I mean, the way you made it. Uh, I want to share with you. जब भी मैं maybe I want to बात बोलूँ छोटी सी एक comment था chat box में. आपके लिए था वो. But when are you coming up with the next course? मुझे लोग इतना सता रहे हैं जितने भी कन्वीनर से उन्होंने लाइन लगा रखी है एंड वो बोलते ये तो क्या फिर गुस्सा भी हो रही है तो क्या आपने उनको दे दिया अरे मैंने वो घर की वो होती ना बड़ी बहू छोटी बहू है ना बोरा मैं मैंने बोला यार मुझे आए इंसान हूँ मैं इंसान हूँ मुझे जरा थोड़ा सास ले और नीलिमा सोलह सो लोगों को मेल करेगी और रूटीन हमारा एफ जी का काम वगैरह चल रहा है नो आई एम जस्ट कैजुअली टेलिंग यू बट आई थिंक बहुत डिमांड आपने मैम हंसते हंसते बहुत सारा काम कर दिया <laughs> पता भी नहीं चला नहीं द स्ट्रेस इज आल्सो नॉट अपरेंट मैम आई मीन सो मेनी कोर्सेज आर हैपनिंग सो मेनी अभी थोड़ा हंसने दो क्योंकि मैं आई डिजर्व दिस हंसना मैं क्यों हंस रही हूँ कि जब मैं निर्जा वाटला के साथ में पहला किया ना तो मैंने उनकी बहुत परीक्षा ली निर्जा को बोला तुम्हारा प्रेजेंट में नो बडी कैन बिलीव दिस निर्जा प्रेजेंटेशन दिखाओ इतना बेकार प्रेजेंटेशन मैंने बोला ये तो प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर से भी गया गुजरा है मैंने पहले ही दिन मतलब उनका जो जर्नल क्लब का जो मेरा कंसेप्ट था कैसा ग्लैमरस होगा वो होगा कुछ नहीं था कुछ तो भी और मैंने बोला तुम ऑल इंडिया इंस्टीट्यूट में काम करते प्राइमरी हेल्थ सेंटर में उनको इतना वो बात लग गई दूसरे दिन फिर उनका ट्रायल किया तब तक ना बड़ा एम्स का फोटो फिर इसका फोटो उसका फोटो इतना सुंदर किया एंड देन इन द इनोग्रेशन शी टोल्ड अस एन पुरंदरे सर पूछा मेघ मैडम की वजह से हमको ये सब इतना सुंदर प्रेजेंटेशन किया और आज तक मैं दिखाती हूँ वो वाला प्रेजेंटेशन बिकॉज सी वॉट एपेंस इज यू हैव हैव अ ड्राइव लोग तो आप क्या निर्जा बाटला के प्रेजेंटेशन नहीं बना सकती क्या बता नहीं सकते एवरीबॉडी बट यू नो यू रिक्वायर दैट काइंड ऑफ ड्राइव एनर्जी और बहुत मजा आता है सब लोगों को काम करने में एंड वी इकट्ठे होने से शादी कैसे बढ़िया होती ना फंक्शन कितने सुंदर होते हैं वैसे वाली बात है और दूसरा एक मेरा बैकग्राउंड भी आपको बता देती हूँ कि आई एम द एल्डेस्ट इन द फैमिली तो जब मैं छोटी सी थी सपोज मैं होंगी जितने भी साल की थी तो मेरे ऊपर सारी जिम्मेदारी होती थी सब्जी लाओ तो वो करो तो छोटी बहन तो मेरे डैडी हमेशा टूर पे रहते एग्रीकल्चर डिपार्टमेंट में थे तो मेरे घर में वी वेर एट ब्रदर्स एंड सिस्टर तो क्या हुआ कि मुझे सारा टाइम लोगों से घिरे रहने की आदत एक और दूसरा उन लोगों को गाइड करने की आदत ऑल माई सिस्टर्स आर डॉक्टर्स एंड साइंटिस्ट मतलब पीएचडी है और बाकी साइंटिस्ट है तो उनसे गिरे तो क्या हो गया कि आई मीन एक मतलब उसकी आदत पड़ गई यू नो एंड थर्ड थिंग इज फोर्टी इयर्स ऑफ माई जॉब इन द मंत्रालय इन मेनी मेनी हायर पोस्ट आई सॉ यू नो हाउ टू मेक अ टीम यू नो दैट तो दैट एक्सपीरियंस ऑल्सो और हंसते हंसते कर लिया जैसे निर्जा ने कहा मैडम ने कहा हमसे काम करवा लिया मालूम ही नहीं पड़ा exactly, का सेम है <laughs> <laughs> का सेम है मैडम हंसते हंसते काम करवा लेते बहुत सारा और फाइनली जब हम लोग लोगों को दिखाते कि आईसीयू जी ने इतना किया तुम दोनों ने देखा होगा दो तीन दिन है ना कितना काम तो एवरीबडी से मैडम इतना सारा काम कैसे हो गया एक व्यक्ति तो नहीं कर सकता ना इवन दिस थ्री डेज कोर्स हंसते हंसते हो गया अब आप देखो कितना लिखा है लोगों ने मैंने सारे चेट बॉक्स के फोटो निकाले सो आई थिंक मैम एक रेजिडेंट की अपील है मैम प्लीज अलाउ एटलीस्ट टू डेज अटेंडेंस हैव अटेंडेड फुल फर्स्ट डे हैड नाइट ड्यूटी उसने रोती हुई शक्ल बनाई है वी रेजिडेंट आर ओवर आपको सोचना पड़ेगा मैडम अब यार अब आज की आज की रात तो सोने दो फिर कल देखेंगे अभी आज दे रहा है सो एनीवे गर्ल्स आई थिंक एक अच्छा बढ़िया गाना गाओ यार हमारे लिए हां सुरेखा भाई गाओ गा दो एक कथा मैं अब आज सब लोग गाएंगे और क्या गाना गाने तो आप सुझा दो भी अच्छा सुंदर गाना गाओ और बहुत प्लीजेंट लग रहा है जाने की इच्छा नहीं हो रही पर मेरे हस्बैंड को खाना खिलाना है तो प्लीज एक गाना और नहीं 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 अच्छा अच्छा तुमको देख के मुझे बहुत अच्छा गाना बताओ अच्छा गाना मुझे बहुत मजा आया तीनों दिन मैंने रात तक रोज अटेंड किया दिल्ली वालों को जरा ज्यादा ही मजा आता मैंने ये देखा है पता नहीं अपने फोरम माला रहती है अशोक रहता है तुम रहती हो सारे लोग रहते बड़ा मजा आता है दिल्ली से काफी एफिनिटी है हमारी 
अच्छा तो हम चलते हैं ऐसा तो नहीं तो हम चलते फिर कब मिलोगे ऐसी होती के कोर्स में मिलेंगे और फैमिली को बोलो मुझे कुछ लोग गाली भी देते होंगे तो उनके फैमिली को बता देना की भाई ठीक है मुझे मेरे कुछ कुछ लोग आके बता देते है मैडम आप हमारी मम्मी की ड्यूटी लगाते तो हमारे पिताजी आपको गाली देते ऐसे छोटे छोटे बच्चे तो मैंने कहा कि बाप रे इतना हॉरिबल पर एनी वे टेल यू थैंक यू सो मच चलो थैंक यू सो मच मैडम थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल फैकल्टी एंड कैंपस एंड एटीएट पार्टिसिपेंट्स सभी फिर भी हैं वो हमारी ये गप्पी गप सुन रहे होंगे चलो चलो थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू सो मच बाय बाय थैंक यू बाय मित्र मैम बाय बाय रेखा मैम ह्यूज कांग्रेचुलेशंस रेखा बाय रियली नाइस बाय एवरीबॉडी बाय थैंक यू चिन्मय प्रियंकुर शैला अमृता थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू सो मच अमित सुरेखा जरा थाम एक मिनट सुरेखा थाम अमित 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 Oh God, गया क्या? Uh, today uh, he will be sending Sureka. He will yes. be sending the uh, list of the participant. Yes. आणि सोला से लोग होते हैं. आप लोग इतने दिन रहे. Sixteen hundred. तो आप लोग तो list part will who who were present for all three days. Okay ma'am. We have to make the list and say okay. So he will be sending the question to those people. मतलब उदय पावो आप लोग दोन attendance वाले आप लोग consider करें जैसे तर. ओके 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 